Introduction This handbook sets out to offer both students and teachers of ancient Greek religion a comprehensive overview of the current state of the field. It aims both to present key information about the subject, and to explore the ways in which this information is gathered, and the different approaches that have shaped the subject. Overall, we intend this volume not only to provide a research and orientation tool for students of the ancient world, but also to make a key contribution to the ongoing conceptualization of ancient Greek relationships to the supernatural in all their variety. The volume traces recent scholarship as it moves on from previous paradigms, such as polis religion, to a more broadly conceived conception of the religious in ancient Greek culture. Polis religion has provided an extremely stimulating model, but tends to privilege certain official contexts of ritual activity while marginalizing others. Although the original model may not have intended this, its use too often results in a static and exclusive model of communal ritual practices, promoting, for example, a division between magical and religious ritual activities, and a focus on Athens in the classical period. Even in accounts in which this model is not explicitly mentioned, the result has been the presentation of ancient Greek religion in terms of a neat and complete narrative rather than a field of contestation and change. In contrast, the aim of this volume is to highlight crucial developments in the study of ancient Greek religion, with a special focus on problems and debates. Thus, the chapters in this volume emphasize the diversity of relationships between mortals and the supernatural in all their manifestations, across, between, and beyond ancient Greek cultures and the various contexts in which these relationships unfold. Relationships include both physical manifestations, e.g. ritual, and metaphysical, e.g. discourses as evidence for beliefs, and encompass sources that have traditionally been categorized as magic. Contexts, in turn, include not only, where possible, the physical contexts, with a full consideration of the appropriate archaeological evidence, but also social, political, economic, and temporal contexts. We have asked our authors to include information on approaches and methodologies, and on the history of scholarship in the field in their respective chapters, with the conviction that such information is best presented with the evidence it seeks to explain. We have not attempted to cover every possible topic in individual chapters, but rather to look at specific themes in the ritual contexts in which they occurred. For example, discussion of the content and context of hymns can be found in Henk Versnell's Reflections on Prayers and Curses, Chapter 30, and in Claude Callum's Meditation on the Stories Told in Ritual Performances, Chapter 13. The latter considers the ritual activities of women, a topic also discussed in, among other chapters, Matthew Dillon's consideration of the household as a location of ritual practice, chapter 17, and, with a different emphasis, by Sarah Hitch's examination of evidence for life change rituals, chapter 35. In turn, Hitch's chapter also considers relevant conceptions of pollution, the dangers this poses for the community is discussed in Costas Vlasopoulos' chapter on religion in Greek communities, chapter 18 and the question of whether local heroes were perceived to cause pollution is explored in Gunnel Equifer's chapter on heroes, chapter 26. To help guide the reader to such relevant content, cross-references have been included throughout the handbook to illuminate overlapping themes between chapters and parts. Finally, we have asked our contributors to draw attention to religious activities as dynamic, highlighting how they changed over time and in response to different contexts and relationships. Chapter Overview Part 1, What is Ancient Greek Religion, consists of four slightly shorter chapters that set the scene for the contributions that follow. Each gives an overview of a key dimension of ancient Greek religion, drawing attention, in particular, to the ambiguities and apparent contradictions that emerge from the evidence, and emphasizing the need for modern scholarship to be aware of the assumptions and expectations of our heuristic categories. In the first of these contributions, Unity versus Diversity, Robin Osborne starts this volume by challenging the very term religion itself. In its place, he succinctly evokes an ancient Greek theology of diversity, expressed in the range of ancient Greek ritual practices. Alongside ritual practice, Thomas Harrison sets the question of the nature of belief, describing in his chapter, Belief versus Practice, how previous scholarship has struggled with this concept and exploring some of the ways in which the problems it seems to pose may be reapproached. 
As these chapters indicate, and this volume as a whole emphasizes, neither belief nor practice remains static. The nature of change over time is the focus of Emily Kern's reflections on the relationship between old versus new across cult practice, gods, and religious concepts. She explores how innovation and continuity coexist, demonstrated by the chapter's case study on the mysteries of Andania. Finally, Vincian Pirendel Forge and Gabriella Pironti delve further into the capacity for ancient Greek religion to encompass multiplicity, in many verses. 1. They examine the structure of polytheism, arguing that to understand ancient Greek gods, one must consider them to be simultaneously one and many, at every level of their cult. The slightly longer contributions in the following parts draw on and exemplify such general considerations by exploring particular areas of ancient Greek religion. They typically start from a general introduction to the subject matter, followed by one to three case studies illustrating problems and questions discussed in the general part. However, this structure was not rigidly imposed, and throughout we have encouraged authors to adopt a style of presentation that best reflects the material presented. We start with two parts types of evidence and myths. Contexts and representations, which draw attention to questions of approach, this is followed by six thematic parts. The six chapters that constitute part two, types of evidence, introduce different kinds of sources available for the study of ancient Greek religion as well as the questions and problems pertaining to them. Millet Gaithman's contribution, Visual Evidence, introduces this part. She illustrates how a diverse body of imagery on vases, votive reliefs, and coins allows us to recover ancient religious beliefs and practices in a number of different contexts. She also argues that this kind of evidence should no longer be treated as secondary to the information gained through other sources, most notably, perhaps, from the literary evidence, the focus of the following two chapters. Prose texts come into focus in Hannah Willey's chapter on literary evidence, prose. Rhetorical uses of religion are explicitly included here to illustrate what is special about the way in which ancient Greek religion features in prose texts. Renaud Gagnier's contribution, literary evidence, poetry takes up a point raised already in Gaithman's chapter, that in order to appreciate how a particular category of sources, in this case, poetry, reflects ancient Greek religion we need to study it in its own right first before we relate it to information gained from other texts and contexts. Claire Taylor's chapter on epigraphic evidence emphasizes the diversity of information on ancient Greek religion that can be gained from inscriptions, in particular if we appreciate them as both literary texts and material artifacts. In this way, her chapter already anticipates what Caitlin Barrett, material evidence, shows with regard to the material evidence more generally that context is key in the interpretation of the ancient evidence. It is, in particular, this significance of context which will emerge as a recurrent theme throughout later chapters and parts of this volume, see, example, in chapter 26. The concluding chapter in part 2, David Martinez's essay on papyrology highlights the contribution different kinds of papyri make to the study of ancient Greek religion. Part 3 of the handbook, Myth Contexts and Representations, includes five chapters which are focused on those traditional narratives about gods and men that proved invariably central to ancient Greek religion, myth. It examines the different genres in which these stories appear, and the ways in which genre affects the presentation of these stories. Richard Martin's contribution on epic stands at the beginning of this part. It investigates how religion is represented in epic narratives. This is related to the way in which the performance of epic poetry itself served as a ritual act, including both the composers and the audience. In his contribution on drama in the same part, Claude Callum makes a similar argument with regard to Greek tragedy, which also served as part of ritual practice. The chapter on art and imagery by Tonya Shi, in turn, considers the numerous visualizations of the divine the Greeks encountered in different social contexts, including the oikos and the polis. She suggests we take the difficult relationship between gods and their images as symptomatic of the nature of ancient Greek religion as such, which allowed for a spectrum of meanings and representations. In his chapter on history, Robert Fowler investigates the intersection of myth and history, 
understood here both as historical experience and as its representation, and transformation, in ancient historiography. From his chapter, the dialectic relationship between myth and history emerges as central to the development of the historiographic tradition from Herodotus to modern times. The following chapter, by Rick Benitez and Harold Tarrant on philosophy, explores another dialectic relevant to ancient Greek religion, that between philosophical discourse and religious beliefs and practices. Yet while Fowler explored the dialectic between myth and history as a genuine duality in ancient Greek thought and literature, Benitez and Tarrant highlight how philosophy merely modified traditional religious beliefs and practices. The parts that follow start from the simplest of questions, who, where, what, when, and how. These provide the central theme for the chapters they contain, each taking a particular perspective on that question. In part 4, where, the contributions consider a range of different places and spaces in which religious activities took place. In the first chapter, chapter 16, Michael Scott reviews current debates about temples and sanctuaries, what they were, and how they were placed, the roles they played in the wider landscape, and the experience of being in them and discusses new approaches that explore them as multidimensional and polyvalent sacred spaces. Having established, and questioned, interpretations of sacred space, the next three chapters consider how different levels of ancient society interacted with it. Matthew Dillon's chapter takes us into the household, with a particular focus on the role of women in and outside family-based religious activities. From families, we turn to the role and nature of religion in communities. Costas Vlasopoulos evaluates the role of communal religious activity, both how it may have shaped Greek communities, and how it has been interpreted in scholarship and how these two interact. Finally, Christy Constantakopoulou discusses Greek religious activity at the regional level, examining the management of cult centres and development of different kinds and scales of regional religious networks. Part 5 offers contributions on the theme of how the ancient Greeks approached religious activity, focusing in particular on the theme of control and exploring the nature of religious authority and the variety of ways and arenas in which this was exercised. The first two chapters consider the nature of mortal and divine authority in ancient Greek religion. In Religious Expertise, Michael A. Flower examines the variety of religious experts and their roles in different contexts. As he states, Greek priests did not mediate between gods and men the city and this raises questions about the ways in which religious decisions were made within a community. Ralph Anderson explores a key example of religious change in his chapter, New Gods, the ways in which communities regulated the transmission of new deities between, and their introduction into, polis. This theme of regulation is pursued in the next two chapters. In Impiety Hugh Bowden looks into the debate about the meaning of this term, asabeia, in ancient Greek legal discourse in particular. His analysis seeks to go beyond its characterization as either political or religious, and or as a way in which the polis controlled the religious activities, or even beliefs, of its citizens. The question of modern categories is also central to Andrei Petrovich's chapter on sacred law, which reviews the many different forms, authorities, types of mediation, and enactment procedures of prescriptive texts concerning ancient Greek cults, and how this is prompting new work on the nature of cult regulation. Part 6, who, considers the variety of supernatural entities at the core of ancient Greek religion. Most, but not all of the six chapters in this part are focused on a series of sharp contrasts that help to structure the multiplicity of supernatural entities in the ancient Greek world. Susan Deese's chapter on gods Olympian versus Thonian, for example, is focused on the duality between Olympian and Thonian gods as one of the most fundamental yet not unproblematic distinctions that structures the ancient Greek pantheon. The following chapter by Carolina Lopez Ruiz, God's Origins, revolves around a key question that has concerned much scholarship on ancient Greek religion in the past, the question of the origins of the Greek gods. However, rather than merely reiterating the traditional line about the origins of Greek divinity, Lopez Ruiz problematizes the question of origins itself by investigating its role in Greek religious discourse and in classical scholarship. The question of origins is also flagged as important in the following chapter by Gunnel Eckrith on heroes, living or dead. 
she considers the special category of real or imagined human beings that, after their death, received quasi-divine honors, and explores the origins and transformations of hero cults over time. Her case studies highlight again the plurality of ancient Greek religion and the dichotomy between life and death as different states of existence. Its significance for ancient Greek religion is considered more broadly by Emmanuel Vutiras in the following chapter, Dead or Alive? Vutiras shows how a number of different rituals directed towards the dead reflect specifically Greek notions about life, death, and the afterlife. In this way he draws our attention towards the ambivalent role of the dead, which could remain powerful agents in the sphere of the living. The penultimate chapter in this part, by Julius Farmani Gasparo, Daimonic Power, gives a broad overview of the major transformations and developments in the ancient Greek conception of daemons from the Archaic to the Roman Imperial period. The final chapter by Ivana Petrovich Deification, Gods or Men, concludes the investigation of intermediary powers in ancient Greek religion by focusing on the way in which the human, divine boundary is negotiated in processes of deification. The five chapters collected in Part 7 are focused entirely on different forms and contexts of human, divine interaction in the ancient Greek world. Hendrik S. Versnell's chapter, Prayer and Curse, starts off this part by pointing towards differences between ancient and modern conceptions of prayer including hymns, and curse. His contribution introduces not only structurally different kinds of prayer and curse, it also shows that in the ancient Greek world there existed a number of intermediary forms which position themselves between prayer and curse. The following contribution by Fred Naden, Sacrifice, looks at what frequently features as the most fundamental ritual of ancient Greek religion, sacrifice, in particular communal blood sacrifice. However, rather than embracing the traditional positions by Burkett and Vernant that have dominated debates in the past, Naden urges us to apply a more differentiated and critical focus. He argues for a conception of sacrificial ritual that is both narrower and much broader than the traditional scholarly view, and challenges the usefulness of the term sacrifice itself for the study of ancient Greek religion. Sarah Ills Johnston's chapter, Oracles and Divination, draws our attention towards divination as another central form of human, divine interaction besides that of sacrifice. Human, divine contact, albeit of a direct, unmediated form, is also the subject of Verity Platt's chapter on Epiphany. Like Johnston's contribution, Platt highlights the dangers resulting from human, divine interaction. Fritz Graf's chapter on healing concludes this part. His chapter shows that those undertaking healing rituals attempted to enlist the help of the gods to find a cure for diseases that the professional doctors could not provide, for example, through incubation. The three chapters of Part 8, when, reflect on how Greek religion structures, and is structured by, conceptions and constructions of time. The first chapter, From Birth to Death, Life Change Rituals, examines the phenomenon of life change rituals in ancient Greek society and their interpretation in scholarship as initiations. Sarah Hitch discusses some of the challenges being made to this approach, and demonstrates how the evidence may be read in other ways. She raises questions about the significance of conceptions of pollution that attend physiological changes, particularly those of women. Jan Mathieu Carbon's chapter, Ritual Cycles, Calendars and Festivals, asks us to imagine the ways in which religious rituals suffused everyday life, interacting with seasonal and agricultural rhythms as a way of reckoning the passing of time, and marking significant moments in the year. The final chapter of this part takes us to the time after death, in imagining the afterlife, Radcliffe G. Edmonds III describes the multiplicity of cultural imaginings about the afterlife, including the role of the intriguing Orphic tablets as evidence for mystery cults designed to ensure participants received special favour after death. He evokes an ongoing contest of differing views, which should be thought of as jostling for authority in particular situations. In Part 9, the chapters ask whether and how aspects of the ritual and belief of ancient Greek culture in all its diversity shaped and was shaped by interactions with local cultures beyond the confines of the Aegean Basin. The first of these contributions, by Gillian Shepherd, considers Magna Graecia, which she defines as incorporating both Sicily and South Italy. These regions have produced archaeological material that perhaps most obviously indicates Greek influence. 
However, as Shepard argues, this is not evidence for the simple replication of ritual practice and its artifacts. In this context, she considers the transfer of cult during processes of settlement, and the development and nature of oikist, founder, cults. From the Greek West, we turn north, for Maya Murup's exploration of the evidence for Greek cult practice in the northern Black Sea littoral. Often treated by scholars as a single entity, in fact, this region comprised three distinct areas, Albia and its environs, well known for its cult of Achilles Pontakos, Kersenis, and, the focus of this chapter, the Bosporan Kingdom. The latter area is increasingly recognized as important for scholars of Greek settlement in the Black Sea area, and this chapter examines current scholarship, much of which is written in Russian. From north we turn east, with four chapters that look to increasingly distant cultures, Janen Bremer examines the powerful influences of Near East myth and cult on ancient Greek religion, and how these were transmitted. He identifies two types of religious transfers, influences from Mesopotamian, Hurrian Hittite, Phoenician, and Persian religious systems, and those from the Epicoric religions, especially Luian, Carian, Lycian, and Phrygian, which the Greeks who immigrated to Anatolia gradually included in their religious traditions. He draws particular attention to the disparate nature of these influences, and urges scholars to study both their geographical and social spread, and how they may have changed during this process. As Bremer notes in his chapter, Egypt has sometimes been treated as a part of the Near East. Here, interactions between Egyptian and Greek religious cultures, from the 5th century BCE to the 2nd century CE, are explored in a separate chapter, by Catherine Kleibel, focusing on Greco-Egyptian cult. Through detailed descriptions of the objects and organization of this cult, with particular emphasis on evidence for the mysteries of Isis, Kleibel explores the authority and appeal of the cult to its followers. She argues that they entered what was in effect a parallel world that achieved an effect of absolute power. Before leaving this eastern orientation, Rachel Mayer's chapter explores the evidence for connections with Greeks and Greekness in the diverse cult activities of the Hellenistic Far East, that is, the Hellenistic kingdoms of Bactria and India. She explains how Greek cults were only part of the religious constellation of the region, and emphasizes the different purposes to which religious images and practices might be put. The final chapter takes us to China, raising questions not of cultural influence but of cultural comparison. Lisa Rafels considers the similarities and differences to be found between ancient Greek and ancient Chinese cultures, regarding cosmogony and cosmology, relations and distinctions between gods and humans, and the scope and nature of divinatory practices. Overall, the structure of this handbook reflects the conviction of the editors that ancient Greek religion presents us with a complex subject, itself raising questions as well as providing answers about ancient society. We very much hope that the chapters here prove useful for opening up debates and encouraging further study in one of the most vibrant areas of scholarship on the ancient world. Part 1. What is Ancient Greek Religion? Chapter 1. Unity versus Diversity. Robin Osborne. Introduction. Tiji term religion cannot be translated into Greek. The Greeks knew that different people worshipped different gods and did so in different ways. They also knew that worship of different gods or use of different names for the gods tended to correlate with different cult organization and practice. But no Greek writer known to us classifies either the gods or the cult practices into separate religions. Modern scholars who talk of religions of the ancient Greeks, Price 1999, are applying a modern category in a modern way. Whether or not this is other than highly misleading is arguable. The absence of religions, as far as the Greeks were concerned, was a matter of theology. The gods were not local in their interests or powers, they held sway over the whole world. This is well brought out by the epics, the Iliad and the Odyssey, which stand at the head of the Greek poetic tradition, on the Homeric gods, see Kearns 2004. The war between Greeks and Trojans that provides the background for the Iliad is not a war between Greek gods and Trojan gods, the same Olympian deities are involved on both sides and both sides seek to acquire the favour of the same gods by exactly parallel cult practices, 
by dedication of precious objects, and by making costly animal sacrifices, compared to Iliad 6.286 ff. Potentially, the different gods with their different interests cancel each other out. But the universality of the interests of each of the gods means that they can be distracted. In some circumstances, as famously in Iliad 14. 153-353 when Hero beguiles Zeus, it is events among the gods themselves that distract them. But at the beginning of the Odyssey the other gods are able to work out a way of getting Odysseus back home to Ithaca while Poseidon, who is the god who opposes him, is away taking his pleasure at a feast among the Ethiopians, who have sacrificed a hecatom of bulls and rams to him. There was no limit to the variety of the gods. Although there was some sense that there was a privileged set of twelve Olympian gods, adding further gods was never problematic and the twelve Olympians could be worshipped under any variety of epithets. There was also no limit to the number of different stories that might be told about the gods and about their relations to each other. Right at the beginning of the extant poetic tradition, Hesiod, in his Theogony, attempts to impose some order on the gods by arranging them in a dynasty. Various other archaic Greek writers tried out their own versions subsequently, but there was never a canonical reference text, see West 1966, 12-16 on what we know of other Greek theogonies. Greeks were very tolerant of alternative stories about how the gods related to one another, and even about their divine status itself. A Theology of Diversity when the Greeks became familiar with other peoples and their gods they either recognized their own gods in those other gods or added a new god to the pantheon, on new god C, this volume, Anderson, chapter 21, and the chapters in part 9. The most important witness here is Herodotos, who, in surveying the peoples of the Persian Empire comments on their cult practices as well as on other aspects of their lives, Harrison 2000. His description of Persian practice, 1.131, gives a good indication of the way in which he deals with divergent religious practice. I know that the Persians have the following customs, they do not make it their custom to set up statues of the gods and temples and altars, but they bring mockery upon those who do so, in my view because they do not consider the gods to be in human form, as the Greeks do. Their custom is to make sacrifice to Zeus, climbing up the highest of the mountains, and they call the whole sphere of the heavens Zeus. They also sacrifice to the sun, moon, earth, fire, water and winds. In the beginning these were the only gods they sacrificed to, but they have been taught to sacrifice to heaven, learning it from the Assyrians and Arabians. The Assyrians call Aphrodite Mylitta, the Arabians call her Alilat, the Persians Mitra. Herodotos is quite happy here to identify the gods as the same despite their being envisaged quite differently and seems not worried at all by the almost complete divergence of cult practice, he goes on to point out that their sacrifices involve none of the paraphernalia normal in Greek sacrifices, no altar, no fire, no libation, no music, no garlands, no barley grains. Not only is the recognition of gods as the same not prevented by divergent beliefs and cult practices, there is no sense in Herodotus' discussion that the way in which the Greeks worship the gods is the proper way from which divergence elsewhere constitutes degradation. Indeed, famously, Herodotus reckons that the Greeks, far from coming first, got their ideas about the gods from the Egyptians, 2.4. They, the Egyptians, were accustomed to say that the Egyptians were the first to establish the names of the gods and that the Greeks took up the names from them, and they were also the first to assign altars, statues, and temples to the gods and to carve images in stone. Later, 2.43, he claims to have a great deal of evidence that the Greeks got the name of Heracles from Egypt, and quotes the Egyptians as claiming that the twelve gods descended from the eight gods 17,000 years before the reign of Amasis in the 6th century BCE. This puts the Egyptian gods in a quite different league from the Greek gods, for Herodotus goes on to say, 2.53, that it was Homer and Hesiod who supplied the Greeks with the gods' family tree, names, roles, attributes, and forms, and that Homer and Hesiod lived 400 years before his own time, in fact, about a 30% overestimate. One further feature of Herodotus' discussion is worth noting. He not only allows that cult practices and so on may differ from ethnic group to ethnic group, 
but that there may be differences of practice even within an ethnic group. So, of the Egyptians, he observes explicitly that certain sacrificial practices are universal across all Egypt, 2.4041, but that, with the exception of Isis and Osiris, not all Egyptians worship the same gods in the same way, 2.42. The importance of Herodotus is less as an authority, he had a rather mixed reputation in antiquity when it came to reliability, than as a witness to the sorts of ways in which Greek intellectuals, at least, thought about the gods. The willingness that he displays to recognize among non-Greek peoples the gods worshipped by the Greeks, regardless of their names and the fact that the ways of worshipping them were quite different, is reflected by the Greeks' own variety of ways of referring to and worshipping the same gods. Take the matter of naming the gods. Names were important, for if sacrifices, dedications, and prayers were to win favour they needed to be recognised by the god to whom they were offered. But Greek gods were worshipped under many names, not only were epithets regularly added to the name of a god, Apollo Carneos, Apollo Delios, Apollo Delphinios, Apollo Lycios, Apollo Nomios, Apollo Pythios, Apollo Smintheus, and so on but gods might have alternative names, Dionysos is also Bacchus. Scholars have sometimes taken the view that Greeks considered names powerful, and that getting the name right was needed to make a god do what one wanted. Indeed, in a classic formulation, Frenkel, 1950, Volume 2, 100, on Aeschylus Agamemnon 160, wrote, To know the name of a demon is to acquire power over him, ei y gut das niemand weiss. Das ICH Rumpelstilschen Heiss. But although the idea of the name of God as powerful is familiar in Jewish religion, as far as the Greeks go, at least, this seems to be a misunderstanding. The emphasis in Greek formulations is not on getting the name of the God right but in calling the God by the name that pleases them most, as Plato explicitly puts it in Kratilos, 400e, in our prayers it is customary for us to pray that we may call them by the names and places of origin that they themselves rejoice in. Pull in 1997, Chapter 6. The important theological point here is that, for the Greeks, their gods were at the same time universal, found everywhere and powerful over the whole world, and intensely local, manifesting themselves in particular places, both in the support they gave for particular groups and individuals and through actual epiphanies. Gods were recognized to be present in different ways in different places, so Apollo inspires the Pythia to produce oracular statements at Delphi, but his sanctuary at Delos was not an oracle. Sanctuaries certainly traded on the fact that they had long been recognized as places where making offerings to a specific god was particularly effective. But it was equally possible for a god to be invoked in any place or circumstance. One particularly nice illustration of this comes in Herodotus' story of Ladike from Kirene, wife of Amasis, who, threatened with death because of Amasis' impotence, prays to Aphrodite in her mind and, as it appears, in bed with Amasis, HDT, 2. 181. Similarly, although religious expertise was recognized Oedipus has Teresia summoned for his religious expertise and Creon is depicted as having followed Teresia's guidance, Euthyphro's father goes to consult an exegetes, the Athenian assembly listens to suggestions made by the seer Lampen, there was nothing for which religious experts were needed, Sof OT 284-6, and 992-3, 1058-9, PL Euthyphro. For CED. ML 73, 47-61. Not only could even animal sacrifice be performed without a priest, a 5th century inscription from Keos explicitly lays down that if the priest is not present the person wanting to sacrifice should call out three times and then do it himself. Sokolowski 1962, 129 LL 7, 11, compared to RO 27, 27-8, but no training was needed to become a priest in the first place. Although priesthoods were regularly restricted to those in a particular family, genos, the Athenians democratized some new priesthoods by allotting them from all Athenians of the appropriate gender, and, subsequently, cities frequently put priesthoods up for sale. Ritual Variation It is hardly surprising, therefore, that when we look at descriptions of cult practice or prescriptions for cult practice in particular places we find extremely wide variation. Take what is often thought of as the central cult act, animal sacrifice. 
Scholars often present a composite picture of what animal sacrifice involved, e.g. Burkett 1985, 55-7, derived largely from Homeric descriptions, e.g. Hong. O.D. 3.4-66, see further in this volume, Naden, Chapter 31, but there is no reason to think that there was, in fact, a paradigmatic sacrificial ritual, compared to Bremer 2007. In different places different animals were killed in different ways and different things were done with the resulting meat, which might variously be totally burned up, holocaust sacrifices, usually of piglets, cooked and compulsorily consumed on the spot, taken away for consumption at home, or sold. Priests were regularly rewarded with part of the sacrificed animal, but not always with the same part. And sometimes something quite different was done. An extreme example of variance is provided by the sacrifices to Artemis Lafria at Potras. We know about these sacrifices only from Pausanias, who mentions in his discussion of Messene, for point thirty one point seven eight, that the Messenians and the people of Potras alone received the cult of Artemis Lafria from Caledon in Aetolia, and then gives a full description of the major cult act at the sanctuary at Potras in his discussion of that city, 7.18. According to that description, for the festival of the Lafria they pile up wood round the altar and then people bring birds, all sorts of sacrificial victims, wild boar, deer, wolf, and bear cubs. They then set fire to the wood and prevent any beasts escaping. This sacrifice breaks all the normal rules. The animals here are killed by burning, rather than being killed before being cooked. Rather than the victims being killed singly, they are killed as a group. The victims include wild animals, which are not normally sacrificed. Although all this is odd, none of it is completely unheard of. Pausanias stresses the foreignness of the name Lafria and the cult image at Potras, but foreign here turns out to mean from central Greece. It happens that excavation at the sanctuary of Artemis and Apollo at Calapidae in Phokis in central Greece has now revealed faunal evidence for the sacrifice of wild animals, boar and deer, there. Pausanias also, 10.32.14.17, knows of a festival at Tithyria, also in Phokis, where oxen, deer, geese, and guinea fowl are burnt on a pyre. Lucian, in his work on the Syrian goddess, 49, reports a sacrifice at Hierapolis in which trees are set up in the sanctuary, goats, sheep, and birds are hung up alive from the trees, and then the whole is set alight, Lightfoot 2003. 500 to 6. Whether one of these festivals influenced another is not important, what is important is that these forms of sacrifice, though found notable by Greek observers coming from elsewhere, were within the bounds of possible sacrificial activity. Visitors did not have to examine the small print of sacred laws, however, or wait to see through a whole year's calendar of festivals in order to appreciate the variety of cult practice. That variety was written large in the physical appearance of the sanctuaries. This applies to their buildings, their visible history, and, above all, to their votives. There was probably no single physical feature common to all sanctuaries. Even the altar, which might be thought fundamental, could be absent various famous sanctuaries, including those of Zeus at Olympia and on Mount Lycian, had altars formed only from the accumulation of ash and other debris from historic sacrifices. Images of the god were regular, but not universal, and temples might take a wide variety of sizes and shapes, or might be absent altogether, see further in this volume, Scott, chapter 16. Equally, there was probably no sort of building or monument that could not be found in a sanctuary. Sanctuaries variously included theatres, facilities for games, stowers, dining rooms, caves and artificial underground rooms, spaces for public gatherings, spaces for private initiation ceremonies, art galleries, treasuries, rooms for sleeping in, workshops, everything, perhaps, apart from private houses. This range of features gave sanctuaries an extremely diverse appearance. This is only to be expected, given the way in which virtually all human cultural activities could be, and regularly were, seen to relate to the gods and incorporated within human life it was the natural activities, birth, death, sex, that were more problematic, Parker 1983, CHS 2 and 3. The different structures visible in different sanctuaries related to the particular activities that went on there. 
Different sanctuaries were visited by various groups at different frequencies and for varying purposes. Some sanctuaries attracted small family or other cult groups only occasionally. Some sanctuaries attracted enormous crowds occasionally for their major festivals. Other sanctuaries attracted groups of individuals, whether, for example, individuals looking for healing by spending a night sleeping in a sanctuary or those who had come to ask some particular question of an oracular god. See further in this volume, Ills Johnston, Chapter 32, and Graf, Chapter 34. Those who gathered in sanctuaries variously came to do something or to be spectators. Some came to sanctuaries because festivals were an opportunity to meet others, including for purposes of courtship. Others came to sanctuaries because they were places to get away from the rest of the world, places of asylum. Many came to sanctuaries expecting to feast there, but in some festivals, at least, there were days when those who came were expected to fast there, the Athenian Thesmophoria included a day actually called Nestiae, or fasting day. On some occasions the whole sacrificial animal was burnt up, leaving no meat for the worshippers, see Jameson 1999. The various activities in different sanctuaries left varying traces, not just accidentally but on purpose. In particular, many came to sanctuaries in order to give the god or goddess a gift. The variety of gifts had few absolute limits. Plato in Laws, 955e-956b, suggests that, in his ideal city, there would be a ban on dedications made of ivory, because ivory is culled from a dead animal, on iron and bronze because they are used for weapons of war, and on gold and silver because they encourage envy. Many Greek sanctuaries teemed with gold and silver, and from an early date ivory was plentiful, moreover, while shields and other elements of armour may have outnumbered offensive weapons, there are plenty of spearheads to be found and Persian swords had a proud place on the Athenian Acropolis, Harris 1995. But Plato's thoughts in this passage were not thoughts that no one had previously entertained. We have a series of regulations from sanctuaries in the Peloponnese which limit or ban jewellery or fancy clothing, though it is striking that, in some cases, the penalty for offending is precisely to dedicate the item in question, so LSCG 68, Parker 1983, 82-3. And there is sensitivity too about leather, unless from sacrificial beasts, LSCG 65.22-3. Local Customs it was not primarily regulations that dictated what was to be found in a sanctuary, but local custom. It is very unlikely that any authority had ever prescribed the dedication of statues of naked young men, kuroi, at the sanctuary of Apollo Toyos near Krafnian in Boeotia, but by the time of the Persian Wars a visitor to that temple would be met by a forest of more than a hundred kuroi, duck at 1971. That this was a sanctuary of Apollo clearly played some part in attracting dedications of this form. The sanctuary of Athena on the Athenian Acropolis attracted a large number of statues of young maidens, Korai, but few Kuroi. But other Apollo sanctuaries, including the wealthy Delphi and Delo sanctuaries, were much less heavily populated with these petrified young men. What has emerged from the study of votives from different sanctuaries in the same place receiving dedications during the same period is that both particular location, down by the harbour, up on the Acropolis, and the perceived personality of the deity involved played a part in determining what was dedicated. So the two sanctuaries at Emborio on Chios from which votives have been excavated yield, in one case, the Athena sanctuary on the Acropolis, dedications that celebrate fulfilment of civic expectations, and, in the other case, the harbour sanctuary, dedications that flag up links with the outside world and the possibility of procuring exotic items, Morgan 1990, 230-2. The distinctiveness of the individual sanctuary, whether in its buildings or its votives, reflects the distinctive character projected onto the Greek gods by their worshippers. Greek communities worshipped the gods they considered themselves to need in the places and ways they thought would best fulfil that need. There was a constant dialogue between the image of a god received from past generations and the imagination of current worshippers. This dialogue was carried on through material gestures as well as through words, both were intended to persuade other humans and the god himself or herself of the style of human life that god should be considered to support. The tradition of past generations, like the accumulation of customary practice, 
whether expressed in law or not, only ever provided the starting point for a new generation's rewriting of their relationship with a particular God. For all the homeostatic development of religious thought and cult, it remains true that, notwithstanding the historic and geographical diversity to be found in Greek religious practice, it was not the case that anyone could do anything and have it regarded by fellow Greeks as acceptable religious behaviour. Part of the diversity was itself the product of different prohibitions. Sanctuaries put up regulations prohibiting particular practices as readily as they put up regulations as to what was to happen. A fine example is provided by a 5th century regulation from the sanctuary of Heracles on Thasos, to Thasian Heracles it is not permitted, to sacrifice, goat or pig. And not for a woman. And no ninths are given. And no perquisites are cut. And no games, IG 12, Supple 414. In this sanctuary what could be sacrificed, who could be involved, how precisely the victim was treated, the practice of dividing off a ninth share to be burnt entire, and what other activities went on are all subject to strict control, on sacred laws, see in this volume, Petrovich, chapter 23. Scholars have noted that it is absolutely standard for the prohibitions, and other sacred laws, to cite no authority, by contrast to other city laws that record how they came to be agreed, Parker 2004. If authority was needed for the regulation of cult practice then it had to come from the gods themselves, through an oracle, most commonly Apollo's oracle at Delphi, a central authority in a very literal sense given Delphi's claim to be the navel of the earth. Some regulations do indeed invoke Apollo as authority, as, for example, does the great 4th century regulation about purification from Kirin, R.O. 97, and religious practices were one of the main things about which cities consulted oracles. Despite Bowdoin's claims to the contrary, this is well borne out by the list of Athenian consultations in Bowdoin 2005, Ap 2. But although oracles might settle local practice when major changes were introduced, or when there was some local dispute, in most cases there is no sign that those in charge of a sanctuary considered that they needed any outside sanction before imposing a particular practice. Polytheism and political fragmentation together guaranteed that there was no central religious authority. But for all the absence of a central authority, there were practices that no one engaged in, human sacrifice for one. For all that there are stories of human sacrifice told both about the mythical and about the historical past, no cult rules required human sacrifice. The nature of the stories shows that they are precisely parading the boundaries of what could, in any circumstances, be accepted, Hughes 1991, especially Chapter 4. In part, the issue here was theological, sanctuaries were places where the ultimate power of the gods had to be respected even non-sacrificial killing in a sanctuary was problematic, for example, the deaths of Chilon and Pausanias, Thuck. 1.126, 134, compared to 128. Even for someone to die of natural causes in a sanctuary was regarded as improper, Parker 1983, Chapter 2. Almost equally unacceptable was sex in sanctuaries. The question of whether there was sacred prostitution anywhere in the ancient world, and in particular whether claims made about Corinth by Pindar, FR 122, and Strabo, the 8th of June 2020, constitute evidence for sacred prostitution in the Greek world has been much debated. Beard and Henderson 1998, viewed in 2008. But it is clear that part of what generated stories of sacred prostitution, both within the Greek world and outside it, compared to e.g. HDT, 1.99, Strabo 14 November 2016, the 16th of January 2020, Lucian Syrd, 6, Eusebius Vit. Const 3.55 was precisely the absolute prohibition on sexual intercourse within sanctuaries, a prohibition featured in stories as well as in sacred laws and identified by Herodotos, 2.64.1, as peculiar to Greeks and Egyptians, Parker 1983, 73-5. One of the earliest regulations that we have from a sanctuary, that of Zeus at Olympia, is concerned exclusively with fornication, Buck 64. Herodotos ends his history with the story of Artectes having sex in the sanctuary of Protesilaus at Eleus, 
compare to 7.33. That giving birth in sanctuaries was also thought improper, RO 102.5, fuck. 3.104, is presumably related. Conclusion What the examples of human sacrifice and sexual intercourse show is not simply that what might be included in cult activity had its limits, but that those limits came to be identified as characteristic of what it was to be Greek. What was at stake here was not primarily a matter of theology, on the one hand, the Greeks were prepared to think that gods might indeed ordain human death or even require human sacrifice, on the other, they allowed infringement of the no-sex rule, like infringement of other local rules, to be rectified by paying a fine and making a sacrifice. These fundamental and shared expectations about not doing certain things in sanctuaries were rather a matter of defining one's distinctive moral stature in the wider world. If the diversity of Greek religion is as great as the diversity of Greek polis, its unity is the unity that underlay the claim that the world of the polis was Greek. Chapter 2 Belief versus Practice Thomas Harrison I in a splendid passage of his lectures on the religion of the Semites, Robertson Smith argued trenchantly that, in approaching ancient religions, it was necessary to rid oneself of assumptions based on Christianity. Smith 1894, 16-7, for Smith, C.E.G. Bell 1997, 261-2, Naden 2013, 4 9. Hitherto, he observed, the study of religion had been the study of Christian beliefs, with religious duties flowing from the dogmatic truths, the learner, is taught to accept. All this seems to us so much a matter of course that, when we approach some strange or antique religion, we naturally assume that here also our first business is to search for a creed, and find in it the key to ritual and practice. But the antique religions had for the most part no creed, they consisted entirely of institutions and practices. No doubt men will not habitually follow certain practices without attaching a meaning to them, but as a rule we find that while the practice was rigorously fixed, the meaning attached to it was extremely vague, and the same rite was explained by different people in different ways without any question of orthodoxy or heterodoxy arising in consequence. In ancient Greece, for example, certain things were done at a temple, and people were agreed that it would be impious not to do them. But if you had asked why they were done, you would probably have had several mutually contradictory explanations from different persons, and no one would have thought it a matter of the least religious importance which you chose to adopt. Indeed the explanations offered would not have been of a kind to stir any strong feeling, for in most cases they would have been merely different stories as to the circumstances under which the right first came to be established, by the command or by the direct example of the God. The right, in short, was connected not with a dogma but with a myth. Belief in a certain series of myths was neither obligatory as a part of true religion, nor was it supposed that, by believing, a man acquired religious merit and conciliated the favour of the gods. What was obligatory or meritorious was the exact performance of certain sacred acts prescribed by religious tradition. These profound differences in ancient religion, as Smith perceived them, were fundamental, then, to the approach that he adopted. Since ritual and practical usage were, strictly speaking, the sum total of ancient religions, Smith 1894, 20, he took as his starting point the institutions of religion, delaying discussion of metaphysical questions. In so doing, of course, and in his sharp distinctions between doctrine or dogma, on the one hand, and practice on the other, he found confirmation for his starting position. Smith's distinctions between Christian and ancient religions, and between belief and practice, also served another purpose, however, that of preserving his own Christian faith from criticism. The story of the religion of the Semites is of an evolution, a gradual breaking free of the spiritual truth from the husk of a material embodiment, as his discussion of ancient sacrifice as a sacramental act of communion makes clear, Smith 1894, 439-40. In primitive ritual this conception is grasped in a merely physical and mechanical shape, as indeed, in primitive life, all spiritual and ethical ideas are still wrapped up in the husk of a material embodiment. To free the spiritual truth from the husk was the great task that lay before the ancient religions, if they were to maintain the right to continue to rule the minds of men. 
that some progress in this direction was made, especially in Israel, appears from our examination. But on the whole it is manifest that none of the ritual systems of antiquity was able by mere natural development to shake itself free from the congenital defect inherent in every attempt to embody spiritual truth in material forms. A ritual system must always remain materialistic, even if its materialism is disguised under the cloak of mysticism. The personal faith of Christianity, by contrast, lay too deep to be touched by criticism, as Smith wrote in an early essay of 1869, no attack on the gospel history can have such a personal weight as is at all comparable to the Christian's conviction of the reality of the historical Christ, Smith 1912, 134. Many aspects of Robertson Smith's thinking, his sharp opposition between belief and practice, his commitment to liberate the study of ancient religion from Christianizing assumptions, have continued to structure the study of Greek religion to this day. Especially perhaps in the last quarter of the 20th century, leading scholars of Greek, and Roman, religion habitually defined their subject in terms of sharp contrasts, the absence in antiquity of phenomena considered central to Christianity in the phrase of Robert Garland, 1994, 9, a negative catechism. So, for example, practice not belief is the key, and to start from questions about faith or personal piety is to impose alien values on ancient Greece, Price 1999, 3, cf. Price 1984, 3, 11, what mattered was the performance of cult acts, not the state of mind of the actor, Osborne 1994, 144, Greek religion may then fairly be said to be ritualistic in the sense that it was the opposite of dogmatic, Osborne 1994, 144, and so on. At the same time, however, the intellectual background to Robertson Smith's formulation has, in many respects, evaporated. Few would now share his underlying model of an evolutionary development culminating in, a distinctively Protestant, Christianity. More broadly, Christianity has, in so many areas of Western society, receded to the point that it is scarcely any longer a meaningful point of comparison, to the extent that a Church of England vicar making a home visit might plausibly be thought more likely to be a stripper, Macaulay 2014. New approaches in scholarship, moreover, from social anthropology and the cognitive science of religion, C. E. G. Srenson 2005, have emphasized the very large gulf that exists in creedal religions between the formal doctrinal position and the beliefs manifested in everyday online contexts, and the inability of those charged with doctrinal consistency to assert any meaningful control. The tragedy of the theologian, for Pascal Boyer, is that there always seem to be some non-standard beliefs and practices left sticking out, Boyer 2001, 281, compared to Tremlin 2006, 92, 96, 161, 163, 171. The fact, then, that some religions define themselves through dogmas and orthodoxy, King 2003, 283, the question of the presence or absence of a creed in any religious system, while still undoubtedly a significant factor, becomes markedly less central. And the way is opened up for an approach which rather than being based on a series of negative contrasts taken as given is more openly comparative. In particular also in parallel to the decent ring of the polis as the defining focus of Greek religion, a model which both depended upon and reinforced the emphasis on ritual, see especially Kint 2012, belief has made a comeback, albeit a partial one. Objections to the term belief, when applied to Greek religion, or more generally, can broadly be said to belong to two overarching families. The first, made in elaborate detail in the classic discussion of Rodney Needham, focuses on the difficulty of translation between cultures, put simply, the lack of any clear or stable vocabulary in a range of languages, ancient and modern, equivalent to belief, the lack of any concept of belief, Needham 1972. In the Greek context, skirmishes have focused on the expression nomazine choose theirs, a phrase translated variously as to acknowledge the existence of the gods, to worship the gods according to cultic tradition or, smudging the issue, as accept the gods in the normal way, verse 0 2011, 552-4, 554-8, Parker 2011, 36. 
it is clear that any attempt to find neat equivalents for such a concept in foreign languages would be a fruitless one. Such terms and concepts have complex histories in any language. Needham 1972. Chapter 3. Compare to Smith 1977. But, as Henk Versnell has argued compellingly, though the effort to describe the range of, emic, concepts available to a historical people may still be an important one, it is no block to our additionally describing the same people in our own, etic, terms, compared to Versnell 2011, App 4, especially 548-51. The other main family of objections, following on from Robertson Smith, focuses on perceived differences between ancient and modern religions, and in particular on the suggestion, supposedly, implicit in the term belief of an emphasis on spiritual commitment, or on assent to a set of propositional beliefs. Price 1984, 10-11. Does belief, however, necessarily have such implications? More recently, distinctions have been drawn between different meanings or levels of belief, between a high-intensity Christian usage, belief as a deliberate commitment, adherence to a set of dogmas, etc., and an alternative low-intensity usage, belief as in common parlance, or between belief and belief. Harrison 2000, 18-23. Verse 0 2011, 548. If we were to accept that Christian religion could not in fact be reduced to a set of creedal propositions any more than ancient polytheism, compared to verse 0 2011, 552, then we might nuance this distinction further. In place of our distinction between high intensity and low intensity belief, we might instead distinguish between an emic, Christian perspective, the Christian, or just one Christian, ideal of personal spiritual commitment, on the one hand, and, on the other, the reality of Christian belief and practice, or we might distinguish between the different value placed on belief in different contexts, Feeney 1998, 13. Ironically, even as we have tried to free ancient religion from Christianizing assumptions, we may have privileged a distinctively Christian ideal of belief, one with its own history, see here Assad 1993. 27 to 54. If we look only for high intensity belief in the Greek world, it is no surprise if we find it to be scarce. It has been well pointed out, however, that the discourse of unbelief in the Greek world suggests the capacity to conceptualize its reverse, for how can one person deny the existence of the gods unless all others do believe that they exist? Verse 0 2011, 553. If we widen the search, However, we are rewarded with evidence from a wide range of sources, from oratory, historiography, drama, epigraphy, as well as art reflecting ideas, for example, concerning oracles and divination, the justice, or injustice, of the divine, the presence of an afterlife, or the reasons for propitiating the divine. The existence of some such level of low-intensity belief is now indeed sometimes presented as self-evident. Surely, even a ritual is performed in the belief that there was some purpose in doing it. Parker 2011, 2. One worships the gods, in Robert Parker's words, because, experience shows, benefit derives from doing so. The gods are there. At this very basic level there is indeed belief, a belief very generally shared, or at least feigned, and in social terms not wholly safe to repudiate. Parker 2011, 32. Compare to Linda and Scheid 1993, 53 to 4, verse 0 2011, 552. There is a danger, however, that religious belief here is seen, primarily or exclusively, as a kind of penumbra to ritual action. Our sources, however, unquestionably give us more than just different stories of the origins of rites, to use Robertson Smith's phrase, and, indeed, in many cases they are not concerned with rites at all. A stronger formulation than that of Parker, for example, has it that while we might conceive of beliefs which are not put into ritual, there is no ritual which is not grounded in a set of beliefs, near about 1997, 329, compared to 335 to 6 on rituals without meaning. Rituals cannot simplistically be decoded with the use of a corresponding belief, but they are nonetheless enactments of meaning. Even then if you accept that beliefs do not necessarily stand in a clear, subservient relationship to ritual action, there is another hazard, that they are seen simply as secondary in terms of importance. 
A parallel danger is that the more clearly mediated evidence of literature is seen as simply less substantial than real religion, whatever that might be. Harrison 2007. 374. One way of mediating, in the words of Parker again, between those for whom Greek religion is a matter of things done at or near an altar, and those for whom it is rather the sum of the stories, speculations, and appeals just mentioned, is to argue that, though beliefs were held, only acts were subject to appeal. Parker 2011. 2. Compare 233 to 4. But must we then privilege things done over things said or thought? Can we go further than our distinction between two levels of belief, high and low intensity? How should we understand belief? A man is said to believe a thing, wrote Robertson Smith, when he cannot prove it, but has got something towards a proof, 1912, 111. Belief, in this sense, is usually seen as a conscious act of assent, or as a free and responsible decision of the will. It is also inseparably connected to an idea of the truth of what is even if the believer may decide to withhold his assent or if the idea asserted is untrue, Needham 1972, 80. However, as Robertson Smith went on to argue, very much from the position of a believer himself, this idea of belief as conscious assent, or as a hypothesis that, I feel, bound to accept till further facts turn up pro, or con, sits uncomfortably even with Christianity, 1912. 111. If so, whence the moral warmth that mingles with our discussion of Christianity? Why are we eagerly apologetic in behalf of a hypothesis? What interest can we have to maintain this hypothesis more than any other which will suit the facts equally well? I am sure no Christian would feel that a hypothetical Christianity was worth having. A series of alternative definitions of belief seek to capture this broader aspect. Belief as a spiritual commitment, as trust, as one might trust a friend without seeking to test his, her words, or as disposition. So in Wittgenstein's image, for example, a belief is like a picture, say, a picture of the last judgment, which the believer has constantly in their mind, regulating his life, constantly admonishing me, Wittgenstein 1966, 55. Belief can also be seen as associated with feeling and affection. Needham 1972, 94, a perspective that brings to the surface some of the psychological complexity and variety of belief. So, for example, belief in God can be seen as encompassing a whole range of emotions from reverential love to rebellious rejection, not only trust but also awe, dread, dismay, resentment, and perhaps even hatred, Malcolm 1964, 107. And in yet another long-standing strand of thought, belief has been seen as background knowledge. So, for example, for Hume, belief is an act of the mind arising from custom, custom being everything which proceeds from a past repetition, without any new reasoning or conclusion, such as tradition and authority, cited by Needham 1972, 72, compared to Weeb 1979, 237. This last approach to belief presents similarities with some more recent, cognitively grounded definitions, for example, with a common distinction between, on the one hand, intuitive or database belief, and, on the other, reflective beliefs, compared to Tremlin 2006, 177 for variant terminology. Database beliefs, in the definition of Dan Sperber, are intuitive in the sense that, in order to hold them as beliefs, we need not reflect, or even be capable of reflecting on the way we arrived at them or the specific justification we may have for holding them. 1997, 68. Reflective beliefs, on the other hand, are derived by conscious reasoning, by teaching from parents, and so on, and are variable and heterogeneous. Such cognitively based definitions of belief are, of course, conceived as rooted in the physical operations of the brain. Another crucial difference, however, from earlier approaches is that these different forms of belief are seen as operating in parallel to one another. Strikingly also, the focus is on plural beliefs rather than belief. Reflective beliefs, according to Sperber again, are interpretations of representations embedded in the validating context of an intuitive belief, 1996, 89. By contrast, it seems, Within the ritual belief debate in the study of Greek religion, belief is almost always seen as singular, 
Belief is something which you either do or do not have. A further step then, beyond accepting as uncontroversial the presence in Greek religion of a low-intensity belief, is to open up the overall domain of belief and to look in at the hugely varied propositional statements that constitute it and to explore particular beliefs or propositions both in their literary or other contexts and in relation to one another. When presented with a given statement, we should ask, in the words of an earlier theorist of belief, Wilfred Cantwell Smith, not what does it mean, inherently, statically, absolutely, but rather, what has it meant? What has been its meaning in this or that century, in this or that part of the world, to this or that community? Smith 1977, 17. We might examine, for example, the performative context for any particular statement, or the range of possible meanings available for any particular terms used, compare to Skinner 2002, 57-89. The picture that emerges, then, is a dynamic one, in which certain beliefs might be said only to be activated in particular circumstances, compare to Idenel 2011, 9. The belief, for example, in the possibility of divine retribution as an explanation of misfortune may lie dormant, as it were until the right circumstances align, until a notoriously sacrilegious individual, for example, suffers a misfortune so extreme, or so well matched to his or her crime, as to be instinctively credited to the divine, Harrison 2000, Chapter 3. Such a belief might indeed be said only to be generated as a spontaneous inference in that particular context, Sperber 1997, 69, developed on the basis of a lexicon or network of other intuitive beliefs. To pursue the example of divine retribution, behind the conclusion that X person has been the victim of divine retribution, there may lie any of the following, more or less unexamined, beliefs, about the definition of sacrilege, or the semantic field of terms for impiety or injustice, about the appropriateness of certain acts of human vengeance, about the likely forms of retribution, the appropriate speed of retribution, the characters or domains of individual gods, the behavior appropriate to men or women, and much more. A number of other complexities of belief might be explored. How, first, can we begin to infer beliefs? How are beliefs expressed? And how does the manner of their expression a first-person assertion, an ascription to others, or a fleeting disclosure of a presupposition affect the nature of that evidence? In the Greek context, in particular, beliefs are commonly expressed in narrative form, Compare to Kint 2006, 43-4. The story of the fulfillment of an oracle or of an instance of divine retribution ends with all the evidence tied up, apparently conclusively. In another sense, however, such stories remain open-ended, with the lurking moral, the implied proposition, that the same may happen again, that the gods have the power to punish wrongdoers, for example, e.g. HDT 9.120 or that an oracle is blind to the wealth and status of those that consult it, most famously, the story of Croesus. These kinds of stories have, perhaps, an underestimated role in the transmission, reinforcement, and transformation of belief. The way in which such narrative beliefs tidy up their own narrative trails may also mislead us, however, into a too neat a view of the explanatory role of Greek religion, compared to Gould 1985. As readers, we cannot but see things from the vantage point of the story's end, the point at which the opaque prophecy becomes clear, or the sudden misfortune explicable in terms of an earlier action that had prompted it. If, on the other hand, you try to reconstruct the vision of a character beset on all sides by potential omens, the situation of Xenophon in the Anabasis, for example, or of the individual casting around for explanations of a pattern of misfortune, we see arguably a different picture of boundless potentiality, compared to Nairbout 1997, 396N, 946. Another related complexity is the possibility of a kind of slippage in religious contexts between seemingly literal and figurative usages, the way in which a given proposition may shift from being, to not being, in quotes. In the terminology of Sperber again, any encyclopedic statement can be rendered a symbolic statement if put in quotes, Sperber 1996, 110. So, for example, 
an individual might shift from the statement P is true to the statement P is the word of God is true, or the Christian might hesitate between a literal and a figurative interpretation of the Eucharist. There are, perhaps, two related dangers here. The first is that such religious propositions are seen as characteristically distinct from others, in so far, for example, as they are incapable of disproof, compared to Wittgenstein 1966, 53 to 4. Such statements, however, semi-propositional representational beliefs in Sperber's terminology, are by no means restricted to religious contexts. Indeed, there are many areas where, if we do not speak figuratively, we can say very little, Soskis 1985, 96. The second risk is that such statements are envisaged as merely figurative or symbolic, and so as empty of value for the historian, that we draw too sharp a distinction between literal and metaphorical meaning, compared to Soskis 1985, 68-70, and so focus on the fact of metaphorical or symbolic language being deployed rather than examining the meaning that it conveys. The statement, for example, that Jesus is the Lamb of God is clearly not meant literally, but this is not to say that the phrase is intended by Christians as only an evocative way of describing an ordinary man, Soskis 1985, 89. The slippage, detected by Sperber, between the literal and the figurative is indeed one means by which such propositions can be lived by. These complexities of religious belief and others, the ways, for example, in which beliefs can be maintained despite contradictory evidence, are reinforced through their expression in action, including ritual, or are transmitted, are all deserving of more intense focus in the context of Greek religion. Before that can take place, however, we need, arguably, to emancipate ourselves further from the long legacy of the study of Greek religion, with its false choice of ritual and belief, and to accept the sphere of religious belief as a more significant aspect in the study of Greek religious experience. Chapter 3. Old versus New. Emily Kearns. Introduction. Religions are systems that both evolve and look to the past. Like any other, the religion of the Greeks, from the earliest times known to us until the triumph of Christianity exhibits continuity and change. The latter hardly needs comment, but the former is present too. Even in the transition from the Mycenaean period to the Dark Ages, once viewed as a more or less absolute cultural fault line, we are becoming aware of increasing numbers of sanctuaries which show cult continuity, Nehemiah NP, while many trends once viewed as typically Hellenistic can now be seen to have roots in the classical period, compared to Michelson 1998. The history of such developments is the history of Greek religion, what I am more concerned with in this brief chapter is to tease out the structural significance of old and new within the system and to analyze the practitioner's reactions, perceptions, and conscious thought on old and new in religious matters. Tradition and Innovation, Gods, Ritual, Thought Greek religion may be viewed as an essentially traditional system, and when Greeks talked about religious matters they tended to equate the old with the esteemed. Nevertheless, as Parker, 1995, 152-3, neatly puts it, Traditional polytheisms are subject to constant change, that is one of their traditions. There is always room for new gods, new identifications of old gods, and new associations between gods, and alongside these we can also often detect changes in cult practice and patterns of religious thought. Innovation, or preservation, may thus be discerned in three main areas of the Greek religious system. Firstly, and most conspicuously in the scholarly literature, e.g. Garland 1992, Parker 1995, 152-98, we can identify new gods. As discussed in more detail by Ralph Anderson, this volume, chapter 21, we can see many examples of the adoption of new objects of worship from the 5th century onwards, they may be deities already worshipped in other parts of the Greek world, like Pan and perhaps Boreas in Athens, or they may be the gods of other peoples, Adonis, Sabazios, and later Isis, Osiris, men. And they may be accepted as part of public state-funded cult, like Bendis in Athens, or remain as objects of private. Worship, Adonis. To avoid the suggestion that their promoter might wish to demote the traditional gods of the city, as the prosecution alleged of Socrates, Diog. Let. 
2. 40. One might emphasize the antiquity of the new deity's worship elsewhere, and, if a foreign god, lay stress on an identification with a Greek equivalent, in terms of name and typical ritual. Alternatively, the new god might be known solely by a Hellenized form of the original name, and perhaps worshipped with ritual of a somewhat exotic flavor. Both foreignness and novelty could be played up or played down. To the Greeks, how you worshipped mattered as much as whom. There were countless rules, some local, some almost universal, laying down what type of sacrifice might be given to individual gods and heroes. The old ways were tried and tested, and the fact that they were supposed to be pleasing to the gods had often an emotional, as well as a practical, appeal. Porphyry, Abstract. 2.18, gives an anecdote, possibly of late origin, in which Aeschylus refuses to write a paean on the grounds that an older paean by Tinachos of Chalcus would always be preferred, just as more ancient, simpler statues are thought to be more divine. However, there might still be inducements to change, particularly financially motivated ones. The author of the Rhetorica ad Alexandrum, attributed to Aristotle, discusses appropriate arguments for retaining sacrifices just as they are, and for making them either more or less magnificent and therefore costly, 1423-4a. Greater magnificence should be represented as an increase of the established order, likely to please both gods and humans, rather than an alteration, he argues, and lesser expenditure as demonstrating pleasing piety. Changing the style of worship completely is clearly not an option. A third area of possible change is the least tangible, that of religious thought and mentalities. This whole phenomenon covers much ground of fundamental importance to the religious historian, but at the same time is relatively little discussed by the Greeks themselves. Ancient perceptions of changes in religious outlook tend not to go beyond the view that later ages exhibit a decline in piety, for instance, P. L. Leg. 984b, e, and compare Isaac. Ariop. 29-30, below, p. 33. At the same time, relatively new explanations of cult and myth may be retrojected onto an earlier period and represented as wisdom expressed by the ancients in allegorical form. This kind of strategy is seen, for example, in the text known as the Dervini Papyrus, from the 4th or late 5th century BCE, explicating the cosmological meanings of an earlier Orphic theogony, and is parodied by Euripides in Bacchae 272-97. Myth, Change and Conflict In mythical terms, the Greeks were very clear that change had taken place in matters concerning the gods. The Theogonic traditions exemplified in Hesiod and the Orphic poets narrated the violent overthrow of gods older than Zeus and the Olympians, making no reference to mortals. But the idea that such conflicts could be played out in a human-oriented arena was also familiar, the eponymous chorus of Aeschylus Eumenides fight for their rights against the younger gods through their claim to be acting justly in persecuting Orestes. More significantly still, the same play records the view that, before Apollo came to Delphi, the place had belonged in succession to three older, female deities, Earth, the Miss, and the Titan Phoebe. Most scholars no longer believe this represents historical fact, but for the Greeks themselves it entails the view that deities other than Apollo were once the main recipients of Delphic cult. The form of worship practiced there in historical times had once been new. The Homeric hymns similarly narrate moments when cults were established. Apollo comes to Delphi, in a version different from that given by Aeschylus, and Demeter comes to Eleusis, each deity giving instruction concerning their worship. The priesthood is established, Cretan sailors in Apollo, the lords of Eleusis and, by implication, the family of Chelios in Demeter, and a link with the present is suggested. Similar etiological links occur in those less elaborate, non-hymnic traditions which speak more briefly of the foundation of a divine cult by a hero or heroine, usually under direct instruction from the deity, with the human founder as first priest of the cult. Their significance for us is twofold. On the one hand, they provide a template for innovation, the pattern cult foundations were perceived to follow, on the other, they give a strong legitimation to tradition, by indicating that the most familiar cults go back effectively unchanged to primordial times and the direct instruction of the deity concerned. Cult, 
Introductions and Arrivals We today, from our ethic perspective outside the Greek religious system, are accustomed to speak of introducing a cult. The Greeks too talked about establishing sanctuaries, altars, and statues. But, in addition, they said that the god arrived in a place, in other words, the motive force in the action was not so much the human agents as the deity itself. Examples are particularly easy to find in the cult of Asclepios. The inscription recording the inauguration of his worship in Athens, in 4210, makes the point clear, IG 224960. The god comes up to the city from the coast, and arrives, it is Asclepios himself who decides to come to Attica, his human host accepts his arrival and does everything possible to facilitate it. It is the same, according to the Epidorian miracle inscriptions, when the accidental arrival of a sanctuary snake at Halius announces the gods will to settle there, IG 42, 1122.69-82, no. 33, Lee Donici 1995, 111, B13, an analogous to is the well-known case of Pan, who sent a message to the Athenians through the runner Philippides to ask why they did not worship him, HDT 6.105. A human individual who introduces new gods may well be viewed with suspicion, but when it is the god himself who demands to be worshipped, there is a presumption of authenticity. Non-compliance would be foolish, multiple stories told of opposition to the arrival of Dionysos, Pentheus, Lycurgos, the inhabitants of Attica, all ultimately fruitless. Of course, the Greeks recognised a distinction between such ancient times and their own day and between mythological and more practical, everyday forms of discourse, so the mythological model does not map one-to-one -one onto the contemporary situation. Mythology dramatizes and simplifies, in the real world, the communication lines between gods and humans are uncertain. Therefore, confirmation for new cult institutions was often sought and received from an oracle. Oracular pronouncements were a very frequent incentive to religious action, and hence, often, change, for both cities and individuals, the question praying and sacrificing to which God will give us a better outcome, is a favourite, and a good proportion of the preserved responses from Delphi and Adona, real and imagined, is concerned with the regulation of religious affairs. In theory at least, oracles were understood to supply the divine command for a new cult, which, in the mythological paradigm, comes directly from the God instituting his own worship. Origins ancestral and additional. Whereas the new tends to demand justification, the prestige of the old might seem to speak for itself. But in fact, while some rituals might be universally recognised as old, there could be differing views on the status of other rites, along with differing accounts of their origins. Foundation myths lacked the status of universally recognised revelation, something else was needed. In Athens, a more prosaic backup was provided, at least from the late 5th century, by the attempt to classify sacrifices as ancestral, patria, that is, supposedly to be found in the laws of Solon, and additional, epitheta, having come into use since that time. But one of our main sources for this distinction also suggests the possible difficulty in agreeing the correct category for particular sacrifices. Lysias 30 is a speech for the prosecution of Nicomachos, who, in the last decade of the 5th century BCE, undertook probably two codifications of state sacrifices, as part of an overall clarification of the law. Nicomacho's brief was evidently to bring together into one list the Salonian sacrifices and those which had been added by decree at a later date, parts of what is almost certainly the resulting calendar survive, LSS 10. The speaker in Lysias claims that by accepting too many of the epitheta into his list, with ulterior motives darkly hinted at, Nicomachos has increased the expenditure on sacrifice beyond what the polis will bear, with the result that some of the patria have gone unsacrificed. No corroborating details are given, and we do not know whether the prosecution was successful. See Todd 1996. The important thing, from our point of view, is the clear distinction between the two types of sacrifice, and the differing worth attributed to them, while any sacrifice decreed by the people ought to be carried out, where this is not possible precedence should be given to the patria. The case can hardly be separated from its complex political context, 
but the point made by Lysias is closely echoed much later in the 4th century BCE in Isocrates Areopagiticos, 29-30. Speaking of the Athenians of old, he says they did not create a procession of 300 oxen when they felt like it and randomly omit the ancestral, patrioi, sacrifices, nor did they celebrate the additional, epithetoi, festivals on a magnificent scale when a feast was involved but make sacrifices from the lowest tender in the holiest of rituals. The equation of new with ostentatious and capricious, and old with simple and pious, has a moral force at least partly independent of any immediate context, and both underpins and goes further than the categorization of the old as compulsory and the new as optional. See also Dianga 2011, 90 8. Of course, other points of view are possible, but in Aristophanes Clouds, 984 5, it is the worst argument that takes the Buffonia ritual of the Athenian diapolia as a byword for something absurdly old fashioned. It is very significant that the Rhetorica ad Alexandrum, above, p. 30, recommends the representation of change as amplification, rather than substitution, just as implied by the word epitheta for the post Salonian sacrifices in Athens. Prompts and provocations. What circumstances stimulated the introduction of the new in religion? Was innovation as arbitrary a process as Isocrate seems to imply? Here, it is much easier to trace new cults than changes in cult style, and modern historians will naturally take a different viewpoint from the orator. Some cases would necessarily have gained the approval of the most traditional observers, for instance, the founding of new sanctuaries when new cities were founded. A city without sanctuaries was obviously unthinkable, and such foundations normally mimicked closely and deliberately their originals in the mother city, retaining contact and continuity by means of a physical object from it, Malkin 1991. Somewhat similar regional patterns can be observed, for example, in Attica, where, probably in the late 6th century, the important regional sanctuaries of Eleusis and Broran produced related establishments in the town area. Parker 1995, 73, here, old and new sanctuaries were necessarily linked more closely, and integrated together in polis-wide celebrations. More radically, new foundations often came about in connection with some sort of crisis. It was the events surrounding the Persian Wars that apparently stimulated the cults of Boreas, Pan, Artemis Agrotera, and Artemis Aristobule, among others, in Athens, c. In this volume, Anderson, Chapter 21. In a sense, all of these new cults and celebrations could be classed as thank offerings in response to deliverance from danger, but on a much larger scale than normal. Herodotus' account enlists a great number of gods and heroes in the struggle against the Persians, and it was probably not only in Athens that the crisis surmounted, new cults were brought into prominence and new aspects were given to old. It remains very likely that oracular consultation preceded the formal adoption of state cult in most cases. By contrast, the remarkable diffusion of the cult of Asclepios in the 5th and 4th centuries BCE, rather than being born from response to a particular crisis, is better seen as part of a growing trend, essentially independent of more specific circumstances. See Wittkaiser 2008, 97-105, 2009. The momentum of growth itself had a legitimating effect, and an Athenian audience of 422, of Esp. 121-3, was already expected to understand the concept of a trip to an Asclepian for healing purposes, before the establishment of the Athenian Asclepia. Mythology probably helped Asclepio's integration into the cult pantheon, his sons are mentioned in the Iliad, though there is no sign of his divinity there and it cannot have harmed his career that he was the son of Apollo, the oracular god par excellence. Thus far, our discussion, though drawing on specific illustrative examples, has proceeded mainly along general lines. Perhaps inevitably, it has tended to focus on innovation and response, matters which yield valuable explicit statements on the roles and perceived worth of old and new in religion, but this is only half the story we must also consider the numerous possibilities for their interplay in practice. Much will be discerned in the chapters that follow, but as an introductory case study we may consider the mysteries celebrated near the ancient city of Andania in Messenia. Andanian Mysteries When, in 370-69 BCE, 
a Messenian state was founded in what had been Spartan territory, west of Tejetos, it was necessary to create proper civic cults, presumably on the basis of whatever religious practices the various groups of enslaved, disfranchised, and diaspora Messenians had managed to carry out during Spartan rule. But the developed legend of the mysteries, as given by the 2nd century CE writer Pausanias, was that the ritual had been brought to Messenia in what we would call mythical times, by Corkin of Eleusis, and later reinforced or reformed by, the equally mythical, Lycos and Methopos. Later, in the Second Messenian War, when the national hero Aristomenes realized that defeat and subjugation by the Spartans was inevitable, he hid something held in secret, Ienoporotoi, among the Messenians, burying it on Mount Ithome and praying the gods to keep it safe, for if it were destroyed or fell into Spartan hands Messenia would perish forever. After the Spartan defeat at Leuctra, the Argive general Epitels received the instruction from a dream figure, identified as Corkin, to dig in a certain place on M.T. Ithome and rescue the old woman. There he found a bronze jar, Hydria, which he took to the the band general Epaminondas, who had himself been told by a similar dream figure to restore their land to the Messenians. Opening the jar, they found the ritual, Talit, written on thin sheets of tin, which members of Messenian priestly families transcribed into books, for 0.1.5, 9, 2.6, 20.3 to 4, 26.6 to 8, 27.5. The narrative's historicity is questionable, to say the least, but while Aristomenes is essentially a legendary figure, there is nothing implausible in the idea that the mysteries date back to roughly the time of their rediscovery in the 4th century, though hard evidence is lacking. Laragi 2008, 236-7. In shaping cults for the new polis at the time of its foundation, it would be highly desirable to link them with the period before the Spartan conquest. A new construction is built using older materials, elements from the religion of Helots, Perioikoi, or the diaspora, but also claiming a very much older origin. Firstly, a beginning in mythical times, if the attribution to Corkin is not a later addition. And, secondly, a crucial link for the new, independent Messenian polity with the moment just preceding its former extinction. Here, the new is essentially a recovery of the old, the unique history of Messenia allows and even encourages a particularly dramatic juxtaposition of the two. Even if their real origin is later than the 4th century, the point still stands for the received history of the ritual in the imperial period, the narrative as given in Pausanias. The mysteries are represented as both new, at the birth of the modern Messenian polis, and very old. The dream imagery of the narrative emphasizes this, with the command to rescue the old woman who was enclosed in a bronze chamber, near to death. This has some links with an earlier dream, experienced by a Messenian exile, who dreamed that he was having sex with his dead mother, who afterwards came to life. In accordance with a common principle of dream interpretation, Mother is taken to mean ancestral land, compared to HDT 6.107, Artemid. 1.79 The land is reunited with her children, and revives. The symbolic language in both cases indicates deliverance and new life for something old, and the coincidence of motifs reinforces the equation of the mysteries with Messenian identity that their talismanic status in the Aristomene story suggests. The validity of the new cult is established in part through a dream vision, a direct communication with the divine in the shape of the heroized Corkin, the first hierophant, and no oracular confirmation is attested. The ancient object found through a dream is unusual in antiquity, though commonly reported in the Greece of more recent times, Stuart 2004, 2012, but is apparently an irrefutable witness to the antiquity of the ritual. Writings are sometimes found in mystery rituals but are by no means mandatory, perhaps not even usual, there is no indication that books were in use at Eleusis. Here, they are a palpable link between old and new. The jar in which they were found could be viewed in the sanctuary in Pausania's time, making it clear that the story of the mystery's recovery was an important part of the way they were perceived. In this regard, it is perhaps significant that Pausania's treats the text as coterminous with the ritual, Speaking of the talit as the object concealed in the jar as indeed may also be implied by its personification as an old woman in Epitel's dream. 
The emphasis on a physical object as guarantor of continuity recalls the role of the ritual elements in the establishment of a new city, Dessauer's 2006, 196 8. But, in this re foundation, the new city is separated from the old by time rather than in space. Two documents give further evidence of change and development in the Andanian mysteries. An inscription found in the Argive Sanctuary of Pythian Apollo, SYLL.3735, is the record of an oracular response given to Mnesistratos the Hierophant, consulting about the sacrifice and the mysteries. The reply is incomplete, but certainly draws a distinction between the two terms, sacrificing with good omens to the great Carnian gods in accordance with ancestral custom. And I also tell the Miz, Seni, A, N, S to celebrate the mist, Rhys, dot. As usual, the oracle is, in part, conservative, recommending the importance of ancestral rituals, but the second clause, on the mysteries, probably contained more specific instructions, relating, for instance, to date, place, or periodicity. It is clear that the original question cannot have been is it better for the Messenians to celebrate the sacrifice in accordance with ancestral custom, since such a question would always be answered in the affirmative. So the clarification requested must relate to some proposed modification, or at the very least, uncertainty, for a different interpretation, see Pirendel Forge 2010. The date of the inscription is unclear, though no earlier than the 2nd century BCE. Equal uncertainty surrounds the long and detailed document from Messenia itself, IGV, 11390, on dating, Gorlinsky 2011, 3-11, setting out regulations for the proper conduct of the mysteries, and also mentioning Amnesistratos. The most economical hypothesis is that the two Messistratoi are the same, and that the regulations of the Messenian inscription were produced in consequence of the oracular response. However, even if this is not so, this second inscription still represents a blend of old and new. The secret parts of the ritual cannot be alluded to in a public text, but we can assume that they remain unchanged. The bulk of the regulations is concerned with the smooth running of the ritual and the maintenance of proper order among the participants. It seems likely that the sacred men, who appear repeatedly in the inscription, take over a good deal of such competence from Nesistratos the Hierophant, and benefactor, and perhaps the priests and priestesses of the deities of the mysteries. Mnasistratos has given certain books, probably the, supposed, copies of the original metal leaf ritual text, into the keeping of these hieroi, but this need not imply any diminution of his hierophantic role, the essentials of which are likely, at this date, to have been transmitted orally and visually rather than through a written text. This long set of regulations seems to be primarily innovative in the administrative aspects of the cult, and, secondarily perhaps, in details of procession and sacrifice, the sort of thing which the rhetorica at Alexandrum tackles in its treatment of changing sacrifices. By contrast, the importance given to the books, placed emphatically as the first matter to concern the hieroi after their swearing-in, is suggestive of the link with the past and the unchanging nature of the heart of the ritual. Conclusion Despite scholarly disagreement over the exact purpose of these two inscriptions, one thing is clear, the articulation and development of the Andanian cult and, in this, it is likely to be typical of most cult complexes shows not merely a melange of old and new, but a pattern in which old and new have a tendency to acquire and represent certain significances, both in isolation and in relation to each other. Old may or may not be old in a historical sense, but its antiquity is emphasized, not only guaranteeing the venerability of the ritual's heart, but articulating key moments in the community's self-perceived past. This is an increasingly common function of cult in the Hellenistic and Roman periods, with many of the observances listed by Pausanias, for instance, capable of bearing that writer's faintly political interpretation in looking back to their city's glory days, compared to Swain 1996, 330-56. New is very often implicitly represented as renewing the ancient, re-establishing the direct contact with the divine which was held to be the cult's origin, possibly forming part of a series of such re-established contacts, and providing a platform from which individuals could benefit, and be seen to benefit, the community, and partially recapitulate the role of the hero founder. 
The example we have looked at is far from exhausting the possibilities, but will give some sense of the dynamic interaction between perceptions of old and new in Greek religious practice and understanding. Chapter 4 Many verses 1 Vincienne Pirendel Forge and Gabriella Pironti Introduction T. Tam polytheism has come down to us from the Hellenistic Jewish philosopher Philo of Alexandria, who used the Greek adjective polytheos and its cognates to describe a widespread vision of the divine that was different from that of his own religion. Ph. December 65. Polytheos, Mutat. 205. Polythia. The majority of Mediterranean cultures considered that many divinities existed in the world and needed to be honored by humans. In the context of its emergence, the Greek word was pejorative, in the same way that paganism and idolatry would soon be used in Latin Christianity. Polytheism began to be used during the 16th century, to draw a contrast between truthful monotheism and the era of pagan religions, Schmidt 1987. Its context, for two centuries at least, would remain largely determined by Christian theology. Since the 19th century, Greek rituals and their social embedding have been extensively studied. In contrast, gods were left on the fringes of new scholarly trends as past curiosities to be treated individually in dictionaries, god of war, goddess of love, of wisdom, etc., just like a collection of statues in a museum. Today, the use of the term polytheism as an explanatory category is a clear indicator that gods are returning to the forefront of the study of ancient Greek religion, recently, Bremer and Erskine 2010, Parker 2011, 64 to 102, Versnel 2011. Scholars are focusing on the ways in which Greek people performed rituals, not only to affirm social hierarchies in their local communities, the horizontal embedded perspective, but also explicitly to honor their gods, the vertical perspective. How does polytheism work? Understanding plurality is hard work and describing how polytheism functions has been a matter of scholarly debate for 50 years at least. The shift of paradigm concerning these questions is closely connected with studies devoted to the Greek pantheon by Jean-Pierre Vernant and Marcel de Thiene, Vernant 1974, and de Thiene and Vernant 1974, revisited by de Thiene 1997, and often called the French structuralist approach. Scholars working on Greek polytheism today must still take this work into account. We can synthesize it as follows, also taking into consideration some more recent qualifications. Vernant, 1965, 1974, was reacting against two trends in scholarship, first, a long-lasting essentialization of the Greek gods, in which individual gods were characterized as gods of a particular domain, as mentioned, and, second, an obsessive quest for the origin of the gods. He underlined the fact that Greek gods were divine powers and not persons, despite their literary and iconographical representations as anthropomorphic figures, already, for Gurnett, as early as 1931, a god was a system of notions, 1931, 222. Vernant emphasized the necessity of taking into consideration the connections between deities within a pantheon, divine powers were to be defined in contrast to other powers and limited by them. We can no longer fully subscribe to this model. One of its main limits is the fact that seeing the gods in opposition to each other runs the risk of underestimating the overlap in their fields of competence. Moreover, a rigid application of the model can still lead to identifying each god with a distinctive and exclusive mode of intervention, Jumzil 1974. 186 to 256. Indeed, it gives back to the gods in essentializing unity that was the original point of contention, Detienne 1997, 61 to 2, compared to Parker 2005, 390. Nevertheless, the core of Vernon's approach remains valid, when qualified by a more complex analysis of how polytheism works. In this perspective, a god can be seen as a complex network or cluster of powers. On the one hand, each god is defined by his or her own powers, competences, attributes, and so on its own network, on the other hand, it is characterized by relationships and associations with other gods belonging to the same pantheon a system whose components cannot be studied in isolation, for instance, in a city, with various sanctuaries and cults, or in a literary work, 
with its interacting divine protagonists. Unity and plurality are closely related at each level of analysis, each god is conceived as many powers in a network whose core is the god's name, many gods form structures that we call pantheons, each pantheon is seen as an organizational whole within its context, the whole cosmos in a theogony, the Trojan War in epics, a scenario on the tragic stage at Athens, natural, social, and political life in a city, etc. Studies on polytheism challenge the canonical vision of Greek gods as distinct personalities with a clear psychological profile, established once and for all in the mythological tradition. In past decades, scholars still needed to insist that Greek deities were approached in ritual practice and conceived at different levels, the local, polis level, and the panhellenic one, in sanctuaries as in narratives, Savinian Wood 1978. This assertion is obvious today and the risk of essentialization has been reduced enough to partially rehabilitate the word personality or the expression cult persona to refer to the gods. In a religious context, evoking a personality is the way to get a handle on the gods, to pray to them, but what is finally expected by worshippers is well and truly a manifestation of divine power. In the middle of this tension, the name of the god is essential, providing an evocation of the particular god in question which pervades myth and cult, personality and powers. The tension between these components, single personalities and interrelated powers within a pantheon remains at the core of many discussions on how polytheism works and implies that there are different methodological options by which to address this question. The regional scope for studying a consistent pantheon, on the one hand, and the deity-centered option, on the other, are the mainstreams of the study of Greek polytheism today. Both of them can be questioned and have their limitations. In a God-by-God -God analysis, one encounters the risk of being excessively focused on the chosen deity, drawing a static and unequivocal picture, and forgetting the relationships created by specific configurations, see BMCR the 14th of January 2011. However, the regional option creates its own distortions. It conveniently marks out connections within a local system, but does not necessarily explain why we find, in so many places, a deity named Athena, or Zeus, or Demeter, Apollo, and so on, often with specific cult epithets. Accordingly, one runs the risk of resorting to a superficial and canonical description of these deities, by describing them at a panhellenic level, without adequate acknowledgement of their local persona. In other words, a study focused only on a region encounters two different risks, either on the one hand, atomizing a single deity in its local manifestations, or, on the other hand, reducing deities to their generic description, god of, goddess of, which is rather paradoxical in studies trying to understand polytheism at a local level. Another way of addressing the question of how polytheism works would be to study a particular domain of life, marriage, protection of children, war, politics, agriculture, seafaring, etc and observe how different divinities are involved in this context. An ideal position would be to integrate all of these approaches, but such an enterprise remains difficult to conduct, except in a large collaborative team. It has been stated that polytheism is indescribable, Parker 2005, 387. However, we cannot remain silent. We must try to understand how the Greeks managed to conceptualize unity and diversity together, Controversial 2011. Gods cannot be conceived in static terms because cults and myths reconfigure and redefine them as personalities and, at the same time, as powers interrelated to each other. Under the same name, a deity is at once the cult persona worshipped in a particular place and the figure that is, for example, described in the Iliad as feasting on Mount Olympos or staged by Europites in the Theatre of Dionysos at Athens. The divine name has a central value because the god is not completely absorbed in and reduced to what is particular and temporary in its function or narrative construction, Perendel Forge 1994, 10-12. A god is still more than the heterogeneous mosaic resulting from an arbitrary combination of epithets, images, and narratives, Contra Burkett 1985, 119, 218. To use once again the metaphor of the network, a sum would be static, while a network is dynamic, fluid, flexible. 
A god can be conceptualized like such a network, different activities or contexts, such as the telling of myths or practice of particular cults, let some segments and portions of the network appear. Pironti 2007. 285. The whole set of connections is not necessarily entirely activated in each context, whatever that may be, but remains potentially available. For instance, in a local cult, the god's name with a cult epithet is one aspect of the deity seen in close-up, not the expression of a completely different deity. In this respect, myths and rituals are not unrelated bodies of evidence, but specific languages, which resonate inside the mental frame of poets who narrated tales, of painters who decorated attic vases, and of worshippers who performed rituals. To give some flesh to these abstractions, let us take into account two different types of divinity. The first to be tackled are what scholarship misleadingly identifies as minor deities or personifications, that is, the Moirai, Pirendel Forge and Pironti 2010. The second example refers to a deity belonging to the highest level of the Greek pantheon, Herol, the wife of Zeus himself. The methodological approach of polytheism must be the same for both categories because both refer to divinities felt by worshippers to be powerful agents acting in their lives at one time or another. Case Study 1. The Moirai The name of the Moirai refers to the portion or share that every human or divine being receives. In this case, the powers of the goddesses are closely related to the notion conveyed by their name, just like their mother the Miss, the divinely inspired order of things, and many other divine personifications worshipped by the Greeks. They are commonly understood to be goddesses of fate and actually appear in mythic tales that mainly associate them with birth and death. As traditional spinners and weavers, these goddesses rule over everyone's life cycle and over the various patterns of the life thread. This is the traditional, panhellenic image conveyed by tales from Homer to Pausanias and beyond. The label goddesses of fate is not completely wrong, but is unsatisfactory, as are all such reductive kinds of labels concerning the gods. Moreover, it is built upon the unwarranted assumption of a universal notion of fate, common to the Greek world and our own, as Idinal 2011 notes. We can identify the Moirai as powers whose specific network encompasses distribution, reward, and regulation. On a mythical level, they interact with the stability warranted by Zeus' authority, Hes. Feig. 901-6, compared to Pironti 2009. On the level of cult practices, the evidence related to them is neither numerous nor explicit about worshippers' expectations. This evidence includes three kinds of texts, we do not take into account funerary inscriptions, which use a very loose notion of fate first, individual or familial dedications concerning pregnancy and birth, IG2 squared 4547, FD3 1.560, compare to Pind. Oh. 6.41-4, and Lib. 29, second, family foundations of the Hellenistic period constructing a kind of micropantheon in which the Moirai are honoured, IG 12, for 348, LSAM 72, third, civic rituals attested by literary texts and inscriptions, IG I cubed 7.12, POWs, 2.11.4. Without addressing the detail of this evidence, we can delineate the position assumed by these goddesses in the fields of birth and family matters. Their interventions in human lives and communities are various but they are closely related to both lifespan and life cycle, in narratives as well as in cult practice. Other deities are concerned with the same fields of intervention, but the set of notions related to the Moirai, including distribution, reward, regulation, is specific. They are the benevolent protectors of the life cycle, as well as the strict guardians of its limits. The Moirai regulate the share attributed to everyone, determining the beginning and the end of life, as well as the important steps that regulate life, with an eye on the correct balance between good and evil. On a larger scale, a family group honours the Moirai in order to perpetuate the family. In this case, the expected intervention not only concerns individual lives and their limits, but the consolidation of the lineage itself. Finally, on the global level of polis religion, epigraphic and literary evidence indicates that a whole civic community could pay homage to the Moirai. 
What exactly were the expectations of a city? In the Eumenides of Aeschylus, where the Moirai and the Semnithei are closely connected, we are told that the life of young people is protected by both groups of goddesses since they are able to prevent civil war. Ash. Hume. 956-67, compare to Pows. 2.11.4, on a cult relating the two at Sikyon. Accordingly, the balance between good and evil at the very heart of the polis concerns a correct distribution of births and deaths within the community. The strict regulation made by the Moirai is one of the conditions of the survival of the entire community of the polis, as well as of the families composing it. The three spinners and weavers depicted in Panhellenic myths are not a fiction without any relation to cults. Moreover, their close relationship to Zeus and the identity of their mother, the Miss, are the best indications that they are not, as has been hypothesized, primeval goddesses of death and arbitrary dispensators of good and evil. Instead, they are regulators, even though human beings are often unable to grasp the cosmic dimension of this regulation and distribution, and complain about the arbitrariness of fate and the limits inherent in human life. Case Study 2, Hero Hero is our second case study, Pirandel Forge and Pironti 2009, and forthcoming, and our focus will be her relationship with Zeus, which is fundamental in various tales concerning the goddess. Across the whole Greek tradition, she is the wife of the father and king of the gods. In Homer, she is depicted, at least at first sight, as a shrew, always getting angry at Zeus, Hon. Illinois, 1.517-21. 8.4078. The same image appears in those tales where she persecutes the illegitimate children of her fickle husband, Hon. Illinois, 15.24-30, Hez. Thieg. 313-35, AP Rod. 1.996-7. Taken at face value, mythical narratives give the goddess an image that is incompatible with her cult persona, for example, in Argos or in Samos. However, if we carefully read the many tales or many vases depicting Hero, and scrutinize the etiologies of some of her cults, important insights emerge, giving us some clues that can be used to test the validity of a Hero network. In this case, marriage, legitimacy, power, and sovereignty are essential aspects for determining at least a part of a definitional structure of the goddess which is largely rooted in the relationship between Hera and her husband and brother, the king of the gods. Regarding the cult persona of Hera in Argos, the etiological evidence is scanty. Nevertheless, we can reconstruct a mythic cycle in which the main focus is the relationship of the goddess with Zeus, she is a Parthenos, unmarried girl, maiden, then, gets married, leaves her husband, becomes a Parthenos again, and the cycle starts again, pows. 2.38.23, compared to 8.22.23. The concrete implementation of the cycle into local cult practice is not completely clear, but Zeus is undeniably present in the Argive plain, as attested by local iconography. In the 5th century BCE, a new temple and statue were established there for the goddess. One of the pediments depicted the birth of Zeus and the Gigantomachy, the other showed the Trojan War, Pows. 2.17.3, a huge chryselephantine statue was commissioned from one polyclatos, and showed Hero seated on a throne, wearing a crown decorated with the graces and seasons. In one hand, according to Pausanias, 2.17. 4, the goddess carried a pomegranate, and, in the other, a scepter with a cuckoo. Pausanias explained the presence of the bird on the scepter in terms of the passion felt by Zeus for Hero in her maidenhood to seduce her, he changed himself into a cuckoo and she caught it to be her pet. The bird, then, may be seen as a reference to one part of the cycle just described. The bird's appearance on the scepter is not mere chance. The latter is an iconographical symbol for sovereignty, the bird perched on it manifests the matrimonial dimension of Heros' sovereign power. The birth of Zeus on the pediment of her temple is another indication of this dimension, and it is also alluded to elsewhere, for example, on the huge classical temple to Hera Teliae in Boeotian Plataea. 
one of the temple's statues, carved by Praxiteles and placed at the entrance of the edifice, represents the goddess Rhea carrying to Kronos the stone wrapped in swaddling clothes, as though it were the baby Zeus to which she had given birth. The other one, made by the same sculptor, is Hera Taliae, the spouse herself. A further image of Hera from the same site, whose sculptor remains unknown, was called the Bride, Pows. 9.2.7 the ritual cycle in which Hera becomes again and again the wife of Zeus is very clear in this case. Every year in Plataea, the Daidala festival staged the reconciliation, after a separation, of the deities in a matrimonial context. Pows. 9.3.1, 9.3.9. In Argos, as well as in Plataea, the Theogonic references present in the goddess's sanctuary are indications of the strong connections, on the one hand, between Hera and Zeus as children of Kronos, and, on the other hand, between the matrimonial relationship and divine sovereignty. A last element can be provided to support the view that Hera at Argos is closely related to Zeus on both the mythical and ritual levels. Two months of the calendar of Argos refer to marriage. The first is named Garmos, marriage, and echoes the Athenian month game lion, of the marriages, sacred to Hera. The second, Telos, achievement, which is another way to express marriage, is known in Argos and Epidauros, but nowhere else. Scholars who have studied this calendar agree that Telos must refer to the cult epithet Telios Telea, supporting the hypothesis that the local goddess is ritually conceived of as the wife of Zeus, Reg 112, 2009, 215. At Samos, Hera was honoured from the early archaic period at least in an extra-urban sanctuary as impressive as that at Argos, Curialace 1993. The main difference between the two places is the extent of cult attendance, regional at Argos, Aegean, or even largely East Mediterranean, at Samos, see further, in this volume, Constantinople, Chapter 19. Some scholars consider that the Hera of Samos is a completely different deity from the Hera of Argos, on the grounds that identity is defined by place and that the local level constructs a cult persona without relation to the Panhellenic level, verse 0 2011, 115, 143. However, returning to the network imagery above, although the ties and nodes forming a deity network may expand or contract, there is still a core, signified in particular by the name of the divinity. We can illustrate this by a comparison between the mythical and ritual cycle for Hera at Argos and the evidence concerning the cult persona of Hera at Samos. Hera is said to be born at Samos and her Parthenia, virginal time, is closely connected with the local river Imbrasos, also called Parthenos. A fragment of Varro preserved by Lactantius, Division Inesti 1.17, 8, mentions a range of interesting elements, the island itself was called Parthenia because Hera grew up there and married Zeus, her temple was very ancient and the goddess was represented as a bride, some of the rituals in her honour were celebrated as a wedding anniversary. Hera, viewed as a Parthenos and then a bride, refers to the first two steps of the cycle mentioned at the beginning of this section. In Varro's fragment, the theme of Hera's separation from Zeus is missing, that is the third part of the cycle, which in turn leads to a new cycle as we perceived in the ritual turnover at Argos and elsewhere. Nevertheless, we can find some trace of the ritual separation between Hera and her husband in the etiology and performance of the main festival of Samos, called alternatively Tanaya or Haraya, in which the temple statue was carried to the shore and purified, of Ajanu 1991, 46-73. The etiology of this festival, given by the Hellenistic author Menodotos of Samos, FGRH 5 for 1 F1, quoted by Athenius 15.672 for B, describes the kidnapping of the temple statue by pirates, an attempt that was foiled, apparently by the goddess herself. When the Carians found the image abandoned by the pirates, they wrapped it in a breastplate of willow. It was then liberated by the temple priestess, purified, and set in place once more. If these events were commemorated in the Tanaya festival, then this may provide the missing separation stage. Moreover, the mention in both accounts of willow, a plant associated with virginity, may be significant, according to Varro, Hera was born near the tree, where her Parthenia is locally rooted, in the story by Menodotos, 
The use of willow to wrap the image seems to return her to her previous status of Parthenos. In the Argive Plain too, Hera was supposed to recover her Parthenia every year in the water of a local spring, Pows. 2.38.23 we can argue, then, that when the Samian priestess releases the statue from the willow, purifies it, perhaps during a bridal bath, and restores it on its base, it returns as the bride described by Varro. The matrimonial context, and then the deep relationship of the local sovereign goddess with Zeus, are confirmed by some verses of the Hellenistic poet Nicanetos of Samos, quoted by Athenius 15.673b mentioning a Samian festival with beds installed under the willow by Hero. The epigram closes on the verses, We will joyfully sing the glorious young bride of Zeus, the queen of our island. In Argos and in Samos, Hero is not independent from Zeus, and the Hero of Argos is not as different from the Samian goddess as is sometimes supposed. One of the main ties of the Hero network binds the goddess to her husband, even where he seems to be absent. On a ritual as well as an imaginative level, marriage, legitimacy, power, and sovereignty are constitutive elements of Hera's figure. Accordingly, her spasmodic anger in myths not only constructs the figure of a shrew overburdening her husband with jealousy, above all, this is her way of caring about the legitimacy of his children and, in the end, of ensuring the safeguard of his royal and cosmic power. As a daughter of Kronos as well as wife of Zeus, she is deeply concerned by sovereignty. This concern, which constitutes a fundamental element of the Hera network, might partly explain the fact that, as early as the Archaic period, the goddess played such a prominent role at Argos and Samos, as well as in some extra-urban sanctuaries of the Western Greek world. Conclusion Polytheism encompasses relationships between divine powers, as Vernant wrote many years ago. The whole system can be seen as a complex structure, each element of which, a deity with its proper name, is both itself a complex set of prerogatives, and at the same time, must be considered in concert with the other elements. The two case studies presented here have focused on the first aspect, what we have called the deity network. However, the Moirai are closely connected with other deities such as, for example, Zeus, Aletheia, or Aphrodite, and these mythical and ritual interactions emphasize, each time, one or another aspects of the Moirai network. And, as we saw concerning Hera, her own network of powers cannot be easily reconstructed without any reference to Zeus, even in cult places where he seems, at first sight, to be absent. As these case studies demonstrate, if we are to understand and describe ancient Greek polytheism, and its multifarious potentialities, the unity and plurality of the gods must be conceptualized together at every level. Part 2 Types of Evidence Chapter 5. Visual Evidence. Millet Gaithman. A brief glance at the scholarship of Greek religion shows that ancient images are often cited as evidence in studies of cult practices, sacred spaces, mythology, and perceptions of the divine. When we skim through some of the most prominent and influential publications, e.g. Nilsson 1967, Burke at 1985, it appears that visual representations from Greek and Greco-Roman antiquity in a variety of media, whether painted on vases, carved in two-dimensional reliefs, sculpted in three-dimensional statuary, or minted on coins have something to tell us about the religious life of the ancient Greeks. See also, in this volume, She, Chapter 12. Indeed, images emerge as indispensable in certain areas of examination. For example, our understanding of animal sacrifice and mythology would have been far more limited without the rich plethora of visual sources, e.g. Gantz 1993, Van Straten 1995. It may not be difficult to acknowledge the usefulness of ancient images in this field of inquiry, yet like any other primary source, their use as evidence demands some close scrutiny. What can ancient images reveal about Greek religion? I will consider some methodological problems raised by this question by focusing on three examples of different kinds of visual evidence, a painted vase, a carved marble relief, and a coin. These three objects, which differ in their material, size, and mode of production, as well as their date, original context, patronage, function, and use, offer different perspectives on the question at hand. 
Let me start with the depiction of Heracles at a burning altar on an Attic black figure oil flask, or Lekythos, from c.500 BCE, that is on display today in the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, figure 5.1. The figure of the hero dressed in a lion skin, armed with quiver and bow, and identified by an inscription can inform studies on many facets of Greek religion, ranging from ritual practices, via myths, to ancient conceptions of the cosmos. Among these aspects, the depiction of meat on two spits and the curling object atop the burning altar invites consideration of the vase in a study of animal sacrifice specifically, as, for example, in Van Straten 1995, 136, the Bauer 2002, 364. The portrayal of a built ceremonial altar with volutes that recalls archaic and classical Greek altars uncovered in archaeological excavations, Yavis 1949. 95 to 105, suggests that the image is somehow linked to ancient realia. One may therefore presume that other elements in the scene are also related to the actualities of the past and can give us a glimpse into the inaccessible experiences of Greek animal sacrifice. In this case, the depicted spits and the object atop the flaming altar may be suggestive of ancient practices. They offer ideas about the grilling of meat and the placement of animal parts on the burning fire and can help a modern reconstruction of the sacrificial process. Furthermore, the examination of the vase together with other sources suggests that the depicted long spits and the curling object on the sacrificial platform could be identified as visual references to Splanchna, namely the burning of the entrails, and the victim's tail that was offered to the god, Van Straten 1995, 128-41. Image Figure 5.1 Heracles at a burning altar. Black figure Attic Lekythos, attributed to the Sappho painter, c.500 BCE. New York, Metropolitan Museum of Art, for 1.162.29. Rogers Fund, 1941. www.metmuseum.org. For scholars seeking to conjure up the realities of Greek animal sacrifice, see, in this volume, Naden, Chapter 31, the image on the New York Lekythos and similar depictions may prove invaluable, particularly because textual sources provide only a partial idea about the practical aspects of the ritual. However, one must proceed with caution, for images offer limited information. The Lekythos in New York suggests that spits were used in the course of Greek animal sacrifice, yet it does not yield any information about the details of the procedure such as who placed the meat on the spits, which body parts were grilled in this way, and who performed the minutiae of the ritual. Furthermore, unlike other similar scenes, on the Lekythos there is no portrayal of wood placed atop the burning altar. There is no attempt to indicate who put on the fire and how. We may tell that a sacrifice is taking place, but the image's objective is not to instruct the modern viewer about the actual steps of the sacrifice. In fact, the Lekythos does not purport to be a reflection of reality, Heracles is not a historic figure, he is a mythological hero. He is alone at the altar, whereas animal sacrifice required the participation of more than one person. Close consideration of the vase shows that the painted Lekythos contains only a selection of elements related to realia. The burning tail on the altar offers a case in point for the complex relationship between depiction and what we may tell about ancient reality from other sources. While textual sources and archaeological remains indicate that, in actuality, the god's portion could include a variety of body parts from the sacrificial victims, such as the tail and the thigh bones, the New York Lekythos and similar sacrificial scenes feature only a curling tail atop the burning altar. In this corpus, the tail emerges as the chosen visual reference to the god's portion in the sacrifice. The reasons for this particular choice may vary. They may be the result of some pictorial tradition among a group of pot painters. They may be guided by the tail's distinctive form, which renders it easily recognizable as the god's portion, probably more than other anatomical parts of the victim. They may also be related to the possible meaning the burning tail might have had in antiquity, according to Ascolias to Aristophanes piece 1053, the tail's reaction to the fire was taken as a sign for the sacrifice's success. If this is the case, then the choice of the tail may be a way of asserting that the offering is propitious, Van Straten 1995, 
122, 190 to 1. The example of the curling tailor top and altar demonstrates that the choice to depict a particular feature which bears some resemblance to an element from reality is not guided by a simple wish to reproduce that element. Rather, the incorporation of certain elements in an image results from a complex combination of demands and constraints of pictorial representation and its production that is often difficult to unpack. There are additional limitations to deploying images for the reconstruction of religious practice, certain aspects of ancient ritual practice cannot be detected in the visual record. For instance, the actual killing of the animal in the course of the sacrifice is hardly ever shown in ancient images, and the consumption of meat is completely absent, see most recent discussion in Naden 2013, 23. The case of animal sacrifice is not unique. Other practices of Greek religion that are known from textual sources are not shown in Greek imagery. For example, the making of libations in the course of the Greek symposium is well attested in ancient sources, yet no depiction of the actual pouring of liquids in a sympotic context is known, Lissarab 1995. Such discrepancies in our evidence show once again that images do not offer full reflections of reality, and caution us against uncritical deployment of imagery for the purpose of historical reconstruction. One must keep in mind that, like textual sources, Images are governed by the particularities of their genre, authorship, mode of production, and audiences. The presence of Heracles on the New York Lekythos invites us to consider the painted pot with regard to the study of Greek myth, specifically the complex mythology of the great hero. The vase's distinctive imagery implies a reference to a specific myth. The single scene that encompasses the entire Lekythos includes not only Heracles and a crouching dog beneath him, but also three other figures identified by inscriptions. On the side of the Lekythos that is opposite Heracles' sacrifice, Alios, the sun, is shown as a bearded man with a radiating sun disc above his head, whose lower body is cut off by the ground line, figure 5.2. He rises above four frontal horses, while holding a goad and the reins of a chariot. On his right is Eos, Dawn, depicted as a woman with an orb above her head. She directs with her go at the horses that move upwards to the right, while the female figure of NYX, Knight, who also has an orb above her head, commands her horses upwards, to the left. Only the heads of Dawn and Knight and the upper bodies of their horses are visible, they emerge above the descending brown trails whose nature is unclear and could be dark clouds or perhaps streams, Mertens 2010, 100. Image Figure 5.2 Alios and his horses rising, with Dawn on the right and Night on the left. Black figure Attic Lekythos, attributed to the Sappho painter, c.500 BCE. New York, Metropolitan Museum of Art, for 1.162.29. Rogers Fund, 1941. www.metmuseum.org. The labeled protagonists in mid action. The allusion to a specific location suggested by Heracles' position atop a rocky terrain, and the reference to a time of day indicated by the rising chariot of the sun suggest that the vase refers to a specific mythological event. Presumably, the identification of the depicted myth could expand our knowledge of the stories about Heracles in Athens of c.500 BCE. However, the attempt to identify the vase's subject through an examination of the vase in conjunction with other images and texts related to Heracles yields varying results. The vase could be interpreted as a portrayal of a moment in the course of Heracles' confrontation with the sun while on his way to steal the herd of Gerion, CVA USA 8, 93-4, or a moment in the course of Heracles' travels to the underworld in order to bring back the three-headed dog, Kiberos, Pinny and Ridgeway 1981. The crux of the problem lies in the uniqueness of the image. No other ancient source, whether visual or literary, includes Heracles' sacrifice alongside this particular combination of figures. The consequences of the challenge are witnessed in the entry for Heracles in the standard reference work for the iconography of classical mythology, the Lexicon Iconographicum Mythologi Classici, LIMC. The Lekythos is listed under three rubrics, namely non narrative scenes the tenth labor of Heracles, and the eleventh labor, LIMC SV Heracles, Numbers 1341, 2547, 2623.
The oil flask demonstrates some of the complexities entailed in identifying mythological scenes. The vase suggests a reference to a specific event, yet, due to the image's uniqueness, it is unclear which myth it refers to. Consequently, the entry in the LIMC maintains the possibility that the scene could also be regarded as non-narrative. Obviously, not all mythological scenes are like the one of the New York Lekithos, and many are easily identifiable. Yet often images diverge from other visual or literary representations of the same theme. In the case of our Lekithos, even if we assume that the vase refers to Heracles's journey to the underworld, it is still unique in its depiction of the hero's sacrifice atop a rocky terrain in the presence of a dog, who may be Kerberos, and in conjunction with the rising of the sun, dawn, and night. The New York Lekithos shows that a mythological episode may be known from imagery, independently of a literary tradition. For the vase may refer to a story that has not survived in any other source or it may articulate its own variant of a myth concerning Heracles. The methodological difficulties of identifying the myth in an image arise from a fundamental discrepancy between past and present. In classical antiquity, myths were transmitted in a variety of ways orally, visually, and textually, and images played a prominent role in articulating and propagating them in society. See also the chapters in part 3 of this volume. Since, by their very nature, Myths are mutable and assume a range of guises in different contexts. Graph 1993, 1-4, there could be visual versions of myths that are unique and or do not have literary parallels. For these reasons, in some cases, a mythological scene is known only from images and its relation to some literary tradition is unclear. This is the case of the well-known image of Arjux and Achilles playing dice shown on the Amphora by Xekias, Vatican Museums, Cat. Number 16757, for which there is no clear literary source, Boardman 1978, 19-20. In other instances, a depiction of a single episode, or a group of myths, is attested in the visual record well before its appearance in texts. For example, the Twelve Labours of Heracles are first witnessed as a group on the metopes of the Temple of Zeus at Olympia in C.460 BCE centuries before the earliest surviving literary compilation of the hero's feats, Gantz 1993, 381-2. In contrast to the varied ways in which myths were circulated in the ancient Greek world, the modern study of Greek mythology tends to privilege texts because of the narrative nature of myths. Consequently, a pervasive approach to images is to link them with stories known from literary sources. Yet the examination of images in the study of Greek myths need not be limited to the identification and classification of a represented scene, or to their deployment as evidence for the existence of a myth in a particular time and place. For visual representations, by their very nature, operate differently from texts, see, most recently, Osborne 2011, and while images do not tell stories the way texts do, they have much to teach us about other aspects of Greek mythology in antiquity. Perhaps more than any other source, ancient images speak to the spread and embeddedness of Greek mythology in ancient societies, as myths were evoked visually in different ways, whether on simple household items or grand sanctuaries. Looking at our Lekithos, we may not be able to tell with full certainty which episode in Heracles' travels the vase alludes to, yet it reveals a particular idea about Heracles' persona in Athens of C.500 BCE. The great hero, known for his bad temper and lack of self-control, is shown in the midst of a pious act. The vase presents a vision of Heracles as a solitary calm man, engaging in one of the major rituals of Greek religion. The vase's images of moving luminaries solicit an examination of the New York Lekithos in the context of a study of Greek cosmology. The Chariots of the Sun and Dawn, figure 5.2, recall the Homeric poem's descriptions of sun and dawn rising from Okinos at daybreak, Hon. Illinois, 7.421-3, and the movement of dawn and night in opposite directions brings to mind Hesiod's account of the underworld and the place where night and day cross and greet each other, see Hez. Thieg. 746-54, with Pinney and Ridgway 1981, 142. Furthermore, the New York Lekithos features one of the earliest surviving renditions of the progression of the celestial bodies, LaCroix 1974, 
101 to 6, and the sun, night, and dawn in human form, see LIMC SV Astra No. 3, SV EOS No. 1. These depictions speak to an interest in the advancement of time among makers and consumers of humble clay objects in Athenian society at the turn from the 6th to the 5th century BCE. Thus far, I have considered the vase as ancillary to different areas of research of Greek religion. The image on this pot, however, was not conceived as a document for modern historians, museum displays, and book illustrations. Like any other ancient image, it demands to be examined in its own right, as integral to the oil flask on which it is rendered and in relation to its original context. Such holistic examination offers new insights to the historian who is interested in religious ideas that were articulated in images. Taking this approach, we may note that the positioning of the paintings on the pot's cylindrical surface presents Heracles' sacrifice as contemporaneous with the advancing luminaries. The hero's quiet ritual, performed apart from society, parallels the movements of the sun, dawn, and night. This juxtaposition that links the two events may be interpreted as two powerful visual comments, a new day dawns when Heracles makes his unique offering at the altar, or, when the day rises, Heracles makes a unique offering. The vase's fine spot in an attic tomb indicates that, like most oil flasks of its kind, it was made and used as a grave good, e.g. Huber Nielsen 1995, Oakley 2004, 9-11. While the pot's final site of deposition could suggest that the vase portrays a moment during Heracles' journey to the underworld, the archaeological context does more than support a possible identification of the depicted event, it highlights a specific aspect of the hero's personality. Like the Lekithos that serve to connect the living and the beloved who passed away, Heracles is a figure that bridges the gaps between those who are alive and the dead. The hero, who was eventually deified, also embodies a link between mortals and immortals. The trait of connecting the perceptible world and spheres beyond human sight is also witnessed in other elements of the vase's imagery. Heracles' sacrifice, using spits upon an altar, resembles actuality and, at the same time, is unattainable to mortals because of its isolation, mode of execution, and grand scale. In their motion and appearance, dawn, sun, a night shuttle between the seen and comprehensible parts of the cosmos and those that are invisible and incomprehensible, they have anthropomorphic features and are recognizable thanks to their labels, while their bodies are incomplete and they rise from enigmatic trails of unknown nature. The funerary gift and its imagery open a window onto some of the ways in which the connections between the realm of living mortals and the spheres beyond humans' reach were articulated in Athens of c.500 BCE, in ritual practices, mythological thought, and conceptions of the cosmos. In antiquity, the attic oil flask was hidden from the public eye. In contrast, the marble relief from New Phaleron in Piraeus was in plain view, figure 5.3. The carefully carved image was placed atop an inscribed stele, indicating that it is a dedication, for an early account, see Sveronos 1908, 493-506. This find, alongside an inscribed list of gods that was found in its vicinity, received ample scholarly attention from historians of Greek religion, e.g. Larson 2001, 131-4, epigraphists, e.g. Garducci 1974, and classical archaeologists and historians of art, e.g. Guntner 1994, 78-80. Much of the discussion revolved around the texts associated with the relief. Let us, however, Begin by putting some art historical tools to the test and explore the evidentiary value of an ancient image by considering the relief independently of other ancient documents. Image Figure 5.3 Relief of Xenocratea Marble, 50-65 cm, c.410 BCE Athens National Archaeological Museum, 2756 Copyright Symbol Vanni Archive Art Rescourse, NY First, this case highlights the usefulness of stylistic analysis for the historian, near 2010, 6-11. Here, elements of style, such as facial features, postures, and drapery resemble works of the latter half of the 5th century BCE, such as the Parthenon frieze, and the Nike balustrade. Together with the relief's fine spot, and the pentelic marble from which it was made, 
they suggest that it was produced in Attica in the very end of the 5th century BCE, e.g. Ridgeway 1981, 131-3. Iconographic examination is another tool for examination. In this example, it allows for the identification of two deities. The unique seat on the far left gives clues about the youthful figure occupying it. Composed of a bowl supported by tall legs, it has a decorative griffin attached to its edge serving as armrest, while two coiled snakes form the handles and back. The so-called tripod throne, e.g. Linfoot 1967, 151N, 3, indicates that the seated youth is Apollo. The reference to Delphi made by the Omphalos and eagle beneath the deity's right foot gives greater specificity to Apollo's identity, it presents him as Pythian Apollo. A second deity is recognizable on the far right. The ball with a man's head conforms to the iconography of the river god Achilles, LIMC SV Achilles, 24 number 197, 30. Iconography is helpful, yet it is also limited. On this relief, for instance, apart from Apollo and Achilles, the figures are insufficiently distinguished to allow their identification with full certainty on the basis of their appearance and attributes alone. However, visual analysis can do more than help ascribe names to figures, it can shed light on numerous aspects of an image. For instance, the female figure standing behind Achilles exemplifies how, in classical Greek art, stylistic and iconographic features differentiate between living beings and visual representations. The figure is wearing a tall form of headgear known as a polos and a sleeveless tunic, while her hair, coming down to her shoulders, recalls hairstyles of the archaic period. The archaising features, dress, and hieratic demeanor resemble those of statues of goddesses depicted in C.400 BCE, e.g. De Césaire 1997, figure 67, 68, and indicate that on the far right is a female statue, possibly of a goddess. Visual cues, such as height, dress, gesture, and attitude also help distinguish between groups. For example, in the foreground a female figure raises her hands in veneration towards a much taller male figure, who bends downwards in her direction, while placing his right foot on a rectangular block. The boy in the front stretches his arm and grasps the larger figure's cloak. In this case, the female figure's gesture, the different behaviors, and relative sizes indicate that these are a woman and child approaching a god. This observation also implies that all the other standing figures are also likely to be divinities, since they are all of similar height to Apollo and the god in the foreground. Most of the deities are difficult to name, yet certain connections among them are notable. For example, Apollo's proximity to the goddess next to him suggests that she is somehow affiliated with him, whereas the veils worn by three of the goddesses on the right point to an affinity among them. The observations made thus far help us gain a better grasp of the moment portrayed in the relief, although they do not tell us under what circumstances it was made, or who commissioned it. Consequently, for the historian interested only in facts, an approach grounded in visual analysis alone may be of limited use. The scholar of religious thought, however, could find this line of inquiry of great value. For example, the relief from New Phaleron offers invaluable evidence about women and children in Attic religion of C.400 BCE. Unattended by a mature man or any other companion, the female venerator and the boy come into close proximity to the god, and their awe is met with the deity's attentiveness, she looks the god in the face, as the boy touches his clothes. While it is impossible to ascertain the historic truthfulness of the depicted event, the relief speaks to a subjective perception of precious intimacy between these worshippers and a god. The presence of numerous divinities underscores the uniqueness of the moment, although so many gods and goddesses are nearby, and Apollo's toes gently touch the woman's clothes, the two mortals interact with only one deity. While most of the divinities do not acknowledge the unfolding event, they either turn to each other, or are consumed in their own thoughts Achilles from afar and Apollo from behind see the event. The god of Greece's longest river and the Pythian divinity witness the epiphany experienced by the woman and the boy. The relief provides irrefutable proof that at least the commissioner of this marble object envisioned such a remarkable religious experience. Other ideas current in classical Attica can be discerned. 
Apollo's unique seat speaks to a particular perception of the tripod and the god. The coiling snakes bring to mind Apollo's triumph over the monstrous python, Ogden 2013, 40 to 8, and, example, LIMC SV Apollo number 998, and the snake column of the golden tripod dedicated in Delphi after the victory over the Persians in 479 BCE, HDT, 9.81, Thuck. 1.132 while the griffin recalls attachments on cauldrons of the 7th century BCE. Along with the omphalos supporting the god's feet, these decorative elements transform the tripod originally a cooking implement into an age-old grand throne of the oracular deity of Delphi that elevates its occupier to a supreme position, Pap Alexandru 2005, especially 9, 185, 189 to 90. The presence of Achilles on the other edge of the relief reinforces Apollo's primacy. The two divinities framing the relief share the association with a geographic location, yet the bovine deity appears as though he were a worshipper approaching the Pythian divinity. The relief offers a specific vision of the god of Delphi, he is the enthroned sovereign, who, while resting his feet upon the navel of the earth, oversees the unfolding event and the entire scene. Thus far, I have not taken into account the inscriptions associated with the relief. I have pursued this approach in order to demonstrate how close analysis of an image can bring to light ancient ideas pertinent to the history of religion, ideas that were articulated visually. The relief demands further examination along this line of inquiry of other components such as the female statue behind Achilles and the goddesses on the right. Let us, however, now turn to the texts. The dedication that was inscribed on its supporting steely named Xenocratea, mother and daughter from the Demi of Cholodai, as dedicator of the gift to Kephisos and his altar-sharing gods for the sake of an or in gratitude for teaching, IGI 3987 IG 224548. The text sheds additional light on the image, the woman and child of the relief can be linked with Xenocratea and her son, and the inscription's primary dedicatee, Kephisos, is likely the god that greets them. Seen in its entirety, the votive monument emerges as an illuminating document for the historian interested in the religious experience of individuals. Both image and text reveal an investment in personal devotion. They speak to, on the one hand, an intimate encounter between two individuals and a god in the presence of other divinities, and, on the other hand, Xenocratea's dedicatory act and her thankfulness and hope for the growth of education. The second inscription associated with the relief was found in the same area and includes a list of gods in the dative case, IG 224547. The presence of Pythian Apollo and Achilles in this text suggests that, although it was carved on a separate stone, it is somehow related to the relief. Both Xenocratea's gift and this inscription may have been part of the same sacred precinct. In addition to another votive relief that was also uncovered in New Phaleron, Athens, National Archaeological Museum, number 1783, Xenocratea's gift sheds light on the history of private devotion and sanctuaries founded by individuals in this part of Attica in the late classical period, Vikela 1997, 222-4. This case exemplifies how, alongside other materials, carved reliefs and images in general are invaluable for the historian who seeks to reconstruct a particular landscape of religious sites. The relief of New Phaleron demonstrates that, like any image accompanied by a text, inscribed votive reliefs demand a holistic approach that takes all of their components into account, Gaithman 2008. However, one should beware of privileging one element over another. For historians of religion who are primarily trained in reading texts, the natural tendency is to prefer the textual to the visual. Consequently, the image may become ancillary and its examination guided by available writings and focused on the identification and classification of depicted figures while other visual components are completely ignored. This line of inquiry has resulted in a decades-long debate around the identification of the figures on Xenocratea's votive, with no resolution in sight, for different identifications, see Beshi 2002, 34, as well as discussions that do not mention the presence of Apollo and Achilles. E.G. Van Straten 1981, 90. Alternatively, one could consider image and available texts side by side. 
In the case of Xenocrates votive, for example, the comparison of the image and the texts highlights notable differences. On the relief, Pythian Apollo and Achilles stand out among all other figures, they frame the relief, and are the only gods who are clearly recognizable, even without additional attributes that may have been originally painted on the surface. In contrast, these two gods are not mentioned in the dedication, while on the list that was found nearby they are neither first nor last Apollo is third and Achilles is seventh among the ten gods and groups of divinities mentioned. Furthermore, while the identity of the dedicator, or the occasion for which the relief was made, cannot be learned from the image alone, the dedicatory inscription does not record any vision of the god, nor does the list articulate Apollo's superior position. These discrepancies suggest that image and text operated together, that one was not ancillary to the other, but rather that they complemented each other. The approach proposed here highlights aspects of the relief from New Phaleron in addition to other traits that have already been recognized, Xenocrates' gift has furnished an example for an image related to divination, the CISV Divination GR, 23 No. 148, a representation of Greek veneration, the CISV Veneration GR, 184 No. 10, and a depiction of a site of worship, the CISV Representations of Cult Places GR, 400 No. 113. Additionally, the votive has been recognized as a useful relic from a cult site in New Phaleron and a striking piece of evidence for the religious life and patron divinities of women and children, e.g. Dylan 2002, 24-5, Parker 2005, 429-30, Lawton 2007, 46-50. However, when considering image and text as complementary elements of Xenocrates' gift, its profound devotional statement comes to light, the relief asserts that this woman's dedicatory act was conceived as inseparable from an epiphany that was envisioned as occurring under the watching eye of the Pythian Apollo somewhere between the Delphic Omphalos and the river Achilles. We have no way of telling whether indeed Xenocrates experienced such an epiphany and whether her son truly touched the garments of the god. Yet, unknowingly, she bequeathed to the modern historian a gift that reveals the way she sought to visualize her relationship with the divine. The two examples I have considered thus far are among the group of ancient images produced for and on behalf of individuals and families. Such depictions may have resonances with communal ideologies yet they were neither made on behalf of a city-state, an ethnic group, an or governing authority, nor do they purport to be representative of such entities. Obviously, private individuals were not the only ones to patronize religious imagery. We may apply a similar approach that considers the religious ideas and the role of images within religious experience in relation to commissions on behalf of sovereigns and or public groups in the public sphere. Coins, for instance, were minted by city-states, kings, and emperors, and often feature religious imagery. What can numismatic evidence tell the historian of religion? From the outset, one must recognize that the commonality of religious subjects on ancient coins need not undermine their fundamental significance. Minted depictions of divinities, heroes, sacred sites, ritual implements, and objects associated with the holy speak to the pertinence of religion, beyond its own practice and theory. In antiquity, time and time again money was linked with the divine, myth, and worship. The sacred was embedded in everyday economic exchanges and articulated social and political identities and relationships. Take, for example, a coin that was minted in Samos under the Roman Emperor Domitian, Head and Paul 1892, 372. Like similar coins in its series, the obverse shows a laureate head of the emperor accompanied by an identifying label, and the reverse features a temple namely a structure with a pediment and four columns that is raised on three steps, figure 5.4. In the centre of the building stands a columnar female figure with hands extended to the sides, tall headgear, and fillets hanging from her arms. The figure's archaising features and place within the temple suggest that it is a statue that is worshipped. The shrine is accompanied by the legend of the Samians. Without any additional information, the coin tells us of the adoption of a particular sanctuary as the marker of local identity to be shown on the coin's reverse as the counterpart of the standard imperial portrait that was minted on the obverse of coins throughout the empire. 
The recurrence of the minted image of the Samian shrine from the reign of Domitian to the reign of Gallienus further highlights its significance. For centuries, the elite of Samos selected a sanctuary with a distinctive statue as the polis emblem alongside the regular Roman image of the obverse. See further, Weiss 2005. Image Figure 5.4 coin from Samos with image of temple and cult statue from the reign of Domitian 81 to 96 CE. British Museum. Copyright symbol The Trustees of the British Museum. In light of Samos centuries long cult of Herol, see in general, Walter 1965, the sanctuary on the coinage has long been identified as the renowned Samian Herayan, Head and Paul 1892. 372. This well founded identification invites further consideration of the coin's evidentiary value. For example, does the shrine on the Samian issue reflect the appearance of the religious architecture on the Ionian island in the 1st century CE? Are we to imagine Heros' temple set on three steps and with a statue in the centre between four columns? Since, in antiquity, statues that were worshipped in religious practice were not placed at the entrance to the temple, the simple answer to these questions is negative. It is indeed reasonable to hypothesise that the minted image echoes some elements of reality, Yet the task of identifying them by considering other sources is far from simple. For instance, Vitruvius describes the Samian Herayan as Doric, Vitru. Doric. 7 Preface 12 Whereas the shrine on the coins is always Ionic, leaving us to wonder whether the Roman architect described the same holy structure as the one shown on the numismatic material. On the Domitianic issue, the lintel is flat whereas in the vast majority of later emissions it is arched, Head and Paul 1892, 372-94, as, for example, on a coin from the reign of Etrusilla, figure 5.5. We may only wonder about the significance of this variance. Do the coins reflect the appearance of a particular structure? Is the building shown on the Domitianic issues different from the one portrayed on later coins? The suggestion in response to these quandaries that the entire series from Samos features a Roman building's interior, a freestanding small shrine, or perhaps an edicular, Price and Trell 1977, 135, may be compelling yet cannot be confirmed. Image Figure 5.5 coin from Samos with image of temple and cult statue from the reign of Etrusilla 249-251 CE. British Museum. Copyright symbol The Trustees of the British Museum. The Samian coinage offers a case in point for the profound difficulties of using numismatic imagery for the reconstruction of the actualities of religion and cult sites. We can imagine that some elements from reality may have been preserved in minted imagery, yet coins prove to be particularly challenging as documents for the sake of accurate reconstruction. Furthermore, one must keep in mind that depictions of monuments and objects on coins do not necessarily relate to actual structures that existed in reality. There are indeed instances where there is no certainty that there ever was a temple at a site that minted a coin with such an image, e.g. Barol 2004, 310-12. Numismatic evidence can shed only partial light on ancient actualities, yet the manner in which certain religious subjects are shown can be instructive. For example, throughout the Samian series, the statue in the temple has a distinctive silhouette, tall headgear, and hanging fillets. We cannot tell with certainty what the real ancient statue of Herod actually looked like, or whether the figure on the coin resembles its presumed original, see e.g. O'Brien 1993, 21-38. We can assert, however, that, in contrast to ancient realities in which the image of the goddess in the temple was not easily viewable, on the numismatic picture it is rendered as visible and easily recognisable. From an inaccessible sacred object that perhaps could have only been seen on special occasions, the statue of Herol was turned into an easily accessible emblem seen on coins in everyday transactions. The Samian coinage demonstrates the power of what may be termed visual rhetoric in Greek antiquity. Herol's ancient statue remains etched in our imagination in the form presented on the minted images of Samos. The choice to depict this particular figure of Herod from among other available portrayals of the goddess is telling. By selecting a non-naturalistic and recognisably archaic figure, 
the Samians evoked their own ancient past. In fact, for centuries of Roman dominance, the distinctive statue was minted on coins, not only within a temple, but also on its own, and side by side with divinities and figures, Head and Paul 1892, 371-95. The elite of Samos placed at the heart of its imagery a visibly ancient image of worship and thereby celebrated the great antiquity and continuity of the famous cult of Herol. The recurring emblem of the ancient statue could also serve to articulate power relations. On most of the coins in which Herod's statue is placed within a temple, it is set within a visibly Roman structure. Apart from Domitianic issues that show a flat roof, most other emissions feature the temple with an arched lintel and columns with spiral fluting, two architectural elements that arise under Rome. The ancient image framed by a visibly Roman building makes a poignant statement, Religious Samian traditions from deep antiquity continue to thrive under the roof of Roman rule. The religious image served to articulate relations not only with the great imperial force, but also with other city-states. The Samian statue is similar to statues depicted on coinage of other Anatolian city-states, such as Artemis of Ephesus, C.E.G. Head and Paul 1892, 112. While the argument that this resemblance shows that the different Anatolian images shared a common root is difficult to prove, O'Brien 1993, 21-38, the visual impact of this resemblance is apparent. Similar cultic images on issues of different locations imply some connections between these different polos, through their choices of religious imagery different city-states affirmed their ties. Overall, close consideration of minted images reveals religion's central role in articulating an intricate nexus of identities. The coins of Samos were struck centuries after the Athenian Lekythos was deposited in a tomb, and Xenocrataea's relief set up in New Phaleron. While each of these objects was made under different circumstances, their close examination reveals their visual force. All three belong to cultures in which images asserted and propagated perceptions and ideologies. One may choose to treat images such as these as ancillary to other evidentiary material, and as illustrative of other elements of life in the ancient world. However, such approaches disregard the central role visual representations played in antiquity. The challenge facing the historian of religion is to approach ancient imagery within the context of the sophisticated visual culture to which it belongs. By adopting the art historian's eye, treating each case in its own right, and taking into account the original context and accompanying texts when available, we may overcome some of the difficulties on the way, whether missing archaeological data, or unidentifiable figures. In this way, we may begin to grasp the power of ancient images and explore the complex ideas they articulated regarding all aspects of Greek religion, the divine, ritual practices, myths, cosmology, and places of worship. Suggested reading See Savinuin with 1991, 3-23 for approaches to material evidence. See Giuliani 2013 for myths in images in Greek art. See Platt 2011. 31 to 50 on how votive reliefs articulated and shaped religious ideas and experiences. Lacroix 1949 is a learned and immensely rich source on Greek numismatic material for the study of Greek religion. See also Haujo 2005 for a discussion of coin imagery, specifically in the Roman provinces, particularly 2 to 7 on religion and myth. Chapter 6 Literary Evidence, Prose Hannah Willey. Introduction. Tiki 1st century BCE Stoic philosopher Posidonios distinguished three routes by which reverence of the gods had been transmitted to his age, by the philosophers, by the poets, and through the city's laws. His rough contemporary, the Roman scholar Varro, famously constructed a similar trichotomy in his distinction between Theologia Naturalis, Theologia Fabularis, and Theologia Civilis. Few scholars today would explicitly endorse the Veronian division, Michalson 2010, 16f, who distinguishes between the gods of philosophers, the gods of poets, and the gods of cult is a notable exception. See Feeney 1998 and Savinuinwood 1997 for criticism of this approach. 
We may, nonetheless, usefully begin with these classifications, because the deep-seated attitude which underpins them has influenced the development of the modern study of ancient Greek religion in ways which are interesting and pertinent for a discussion of prose sources in particular. Furthermore, it is precisely through critical reactions to this sort of attitude and related perspectives that some of the seminal recent shifts and developments in scholarly engagements with prose sources were made possible. To begin, we might ask where, if at all, non-philosophical prose texts fit into this neat division of sources for the religious attitudes and practices of the Greeks. Alongside philosophical works, a wide and heterogeneous array of prose texts from the ancient world survive. To offer a non-exhaustive and overlapping list, historians, geographers, mythographers, travel writers, medical theorists, essayists, orators, auto, biographers, and satirists all provide us with further prose sources for the study of Greek religion. If these sources are to be accommodated within the tripartite framework at all, is it that they are to be straightforwardly equated with a supposedly isolated theologia civilis? If so, can they be construed as unproblematic quarries of information about popular religion and cult, to be mined by historians? And, finally, can we simply isolate philosophical prose sources from others in the way that this approach encourages? Prose Sources as Religious Texts Tom Harrison, 2007, recently made a plea for religious historians to include a wider range of texts in their purview. Texts which are not, unlike e.g. Hesiod's Theogony, overtly religious in either their subject matter or, unlike e.g. Athenian tragedy, their performance contexts too often receive attention only rarely and for a limited set of purposes. Harrison 2007. 375. Prose texts have often proven particularly vulnerable to such narrow treatment. In one extreme but revealing case, Patricia Easterling contrasts Greek poetry, glossed as our literary sources for Greek religion, with its inadequate alternatives epigraphy is mentioned, without making reference to prose sources at all, Easterling 1985, 34. Too frequently, prose sources are not considered as texts which play an active role in the religious life and religious experience of the Greeks, unlike, for example, plays or hymns performed in festival contexts. Such preconceptions arise in part because of a deep-seated dismissive attitude to the creative ambitions and capabilities of the prosaic. In the 2nd century CE, the orator Elias Aristides felt the need to offer a lengthy apologia for his Pezos Logos, pedestrian language, in a prose hymn composed for Sarapis, see Goldhill 2002, 5. It would be folly to deny the prominence of verse in expressions of significant, involved, and influential Greek reflections on and engagements with their gods, a prominence with which Aristides self-consciously plays here, but nor is it the case that such reflections and engagements were the sole privilege of verse, and philosophical prose, texts. Herodotos, 2.53, famously recognised the influence of the poets on Greek conceptions of their gods when he attributed to Homer and Hesiod the making of the theogony of the gods, the allocation of their names, honours, and skill sets and the illumination of their appearances. But it would be a mistake to react to Herodoto's statement by seeing him as divorcing categorically the creative projects of the poets, who themselves shape a religious world, from the, more detached, exposition of the historian, who may comment upon this world but not actively shape it. For all the various and profound differences between Herodoto's and the poets he mentions, and between their respective projects, we will see that we encounter in Herodoto's, or, for example, Pausanias or Lycurgos, an involved, distinctive, and creative religious thinker in his own right. Again, even if prose texts lack the concrete performative religious contexts of tragedies, see, in this volume, Callum, chapter 13, or cultic hymns, see, in this volume, versnal, chapter 30, it would be a mistake to infer that they could not, therefore, engage with, frame, or influence religious experiences. Scholars rightly call for a sensitivity to the unique contextual circumstances of different sorts of verse text, from victory odes to Homeric hymns and civic tragedies, and the inevitable bearing of these circumstances on the reception of these texts by their ancient audiences. But we should perhaps avoid too diametrical a contrast between poetic texts, which are not just a text but a text, a song, 
a dance, a performance, a ritual and a prose text as just a text, a simple text. Fowler 2013. 12. Referring to historiography. Even without a concrete performative religious context, prose texts can key into or subtly play with religious contextual frames, such as, for example, dedication or divine inspiration, to engage actively with the religious experience of their audiences. They may even present themselves as religious artifacts. Heraclitos, for example, is said to have dedicated his work in a temple of Artemis. More obliquely, Plato can appropriate the traditionally poetic notion of inspiration and have his Athenian stranger construct the imagined community of Magnesia by following wherever the god leads. Leg. 968b10f with Nightingale 1993, 282f. We will explore under repositories of information, and, again, through our test cases, how recent trends in scholarship have elucidated some especially striking ways in which the texts of authors like Herodotus, Aristides, and Pausanias actively engage with and frame contemporary religious experiences. Repositories of Information Though a text's prosaic nature might discourage us from engaging with it as a creative and distinctive reflection on the gods or an active and involved engagement with religious life in the ways outlined above, this very same quality has often encouraged scholars to mine prose sources for the insights they offer into lived Greek religion. The apparently straightforward nature of prose has a particular way of tempting the reader to acquiesce in the authority of the author's account of reality and lived experience. Goldhill 2002, 43. Michelson reflects on how Herodotus approach to religion strikes him as less artificial, more direct. 2003, 7 while the apparent transparency of Pausania's report was, for generations, taken more or less at face value, famously earning his work the title Baedeker of the Ancient World, see Elsner 1994, 226 FF, Alcock 1996. Against this sort of tendency, recent decades have seen important calls for the historian of Greek religion to maintain and pursue a hypersensitivity to the context, genre, and agenda of all ancient sources, See e. G. Savinuinwood 1991, 1997. It is notable, however, that it remains a persistent concern for scholars to caution against our deep-seated tendency to slip into the habit of reducing these works to a series of isolated mentions of certain ritual practices or a mere list of propositions about the gods or their intervention in human life. Harrison 2007, 375F. As we shall see, it is often precisely through self-conscious reactions against a treatment of prose sources as mere repositories of information that the more sophisticated and rewarding inquiries into these sources in recent scholarship in the field are developed. In addition to engendering the illusion of straightforward cultic information, prose sources have also, in the past, been privileged as more or less transparent repositories of genuine, unconstructed attitudes and beliefs. The performance of law court speeches before a jury of Athenian citizens, for example, was held to ensure their accuracy as a source for Athenian life, a quarry from which to win insights into what the Athenians really thought, see Martin 2009, 1. Finally, the law of first-person narratives of religious experiences and emotions is a rare and therefore seductive commodity amongst our sources. When combined with the more direct tone of prose texts it is even more liable to generate, for the reader, a sense of transparency. Aristide's sacred tales were, for example, once celebrated as providing a unique and unqualified opportunity to penetrate to the subconscious level of their author, Bear 1968, 13. The practice of mining texts in this way is, unsurprisingly, full of pitfalls and results in distorting reconstructions. A naive reading of Pausania's Periegesis would, for example, elicit the false conclusion that the imperial cult impacted little on the religious landscape of Greece in the 2nd century CE. Again, an uncritical acceptance of the testimony of Herodotus and Strabo yields evidence for sacred prostitution in Aphrodite temples at Babylon and Corinth respectively, yet very few scholars now accept that sacred prostitution existed in either locale, e.g. Bude in 2008. These are especially clear examples, but they illustrate more general methodological issues. We must be sensitive to the historical reliability of our sources as witnesses to cultic practices. The geographic, 
chronological, or cultural distance which separates authors from the religious practices they describe bears on this question of reliability. Importantly, of course, an unreliable source is not an uninteresting one. The question is rather what we can learn from it. If Herodotus' account of sacred prostitution in Babylon, or Lucian's detailed description of the temple of the Syrian goddess at Hierapolis, complete with 1800-foot fallacies which are ascended biannually by a man who remains perched on the tip for seven days, are found wanting in the historicity, or even plausibility, of certain of their claims, they remain interesting for the historian of Greek religion. The way these authors shaped and constructed these narratives teaches us much, not only about their social, political, cultural, and intellectual environments and agendas, but about their own distinctive religious attitudes as well. Of course, writers are not reporters, Rutherford 2013, 339. Their accounts may have been influenced and shaped by the genre of the work, the literary context, the writer's own world, or his imagination. On the most rudimentary level, authors operated with their own implicit or explicit principles of what was and was not worthy of inclusion in their work. Information about the gods, ritual practice, and religious attitudes are included or passed over depending on the particular criteria in operation. Thucydides' Greece is populated with fewer sanctuaries and festivals than Herodotus' world, divine intervention is not generally inferred from events, and, while speakers may occasionally engage in religious argumentation, such argumentation and religious institutions play a minimal role in the unfolding of events. Rather than postulating a shift in the role of religion in Greek life from the period of the Persian to the Peloponnesian Wars, we need to consider the distinctive and reflective way in which each author perceived their work and, in general, consider personal preferences as well as generic constraints and pragmatic contexts. What, finally, of a personal perspective, do prose sources, ostensibly free from the poetic distancing which renders us wary of reading as unadulterated facts the first-person register of Hesiod or Theognis, provide any sort of insight into individuals' religious experiences and emotions. Here, too, there are limitations and difficulties. We cannot straightforwardly equate the narrators with the author's voice. Literary texts do not provide a direct pathway to beliefs, experiences, and emotions. Lucian's diverse oeuvre provides a striking illustration of the complex, playful ways in which the narrator's voice can be constructed in prose. Scholars once questioned the authenticity of his De Dea Syria. The real, satirical Lucian, it was felt, could not possibly have described the Syrian goddess in such an apparently reverent and serious tone. As Jess Elsner, 2001, highlights, the author claims to be an Assyrian with first-hand experience and yet he adopts the Ionian Greek of Herodotos, the archetypal outsider looking in, and a Greek cultural framework through which to view this most holy of Syrian sites. The narrator is thus, within this text, a deliberately difficult persona to place, how he relates to Lucian is a question raised but precisely left unresolved. Lucian, no doubt, constitutes a very particular, self-conscious example, yet he serves to remind us of a general methodological caveat, applicable also to prose texts before the advent of the second sophistic. Of course, literary posturing need not exclude genuine sentiment, Hutton 2005, 307 that Lucian can poke fun at the Syrian goddess and her worshippers does not imply that he cannot sincerely count himself among them. This is not to deny that some prose sources offer distinctive and interesting insights into the ways in which an individual Greek might articulate and represent his own relation to the gods and the nature of his religious experiences. Robert Parker has charted the close relationship that Xenophon, in his Anabasis, presents himself as having with Zeus Basilius, Parker 2004, 151. Again, returning to Elias Aristide's Sacred Tales, we find a striking example of an individual represented as having a distinctively strong connection to a particular deity. In recounting his maladies and the close and beneficial relationship with Asclepios they occasioned, Aristides gives us insight into how one might, in this period, express and represent one's religious experiences, we encounter bouts of euphoria, fear, and disorientation. These accounts and representations are, of course, highly constructed, See Petzalus Diomedus 2010. 
Aristides, the consummate Papidumenos, appeals to literary, artistic, and cultic paradigms in communicating his personal experiences of the god. So, when Athena appears to him in a dream, she explains her inclination to help him by noting his similarity to Homer's Odysseus and Telemachus. Not only is she Homer's Athena she is also Phaedia's, she appears with her aegis and the beauty and magnitude and the whole form of the Athena of Phaedia's in Athens, 2.41k, trans. There, compared to 2.65k. Might Aristide's constructed accounts serve as plausible accounts of genuine experiences? And, more interestingly, might individual, lived religious experiences themselves be framed by these sorts of literary, artistic, and cultic paradigms? A hard and fast distinction between literature and real life is, as ever, difficult to maintain. Critical Prose Sources I turn finally to the particular interpretative difficulties which so-called critical texts pose for the scholar of Greek religion. A distinctive difficulty attaches to their descriptions of the beliefs and practices of others, often unspecified groups or characterized simply as the many. When Plato has his Athenian stranger describe the many people who share a belief, taught to them, we are told, by leaders of Teletai, that crimes in this life will be punished in Hades and that those who inflict harm on others will suffer the same themselves upon reincarnation, leg. 870 d. e. We would do well to ask how accurate a description of a genuinely held belief this is, and how widely it was held. Indeed, there is a danger that in presenting, or indeed constructing, religious attitudes, which are subsequently criticized, such critical thinkers burden these unspecified groups of people with explicit theological commitments which they would never have themselves specified or articulated in such a way. So, when Heraclitus refers to those who pray to images as if they are conversing with houses, not recognizing who gods and heroes are, b5, are we to infer a widespread and or explicit view that there was simply no distinction between god and statue? In approaching sources which express critical attitudes towards the gods, the stories told about them, or the rituals performed for them, scholars have, in the past, been too ready to generalize. There is a tendency to take criticism of a particular religious practice or attitude as an indication of a hostile attitude to traditional religion as a whole, e.g. Gregory 2013 on Heraclitos. Consequently, other engagements with traditional religious thought or practice found in the same author are read in such a hostile light, see Harrison 2007, 382, 2000, 13 f. For criticism of this approach. The Hippocratic Treatise on the Sacred Disease provides one well-known example of a text which develops critical attitudes towards certain aspects of contemporary religious practices but does so in a very complex and nuanced way. The author attacks the magicians, purifiers, beggar priests and charlatans, who pretend that, through their piety and mysterious knowledge and through an inscrutable ability to coerce and subject the divine to human will, they can cure their clients of the sacred disease. At first sight, we might be tempted to see here a secular healer mounting a general campaign against religious conceptions of health and disease. A closer look at the text, however, discloses a more complex situation. The author's invectives are not directed at such religious conceptions per se but, more specifically, at these magical practices and practitioners. Indeed, the author levels a charge of impiety against these individuals. Furthermore, far from writing divinity entirely out of the picture, the author informs us that all diseases are divine and all human. Thus, while he may well diverge from traditional patterns of religious thought in certain ways, such as in the belief that the gods do not send illnesses, the Hippocratic author himself engages in creative religious reflection of his own, and appeals to familiar values of piety and impiety in order to denigrate his opponents. A lingering question remains as to whether or not the author's theological position leaves room for any role for the supernatural, whether through temple healing, prayer, or supplication, say, as opposed to the magician's spells, to make a positive contribution to healing a view which is found elsewhere in the Hippocratic Corpus, Reg. 487 with Van der Eeg 2005, 72f, and Gregory 2013, 69ff. For on the sacred disease, see also Lloyd 1979, Chapter 1.
the practice of generalizing from a particular critique or objection to a universal hostility to traditional religious practice and belief bespeaks two problematic underlying assumptions. First, is the notion that such critical thinkers conceived of Greek religion as a coherent unity, which could be straightforwardly challenged or rejected as such. This is a far from obvious assumption, see Parker 1996, 210, 1997, 148. Plato's distaste for tales of warring gods or for the view that divine favour may be bought, for example, sit comfortably alongside his repeated and creative appropriations of the notions of initiation and inspiration. The second, still more questionable, assumption, is that rationality and religiosity must pull in opposite directions, such great rational thinkers, it was maintained, could not possibly have entertained such primitive religious notions. Hugh Bowden, for example, has traced a trend in scholarship on Xenophon to see his religiosity as a disappointment treat, ed, at best as a forgivable personal eccentricity, and at worst as a sign of his mediocrity, Bowden 2004, 229. Test Cases I turn now to three brief test cases from different genres and periods to illustrate some of these challenges and opportunities which prose sources present to the religious historian the ways in which profitable and illuminating engagements with prose sources can be achieved through a critical sensitivity to the pitfalls which we analysed in the previous sections. This will enable us to illustrate some of the recurrent methodological questions which arise in the use of prose sources. Oratory Oratory offers one case in which scholars have demonstrated the importance of maintaining a heightened sensitivity to the relation between the pragmatic and generic context in which an author operates, and that author's distinctive ways of talking and thinking about the gods. Parker seeks to explain why certain ideas about and responses to the gods, which were eminently thinkable for an Athenian living in the classical period and explored in other contexts, e.g. Greek tragedy, were kept out of the rhetorical corpus. Parker 1997. Strikingly absent, for example, is the plaintive and accusatory, or pathetic, 156, tone adopted by several tragic heroes in the face of their gods, in its place we find a staunch civic optimism, 159, in which the possibility that the gods might turn on Athens or had done so in the past is never explicitly raised and often resolutely denied. Democrat 1.10 constitutes, as Parker notes, a striking illustration. Does this discrepancy bespeak a distinction between the gods of the city and the gods of the poets, Theologia Civilis and Theologia Fabularis? Thucydides' description of Athens in the grip of disaster should caution against such a neat, Veronian response, plague is ravaging the population, supplication, divination and all such things have proven futile and are, eventually, abandoned altogether, 2.47 ff. The gods are perceived not to be answering the prayers of their worshippers, relations between the city and its gods have broken down completely. Thucydides further alludes to an oracle, remembered at this time, in which Apollo promised the Spartans, Athens' opponents, his support in the war, 2.5.4. Thucydides here casts Athens in her own tragic action, in which despair of divine benevolence and aid is presented as a recognisable and plausible response to disaster in near-contemporary society. Even within rhetorical speeches, the presumed benevolence of the gods does not extend to individuals, particularly one's political or legal opponents, Parker 1997, 152. Indeed, few of Demosthenes' adversaries escape the accolade enemy of the gods and threats of divine vengeance are commonplace. Even if in oratory, then, you are never free to avow that the gods have abandoned the city in order to scare your fellow citizens into voting in your favour, this does not imply a conception of gods who provide only good things. Nor can we simply put this down to a categorical imperative to flatter the audience since orators are perfectly able to castigate the demos for its past failings. Rather, it tells us something about attitudes to divine engagement in the city's life. Despair, as Parker says, is an inappropriate response for one who aspires to leadership of the polis, 155ff. To adopt the victors, or at least not the victims, stance is vital, since positive relations with the gods are a precondition for civic and individual success. 
The distinctive approach of oratory to the question of divine engagement in civic life thus does not highlight a doctrinal theological divide. Rather, it illustrates the significance of generic and contextual constraints on the views expressed and questions explored about the gods at a given point in a given text. Within the rhetorical corpus, generic and contextual constraints may be further broken down. In the context of the public funerary speeches, as distinct from forensic or political oratory, for instance, where blame for defeat or disaster cannot be placed upon the citizens being honoured, divine opposition is sometimes invoked, albeit usually in rather veiled terms, Parker 1997, 155. So, for example, Lysias, 2.58, speculates over who was to blame for disaster in the Hellespont, whether the ineptitude of the commander or the intention of the gods. Demosthenes, in his Eulogy for the Dead, mentions the disposition of the daimon, necessity, and chance as factors which could decide the fate of dutiful men who stood firm, 60.19. More accusatory is Isocrates' claim in his Panathenaicus that when just men fare worse than unjust this may be explained by the negligence, Amalean, of the gods, 1.186. Though the anger of Zeus, or Apollo's preference for the other side, are still not explanatory options here, we begin to see that a range of attitudes could, nonetheless, be expressed, even within the limits set by the generic and socio-political conventions which govern such public speech. In a recent monograph on the religious argumentation of Demosthenes, Gunther Martin explores this sort of variety within the rhetorical corpus, Martin 2009. He analyzes how different authors adopt different approaches, generating distinct and coherent public personas through the nature of their engagement with religious arguments and ideas. He points, for example, to Eskine's and Isocrates' preference for pollution as an argumentative ploy, and the particular emphasis in Lycurgos on the need for appropriate relations between individual, state, and gods, both to be contrasted with Demosthenes' frequently observable reluctance to engage with religious topics, 204FF. We see, then, the flexibility of Athenian attitudes to the gods and their role in civic affairs and the need to avoid generalizations from isolated statements found in our prose sources, what a given author hoped would be persuasive and appropriate in a given context should not be inferred to characterize Athenian attitudes as such. Furthermore, even where a particular kind of religious argumentation is adopted, there remains room for an individual author to approach the trope in a creative manner. For Parker, like Ergo's attitude to delayed divine punishment, if the perjured man does not suffer himself, at least his children and all his family are overtaken by dire misfortunes, 1.79, trans. But 1954, constitutes an easy moralism, which, he suspects, has its counterpart in conventional piety, 1997, 153F. Not only, however, is this not the only attitude to be expressed on the question of divine punishment, see, for instance, lies. FA 9.4 AP Athen. 551052 b with Harrison 2007, 379, it is also not as unreflective as we might at first assume. The ways in which Lycurgos emphatically implicates the jurors, both the citizens and dicasts, into the oaths which they have themselves sworn, infractions of which the gods are said to police, are striking. The theme of relations across generations recurs with regard to the diecasts in a pointed way. It would be most terrible, like Ergos warns the jurors, if they failed to live up to the virtue of their ancestors, who, in their allegiance to their oath, had the gods behind them and failed to convict one who had so broken his oath and disgraced the city. Here we see the creative way in which Lycurgos employs this often expressed view about divine penalties to challenge his audience to think about their own relationships with the gods, their ancestors, and descendants, what would constitute their maintaining their own oaths and so protecting themselves, their offspring, and the honour and memory of their forefathers. These speeches are, then, of great interest to the religious historian. They tell us about the ways in which different orators creatively engaged with, suggested, and deployed diverse conceptions of the gods and of their interactions with mortals. However, they must not be reduced to straightforward, unproblematic, and unencumbered reflections of Greek-Athenian attitude. Herodotos. 
Herodotus has Greeks, and non-Greeks, praying and sacrificing, swearing and cursing, consulting oracles and interpreting omens, as well as evaluating appropriate behavior towards the gods, inferring divine agency, and engaging in religious argumentation. Is this all Herodotus provides for the religious historian? And what sort of issues must be borne in mind when approaching his histories as source? I highlight here in particular the importance of viewing Herodotus as a creative religious thinker and the limitations of too simplistic an account of his religious attitude. First, however, we must return to the problem of mining. In repositories of information, above, we noted in passing the difficulty in taking at face value Herodotus' engagement with the religious behavior and beliefs of non-Greek peoples. Even remaining within Greece, we can easily illustrate the limitations of extracting details of religious practice and belief from Herodotus' text without due consideration for the context of his work as a whole. In instances in which another account of events survives, we can see clearly the way an account may be shaped by the particular agenda and interests of a given author. The Greeks' dedication at Delphi after their victory at Plataea, described by both Herodotus and Thucydides, provides one such example. Herodotus tells us that the Greek commanders, having collected the loot, set apart a tithe for the god of Delphi, from which was dedicated that gold tripod which rests upon the bronze three-headed serpent, very close to the altar, 9.81. 1. Thucydides provides further complicating details. The Spartan regent Pausanias, we are told, took it upon himself to have inscribed on this tripod the following elegiac verse. The leader of the Greeks, after destroying the army of the Medes, Pausanias, dedicated to Phoebus this memorial. The Lacedaemonians, however, immediately defaced that inscription from the tripod and inscribed the names of all the cities which together defeated the barbarians and set up the dedication, 1.132.2. Whereas Herodotus presents us with an image of Hellenic unity, the Greeks give thanks to the god Apollo at his Panhellenic shrine, Thucydides is concerned with the excesses of the Spartan general Pausanias, already we see the first cracks in the facade of Greek unity in the lead-up to the Peloponnesian War. Whatever the accuracy of Thucydides' information, the religious historian cannot dissociate these divergent accounts of the same religious act from the political dynamics of the different wars about which Herodotus and Thucydides write. These authors, then, are not merely interested in supplying us with isolated bits of information concerning religious practice. They reflect on and engage with religious practice as one aspect of a broader set of preoccupations. Herodotus' engagement with the oracle at Delphi provides another illustration of this principle. In recent years, much attention has been paid to the role played by oracles and oracular consultation in Herodotus' histories. Showcasing as they do, issues of knowledge and interpretation and divine, human interaction, oracles afford Herodotus with opportunities to reflect on the character of inquirers, both individuals and city-states, on human behaviour and relations with the divine more broadly, and on the authoritative status of his own work and the interpretative demands it places on his readers, see e.g. Barker 2006, Kint 2006. If Herodotus uses religious institutions and ideas to think through broader questions in this way, it is important to stress that he is not merely taking a ready-made set of tropes from traditional religion in a one-way transaction, rather, his own involved, reflective, and creative engagement with Delphi constitutes part of the messy conglomerate to which we refer as Greek religion, see Harrison 2007, 374. Furthermore, we should recognize the possibility that literary texts may inform and frame religious experience, that is to say, that the lessons learnt from reading Herodotus about oracular inquiry, divine anger, and the pendulum of fortune, for example, may plausibly bear on how one views one's own interactions with the gods, compared to Barker 2006, 3. Finally, a brief word on the complex matter of Herodotus' religious outlook. Herodotus, in particular, has been subject to fierce debates over the question of his personal religiosity. Whereas, at one extreme, scholars have viewed Herodotus as self-consciously moving away from accounts which make appeal to divine causation, 
Anna's generally skeptical of traditional Greek attitudes, at another extreme others have viewed his project as theological through and through and have found in the histories a sustainable system of religious beliefs, compare to Latina 1989, Goldhill 2002, 11 FF, Harrison 2003. Of course, there is considerable middle ground between these two extremes. Part of the reason for this range of positions is the variety of attitudes which can plausibly be found in Herodoto's text, C.E.G. Michelson 2003, 146. We find dismissals of particular claims about the gods, e.g. 5.86.3, and some notable absences, e.g. the omission of gods in Herodoto's account of the history of East-West hostilities, 1.1-5 with Goldhill 2002, 14. Yet, such features of the text do not warrant the conclusion that Herodotus could not possibly have taken seriously those aspects of Greek religion with which he was evidently preoccupied. There are, furthermore, a few cases in which he expressly favours an account which appeals to divine causation, e.g. 8.129, or alludes to divine chance, divine communication, or divine anger, e.g. 4.205, 5.92.3, 9.100, 6.27. We cannot dismiss all these passages as merely a means of appealing to the, less well-educated, masses or reporting unreflectively traditional views, see Gould 1994, 94, Harrison 2000, 1-30. In a different vein, Robert Fowler has shown how Herodotus approaches reflection on the gods in a way that is qualitatively different from the sort of approach that we encounter in Homer or Hesiod and how this difference relates to the very different nature of Herodotus' inquiry and project as he conceived it. We do not find in the pages of Herodotus the types of interactions between gods or between gods and men that we encounter in the verses of Homer and Hesiod. Instead, the inquisitive and epistemologically circumspect Hister adopts an approach to the gods which is fundamentally continuous with his approach to the human sphere. He infers the God's agency and overall direction of human affairs from events within the limitations and conditions of his uninspired and conjectural inquiries, Fowler 2010, 2011, 59 FF. We might relate this suggestion of a qualitatively different approach to reflection on the gods to a broader tendency in prose sources, from history to oratory to philosophical and medical works, to appeal, not to individual named gods but, arguably in a more epistemologically circumspect way, to generic divine powers unidentified by name, e.g. to the Ion, Hothios, Hoithioi. Of course, there is a great deal more that could be said about the complex question of Herodotus' religiosity. But the considerations sketched out here suffice to caution against over-schematizing Herodotus' approach to the divine and to offer some sense of the ways in which Herodotus confronts the religious historian with a distinctive, involved, and creative way of thinking with and about religion. Pausanias As Pausanias leads us with confidence and authority across the Greek world, it is all too easy to forget that this is, in many ways, a world of his own making. Louise Brut Seidman and Pauline Schmidt-Pantel, for example, make central use of Pausanias, the indefatigable curious traveller, in their reconstructions of the cult life of the Greek sites, 2018, without, however, addressing the question of the motivations and complications which underpin Pausanias' account. Yet Pausanias himself remarks explicitly that he is omitting what he deems trivial in favour of those things most worthy of being recalled, 3.11.1, compared to 1.39.3, 8.5 4.7, the subjectivity of his account is clearly marked. If Pausanias' experimental style can sometimes lure the reader into feeling they have seen a sight in all its detail, his emphasis on ritual and cult as lines of continuity between past and present, still in my day. Lure the reader into accepting the authenticity of his imperial text as a straightforwardly veridical testament to archaic and classical Greek religion, as if those archaic and classical cults, monuments, and stories had not gone through diverse and complex processes of reception and modification in the intervening centuries, see Pirendel Forge 2006 for an illustration. Pausanias has a tendency to overlook the more recent past in favour of ancient history, we noted in the section Repositories of Information, his relative marginalisation of the imperial cult, 
viewing and evaluating stories about gods and heroes and practices performed in their honor through a framework which privileges age and tradition as criteria of assessment, see Hutton 2005, 305, Pirendel Forge 2008, 337 FF. Such criteria render Pausania's construction of Greece and Greek identity a form of resistance to the realities of Roman rule, Elsner 1992, 5. The relatively static image of Greek culture which Pausanias affords should be read with caution. Pausanias' invaluable insights into local cults need similarly to be approached with care. The pronounced emphasis in Pausanias' text on the Poikilia, the rich variety of Greek culture, finds a careful counterpoint in his underlying assumption of Panhellenic unity in relation to which he understands and portrays such local diversity. In Pausanias we find a Greece which seeks to be understood neither through nor against Roman rule, see Hutton 2005, 311 FF, Pirendel Forge 2006, 2008. In constructing a Panhellenic perspective against which to view local religion, Pausanias, at the same time, constructs himself as an authority capable of this kind of exegesis and illumination. He not only relays but also eruditely contrasts and passes judgment on local accounts, e.g. 2.23.5 f. Pirendel Forge has explored, inter alia, Pausania's approach to the universal Greek pantheon in the face of local diversity, through his pointed use of vocabulary, the term theos, she notes, is never qualified by the term epicorios, which is elsewhere common as a description of local practices, tales, and even heroes and daemons in Pausania's work. Again, we also find Pausania's relating figures which are identified locally solely by an epiclesis, cult title, to gods of the traditional pantheon, such as his association of the Agathos Theos at Megalopolis to Zeus, Pirendel Forge 2008, Chapter 5. We see here, then, how a given author's interests and agenda might yield a reflective and creative, but not necessarily accurate, way of shaping information about cults and gods. In relating local religious phenomena to Panhellenic ones, Pausanias engages in a novel equivalent to Interpretatio Graeca, which may not reproduce the way individual local communities themselves perceived these cults and figures of worship, or the way they felt they related to wider Greek models. A productive way in which some religious historians have approached Pausanias and his text is to think of him as a pilgrim writing for other pilgrims, see e.g. Elsner 1992. But what do we mean by pilgrimage? What sort of motivations does the term imply on the part of the pilgrim? What sort of relationship does it envisage between pilgrim and God? Rutherford has explored the relation between Pausanias' text and the Greek practice of theoria, itself a complex term encompassing, for example, both civic delegations to sanctuaries and individual attendance at festivals, Rutherford 2001. Theoria blurs the distinctions between intellectual activity and religious experience, or between pilgrimage and recreational sightseeing, to view and to discuss the sights and sounds of religious festivals was, as Rutherford has well illustrated, as much part of the religious experience as the sacrificial act, Sun Pian, or Dionysiac tragedy. Against this background, Pausanias' periogesis is itself part of a religious complex of activities, a vicarious form of engaging in the religious activity of Theoria. Pausanias' text, like Herodoto's oracle narratives, may also frame or inform religious experiences. By repeatedly re-enacting Pausanias' Theoria for us, the text may shape how we understand or undertake Theoria ourselves. So, finally, does Pausanias' text provide us insight into personal religious experience? For some scholars, Pausanias' self-conscious status as Papidumenos is inconsistent with an identity as pilgrim, his apparent piety constitutes a literary persona befitting an author of the second sophistic. I stressed above, in critical prose sources, that self-consciously critical, sophisticated, and educated thinkers need not espouse general hostility to traditional religious attitudes and practices. They may, rather, develop distinctive ways of thinking about such attitudes and practices. To overlook or explain away such passages as Pausania's famous claim, 8.8.2-3, that, since visiting Arcadia, he has come to re-evaluate his opinion of certain logoi, which he once dismissed as silly stories but now sees contain some kind of wisdom, 
in favor of a rational reading of the periegesis, is to oversimplify a complex text. See Hutton 2005, 304F. Pausanias' description of the Oracle of Trophonios at Lebedea provides an example of his own engagement with the religious sites he observes and describes. His account is both detailed, describing the complex preparatory rituals undertaken before an oracle consultation and precise architectural details, and emotionally charged. A prospective consultant who receives positive omens from the preparatory sacrifices goes down with true hope, receives his oracle, after a claustrophobic and dramatic entry, and leaves possessed with terror and hardly knowing himself or the things around him, unable, temporarily, to laugh or to think straight. 9.39.414, trans. Levi 1979, with modifications. The echoes between this description and Aristide's evocative personal accounts of his encounters with Asclepios are pronounced, see e.g. 2.23k for Aristide's altered perception on seeing the god. At the same time, both authors intimate the limits of the communication of religious experiences. The inadequacy of Aristide's words as an accurate record of all that he experienced in his dealings with Asclepios is a constant refrain of the work, e.g. 1.1, 2.1, 2.8k, emphatically reminding the reader of what is not being communicated. Similarly, Pausania's own experience when he went down to Trophonios is left unspoken. For this, the reader will have to visit themselves, since each person experiences it differently. Pausanias' account of Trophonios also includes a cautionary tale, through which Pausanias, like Herodotus, teaches us how not to approach the oracle. He tells how one of Demetrios' bodyguards, who fulfilled none of the proper rites and had intended to rob the shrine, was killed going down, his body appearing elsewhere, 9.39.12. By including this story, Pausanias participates in shaping the expectations and experience of the visitor and in praising the god. Pausania's description of the oracle at Lebedea, then, well illustrates several of our principal concerns, it engages actively and reflectively with this religious site and offers a unique representation of an individual's experience of it, while, at the same time, self-consciously recognizing its own limitations as an account of religious experience. Suggested reading Feeney 1998, though focused on Rome is an excellent introduction to the question of literature's relationship to religion. Harrison 2007 explores many of the issues surrounding literary sources specifically in the context of Greek religion. Goldhill 2002 offers an accessible and lively account of the development of prose as a distinct literary style in the classical period. Studies of individual authors and their approach to religion are numerous, see e.g. Hornblower 1992 on Thucydides, Parker 2004 on Xenophon, Osborne 1997 on Heraclitos, and Petzalus Diomedis 2010 on Aristides. For the orators, see Parker 1997 and Martin 2009. McHalson 2003 and Harrison 2000 provide divergent studies of the religion of Herodotos. For Pausanias, Elsner 1992 remains important, while Pirendel Forge 2008 offers both a helpful overview of past approaches and a rich, close reading of the periegesis. Chapter 7 Literary Evidence Poetry Renaud Gagne A well-known anecdote from Strabo, 8 March 1930, describes how the sculptor Phaedias designed his masterpiece, The Great Statue of Zeus in the Sanctuary of Olympia, as a reflection of three verses from Homer's Iliad. 1.528-30. The most prestigious and authoritative cult image of the high god is there presented as the solid shape of epic verse, a massive stone monument carved out of a monument of poetry. The locus classicus on the question of poetry as the template for divine forms is Herodotus 2.53, where the historian famously writes that Homer and Hesiod taught the Greeks of the descent of the gods, and gave to all their several names, and honours, and arts, and indicated their outward shapes. For Herodotus in that passage, the main point is that the poems of Homer and Hesiod, the oldest Greek poems, are in fact relatively recent, and much older sources are now available to actual scrutiny and new, tangible knowledge opened by history over the territory previously held by the muses and the masters of their truth. Other critics of Homer and Hesiod, such as Xenophanes, 
DKB 14 to 16, or Empedocles, DKB 27 to 9, contested the anthropomorphism of Epic in its depiction of divine bodies, and offered alternatives that emphasized the god's non-human form, on Epic, see also Martinez, chapter 11 in this volume. The authority of the early poets was the great rival that had to be supplanted. Early historiography and the other forms of novel wisdom and science that flourished at the time, including the ethical and natural investigations that will come to be known as philosophy, had to break down the hold of the poets on Alethea in order to carve their own epistemic space, often through the language of poetry itself. That sustained contestation of the old foundations of knowledge constitutes a watershed in the history of Greek culture. Transformed into something else by the appropriations of exegesis, or reduced to fiction and confined to the aesthetic realm, the special claim of inspired poetry to access a privileged reality eventually lost its former predominance in the course of the classical period, although it never disappeared entirely. Poetry continued to play a major part in subsequent phases of Greek religion, in the Hellenistic and Roman periods, but the stage had been thoroughly changed. Still a fundamental medium for expressing the religious imagination, as well as a central presence in cult, Poetry's authority now derived mostly from symbolic capital and reinterpretations and the archive, less from the production of new texts. Callimachus was indeed an important religious thinker of his time, but no one could confuse him with Hesiod. The present chapter will be concerned with some of the religious roles of poetry before that fundamental cultural shift. It will attempt to answer one question. What kind of evidence does archaic and classical verse provide for the study of early Greek religion? It will not seek to assess the notoriously difficult task of using poetry as a source of religious realia, painstakingly mined in the hope of recovering echoes of ritual language, cult practices, sanctuary space, or even belief. Rather, it will be interested in poetry itself as an agent of religious thought. The impact of poetic texts on the religious imagination of their audiences is a particularly important aspect of the question at hand. One recurrent assertion in our sources is that poetry coloured what the Greeks saw when they saw a god. The vivid narratives of epic, the catalogues of didactic poetry, hymnic evocations, oracular hexameters, the sumptuous tableaus of monadic lyric, the marriage of movement and verbal image enacted in choral performance, or the three-dimensional mimesis of drama, all forced their audiences to conjure synesthetic images of divinity. Sometimes a single adjective can serve as the support of that vision, as the epithet Glaucopes so commonly applied to Athena, or Bupis for Herol, words that were interpreted in wildly different ways early on, as the scolia attest. A whole passage will trace the particular contours of the god's shape on other occasions, as in the description of Typhon in Theogony 823-35. But most of these texts often contained precious little descriptive detail of divine bodies, and the imagination of the individual audience member was left to its own devices when supplying the missing details. Still, the audience regularly had to conjure these forms in the mind's eye through the exigences of narrative with their attributes and specificities. The ideal, yet uncannily impersonal, anthropomorphic appearance that is so often chosen to embody the presence of divinity in narrative frequently suggests the awesome, ineffable power which inhabits that morph of a moment, and actually threatens mere mortals when it is revealed to them in its full power, e.g. HH 2.275-80, HH 5.181-90. The fragmentary focalization of poetry is the necessary channel for the contemplation of that reality beyond vision. It is, of course, wrong to believe that the physical images of the gods, on which, see she, chapter 12 in this volume, were dependent on the images of song, or vice versa. The representational dialogue between poetry, on the one hand, and sculpture and painting on the other, was a complex one at any time and it certainly went in both directions, with each medium speaking its own language. The difficulty of translating one into the other is well illustrated by an anecdote found in Ion of Chios Epidemii, FGRH 392F6, where the tragedian Sophocles, a contemporary of Ion, is found berating a pretentious man at a symposium for misunderstanding the different colour idioms of poetry and painting. When the poet, that is, Pindar, depicts Apollo as golden-haired, chrysocomas, this does not mean that the painter should represent the god with blonde hair, 
Sophocles says in the text, as the painting would not be as good if the artist actually made the god's hair golden rather than black, the quote comes from all. 6.41, the codes of each art cannot be converted so easily into the other. Notwithstanding the interesting aesthetic issues raised by the anecdote, what stands out for us is the actual misinterpretation staged by the story, and the method of resolution to the disagreement, Sophocles vanquishes his foe by an overwhelming demonstration of culture and rhetoric. The poor pedantic grammarian clearly had no chance before the great playwright. But his error of literalism must have been a perfectly common reading of the poetic image, one that would have been reproduced countless times at other symposia, and it is probably fair to say that, in the majority of these cases, one of the most prominent poets of the age was not there to offer an authoritative solution. Who controls the poetic images of the gods? And, more importantly, who controls their interpretation? The flagrant contradictions that existed between the different kinds of divine representation were there for all to see and to decode. The visual culture of divinity that informed symposiasts in the time of Sophocles was characterized by great diversity and disagreements, constantly confronted to each other and creatively reinterpreted, where the many different images of the gods produced by interaction with poetry were never far from the mind. How could they be? A pillar of the education of everyone in the cities, male and female, citizen and slave, the performance of poetry remained a fundamental tool of socialization throughout people's lives, both as a shared object of reflection, and as a marker of discrimination, the touchstone that allowed one to make a distinction between those who belonged in the group and those who did not. This was especially true of participation in the local choral dances and songs that played such an important role in the ritual lives of the polis and the upbringing of both girls and boys in the Greek world, but it was certainly not confined to Chirea. That is the essential reason behind Plato's attacks on Homer and tragedy. Conflicts of knowledge lie at the heart of Greek religion. A live web of different poetic cultures crisscrossed the Greek world, composed of a great many intertwined strands in a constant but circumscribed process of change. Few songs were entirely local, and the commonly used terms epicoric and panhellenic, which remain very useful in this regard, must be handled with caution if we want to avoid overly artificial distinctions. Song culture in the Greek world was never just a matter of social coherence and cultural cohesion, but offered the individual a vast grid of potential alternatives, stances, and choices of reference for any situation. Poetry was one of the main mediators of divine reality, a comprehensive cognitive filter that provided the individuals with the building blocks of their imagination on the matter. What these blocks actually were for each individual, and what he or she did with them at various times, was ultimately a matter of chance, life history, and personal choice. What the Greeks knew about the gods, not only their bodies, obviously, but also their genealogy, their activity, their attributes, they predominantly knew by the intermediary of song and not just works by Homer and Hesiod. It is, first and foremost, through these songs that the narratives of myth took shape and were transmitted over the generations and the many lands of the Greek world, as numerous speeches and dialogues attest. Pausanias, for instance, can still accept the authority of the grand old epics as a basis for plausible investigation, against the mere opinion, theme, of local tradition, 9.41. Poetic language found its way into the language of ritual practice, such as the Bacchic gold leaves, or the cult epithet Kratrophron applied to Heracles, which clearly derives from hexameter poetry, and found its way to sanctuaries from Sicily to Phrygia, Lumen 1950, 327. Over and above the old wives' tales mentioned by Plato, Resp. 350e, H.P. My. 285e6a, GRG. 527a, or the casual talk at the symposium, it was the finally crafted songs of the poets that shaped the references informing the Greek religious imagination concerning the nature of their gods. But what these songs said about the gods was far from uniform, of course. Some of the most basic facts about a god could vary from text to text, Aphrodite is the daughter of Uranos in Hesiod's Theogony 154-206, but her parents are Zeus and Dion in Iliad 5.370. These variants can be found concerning many aspects of the genealogy, attributes, and activity of most of the gods found in our sources. 
when the characters of Plato's Symposium try to define the nature of the god Eros, to take a notorious example, wildly different interpretations of the most basic traits of his power and character are proposed, many of them grounded in the words and generic language of competing poetic representations, starting with Homer's Iliad and Hesiod's Theogony, and ending with tragedy. A deep and playful experimentation with contemporary forms of Greek thought, the dialogue attests to the great flexibility of divine representations in the sympotic culture it portrayed, and the essential roles played by songs in justifying the competing claims to its knowledge. Poetry offered much ground for such spectacles of disagreement about the gods, both in its claims to embody tradition and in its appeals to the novelty of a break with the past. The many different portraits of the invisible presented by poetry in this religious system, based on the unknowability of divinity, were constantly contested. The variety of poetic voices that were vying for authority at the time is impressive and noteworthy. Some traditions had clear ideological agendas, others cultivated a more open polyphony, but all strove for distinction. In the contests of the symposium, the musical agones, or the dramatic competitions, Verse was shaped through conflict with other verses, and the meaning of songs was grounded in a poetics of contrast. That is a situation already in place in our earliest records. Far from passively reflecting the deep structures of myth, or the versions of native lore, poetic depictions of the gods were actively engaged in moulding the tales themselves, configuring them to the specific orientations of their text and authorial voice and often engaged in competition with other contemporary texts and figures. The song that claimed authority on divine matters could invoke the presence of the muses, and assert a direct access to the inspired knowledge provided by the daughters of Memosine. Other songs could claim the authorship of poets with special links to the divine, such as Epimenides, Musaios, or Orpheus. Most, however, did not do either. They all had, in any case, to negotiate a place in relation to tradition, a stance between the poles of appropriation and contestation. Following the path of tradition meant inscribing a song over other songs, participating in a concert of voices that was both synchronically and diachronically larger than the individual performance of the here and now. Without moving away too far from the expectations of tradition, the song had to mark its specificity, and build the characteristics that made it stand out. Not limited to introductory hymns or proems such as Hesiod's Theogony 1 to 115 or Works and Days 1 to 10, or those emphatically self reflexive passages of programmatic statements such as Iliad 2.484 to 92, the construction of authority and the definition of a song's situation in regard to tradition were more generally woven deep in the text as a whole, patterned with a myriad different strands. The internal logic of a poem is part of the armature of its authority. Only by taking the time to enter the text through close reading, and engaging with the nuances of its language and imagery, can these patterns be made discernible and properly assessed. I propose, in what follows, to look at one particularly rich example of that poetic negotiation of tradition, the claim to authority of the Homeric Hymn to Apollo, an important literary hymn from the 6th century BCE, on hymns, see also Versnal, chapter 30 in this volume. How shall I hymn you, well hymned, you hymn knows, as you are in every respect? With these words from line 19. How shall I hymn you, well hymned, you hymn knows, as you are in every respect? With these words from line 19, the poet of the Homeric hymn to Apollo marks the transition that will lead away from the divine realm of Olympos and the introduction of Leto's son to the society of the gods into the human landscapes of cities and cult and the celebration of Zeus' son in the world of men. The inscription of the divinity in the space and time of the hymnic narrative conjures a veritable map of the deity that is made an immediate interlocutor in the present of the performance, it locates him in myth and cult, and weaves a web of correspondences between that distant configuration and the hicket nunc. Line 19 opens the section of the hymn that is devoted to the presence of the god on the island of Delos. Apollo is well hymned, in that fields of song are laid down for him everywhere, the whole land glorifies him. That statement contains a complex poetic program of great religious significance. The fields of song image of line 20 underlines the profound imbrication of land and poetry staged by the hymn. The passage goes out of its way to express the reach of these fields of song, 
which are found in all possible areas, both high and low, enumerated in lines 21 to 4. The imbrication of land and poetry that makes Apollo Euhymnos is boundless, which is what makes the choice of the poem so difficult. The singer has to decide where and when his song is to be set in this limitless field of possibilities. As all land brings joy to Apollo because of what he has done there and the songs that celebrate these events, the hymn can start from anywhere. From this general statement of spatial universality, the poem moves to the specifics of precise location. The transition is marked by another question, which points to one event, the birth of Apollo, and the place where it happened, the island of Delos. To further emphasize where the island is, and its relative position in regard to other places, the passage proceeds to relate all the locations where the birth of Apollo did not happen, spaces defined by a lack in comparison to Delos, lines 30 to 46. This is more than a priamel. The identification of that negative space, the enumeration of all the sites that refused to welcome Leto when she was about to give birth to the god, is organized as a circular spiral topography around the island. The whole Aegean is traced by this map of names. Only by virtue of the stories that did not happen in these locations is the story of Delos made possible. As has long been recognized, most of the sites named in the list have a significant cultic link to Apollo, see Kolzig 2007, 72-80. But what stands out from the spatial web of the poem is the way these places, some of them, like Athens, Samos, or Malta's, significant regional powers in the 6th century BCE are positioned in a relation of dependence to the tiny island of Delos. The Great Gathering is located in the centre of the circle drawn by the peregrinations of Leto around the sea. The lands that once refused the arrival of the god at the edges of the Aegean now rejoice in his honour at its middle. Just as the songs that praise Apollo are embedded in all regions of the world, the sanctuaries of the god are innumerable, as well as the places that find favour with him. But no location is beloved by the god more than Delos, we are told, when the Ionians are assembled for the festivities, 146-8. At the heart of this event is a peerless wonder, the local chorus of the Delian maidens described in 156-76. The maidens know how to imitate the voices of all men, so that anyone might think it was he himself speaking, 162-4. All song is concentrated in their song, they reproduce what comes from outside, and embody its likeness in all aspects of language and sound. In this, they function as a parallel to the centripetal force of the festival itself, its ability to gather the whole Aegean in one central location. Just as the island becomes host to the entire region, the chorus of the Delian maidens contains the songs of all men. The song they start with is a hymn to Apollo followed by a hymn to Artemis and Leto, before they turn their thoughts to the men and women of old and sing a song that charms the people, another hymn, 158-9. Through this evocation of the maiden's choral mimesis, what the passage is underlining is the breadth of their range, both gods and mortals, both male and female, their song encompasses the core of poetry. It is a hymn to Apollo that stands at the beginning of their miraculous performance one that is located at the very heart of the nexus of Apolline song and place staged by the poem. The invitation to contrast the hymn presently performed in the Hicket Nunk of the audience with the hymn of the Delian maidens portrayed in the text could not be clearer. The point is explicitly brought forward by the direct encounter of the persona of the text's author himself with the Delian chorus at lines 165 to 76. Switching to a dramatic mode, the poet addresses the chorus directly as if present on site here, in Thade, in Delos, and asks them to commemorate his song for all time to come. When a man next comes from abroad to ask who is their favourite singer, they are to answer, it is a blind man, and he lives in rocky Kios, all of his songs remain supreme afterwards, 166-73. There can be little doubt that the blind poet is related to the first-person singular voice of the text, as embodied in performance, something that makes the shift of the first-person plural of the next line particularly puzzling. Is this a reference to a group of singers? Does it point to the plurality of rhapsodic performances that are to follow, Nagy 1996, 214-25? Various scenarios have been proposed, and none has been generally accepted. 
What is certain is that the statement concerns the persona of the poet, and continues the description of the exchange that is to be made between him and the chorus. While the collective chorus sings the praise of the individual poet whose song has come to it, the collective performers of the epic poetry embodied by the poet will sing the praise of the individual chorus, and the individual island, in the countless lands and cities where they will carry their song. Following the centripetal movement of songs and lands towards Delos, the centrifugal diffusion of the hymn throughout the region furthers the depth of praise offered to the god. The chorus that contains all other songs has identified this one hymn as the superior song. As it unfolds in performance here and now, the answer to the question of how the poem is to him the well-hymned god involves every member of the audience in a landscape of other songs and performances that trace the contours of a vast area of significance. Appropriating the authority of the fixed chorus of the maidens, the mobile hymn of the blind poet of Chios establishes itself as the one voice that stands out in the whole of the Aegean. The narrative circle is complete, and the poem consequently gives signs of closure. But the first-person voice of the narrator continues its intervention and announces that and myself, I shall not cease from hymning the far-shooter Apollo of the silver bow, whom lovely-haired Leto bore, 177-8. Building on a variant of the traditional formulas that usually end hymns and point forward to another performance, these two lines reverse expectations and lead us back to a new beginning, the start of the hymn's second half, the so-called hymn to Pythian Apollo. The parallel between the two constructions is clearly emphasized. The question of line 19 is restated word for word at line 207, How shall I hymn you, well hymned, you hymn knows, as you are in every respect? The new answer leads to the evocation of a different map of significant space. As in the first half of the hymn, the lines that answer the question open the vista of alternative songs and stories that the poem could follow. The section, similarly, is traced around the evocation of a distinctive space. The parallel is striking, an initial scene on the summit of Olympos, 186-206, is followed by a series of itineraries that map out an area of relevant geography. In search of the seat of his great oracle, Apollo descends from the great northern mountain to travel south, passing through a variety of places on the way, lines 216 to 44. As in the case of Delos, the site of Delphi is chosen as the result of a rejection from another land, 245 to 99. Apollo's subsequent search for the ministers of his new oracular shrine will take him back to Crete, the site of the original starting point for the great circular trajectory of the hymn to Delos, lines 409-39. But instead of drawing a circle around the east of Greece, his trajectory in guiding the Cretan men to Delphi goes in the opposite direction, and adds the whole western part of the Greek landmass to the map of Apolline space drawn by the poet, taking on all of the Peloponnese in the process. The three itineraries of the hymn touch, but do not overlap. They correspond to the three regions of humankind identified by the poem, those who live in the fertile Peloponnese, those who live in the mainland, and those who live in the sea-girt islands, 247-52. Giving shape to a space that goes from Olympos in the north to Crete in the south, from the Ionian Sea to the coast of Asia Minor, they encompass the whole of non-colonial Greece, at any rate. The endpoint of the last two, Delphi, is placed right at the nominal centre of this Apolline geography. Just as Delos is displayed as the middle point of the Aegean in the first part of the hymn, Delphi comes out as the centre of Greece. The poetic landscape created by the deployment of geographical lists in the poem, and the elegant combination of the parallel, complementary spaces from the two halves of the hymn, formalises the traditional proposition that Delphi is the navel of the world. The choice of Delos and Delphi allows the hymn to incorporate all the spaces and, by extension, all the other songs of the well-hymned God. The poem's evocation of time follows a parallel course. Essential to the idea that the songs are grounded in space is the idea that these spaces commemorate an event. The focus of each half of the hymn on a particular location is a celebration of an event that took place there in the distant past, and of the rituals that still commemorate it even now. To understand how the two moments are complementary, and how their combination can be said to evoke a complete image of the god in the world, it is important to consider how each event is linked to a different episode taking place on Olympos in the text.
The first moment, the birth of Apollo on Delos, is associated with the arrival of Apollo on the Divine Mountain, and his first acceptance into the Society of the Gods, 1 to 13. The threat of divine conflict is an important thread of this episode. It is Hera's hostility to Leto that creates the crisis of Apollo's dramatic birth, and his arrival on Olympos has ominous overtones of potential struggle. A powerful young god carrying a stringed bow, he provokes fear among the gods when he first appears to them. Apart from Zeus, they all rise in his presence, trembling. Will the young god contest the power of his father and reignite the war in heaven with the claim of a new generation? His warm welcome by Zeus immediately appeases the tension. Disarmed of his bow by his mother, offered the nectar of divine society by his father, Apollo has entered the community of the gods without strife. The hymn begins with the outcome of its initial narrative, the mutual recognition of father and son, and the overcoming of Hera's hostility, a divinity that, as it happens, was prominently honoured on the island of Delos. The second part of the hymn, which also starts on Olympos, follows a parallel structure to the first part. Now established as a powerful god throughout the world, with major sanctuaries in Lydia and Lycia, in Miltus, Delos, and Delphi, 179-85, Apollo is no longer the young god making his way to the land of his father, but a great voice at the heart of Olympos. The festivities of the gods described in the poem are reminiscent of the festivities of men taking place on Delos, with a clear echo underscored between the chorus of the muses and the Delian maidens. The muses, like the maidens, sing of gods and men, and their song is also a hymn, 190. All the gods who are named as participating in those festivities belong to the same generation, that is, they are all children of Zeus, a fact foregrounded by Aphrodite being identified as Zeus' daughter, 195, a statement that clears any possible confusion with other traditional genealogies. United in a great circle dance, holding each other by the wrists, the generation of Zeus' children rejoice in harmony indeed, Harmony herself is part of the choral celebrations, for Harmony as a daughter of Zeus, see Gantz 1993, 215. Apollo is at the centre, leading the dance with his kithra under the joyful gaze of Zeus and Leto, 201-6. His generation is united in its celebration of Olympos, with Apollo at its head. An answer to the unstringed bow of the first half of the poem, the stringed kithra seals the union of generations, the renunciation of strife, and the power of song to embody the rhythms of cosmic concord, compared to Mon Brune 2007. After going up to Olympos, Apollo now moves away from it as one of its agents. It is outside of Olympos that the stringed bow reappears as a defining attribute of the god. The central event of the hymn's second half, the foundation of Delphi, is built on a moment of violence, the slaying of a dragon by the god. This Delphi is the place where the dragon rots. A long ring composition at the core of this section relates how Hera, furious at the birth of Athena, resolved to stay away from the company of the gods and produce a child of her own, Typhon, 300-74. A particularly vivid scene describes how she hit the ground with the flat of her hand and demanded the child from the primordial powers of earlier generations, 334-9. The primordial forces she addresses are the previous rulers of heaven, among whom are the defeated enemies of Zeus, now locked in Tartaros. Demanding, as she does, that her child be more powerful than Zeus, just as Zeus was more powerful than Kronos, is nothing less than to tear the cosmos asunder. Heros rage reopens the war in heaven, Strauss Clay 2006, 67-71. The awesome Typhon traditionally portrayed as the greatest threat and the last challenge to the order of Zeus, is made the son of Hera in this version and this version alone. Prominently linked to GE, the divinity usually identified as Typhon's mother, in her prayer for the child, it is Hera who becomes the mother of all danger in the poem. This is a distinctive version of the myth that writes itself upon tradition and belongs to the distinctive narrative logic of the text. The birth of Typhon is the reverse mirror of the birth of Apollo, Typhon the cosmic challenge that Apollo emphatically is not. Hera's opposition to the birth of Apollo in the first half of the hymn is answered by her own pregnancy in the second half in opposition to the birth of Athena. 
that continued antagonism is marked by a contrast to the refusal of lands to welcome Apollo in both halves of the home, the Earth herself accepts the birth of Typhon. It is on the future site of Delphi that he is welcomed by the dragon to be reared, not on Olympos, as Apollo, and from there that he will launch his assault on Olympos. Apollo's foundation of Delphi is inscribed on the site of the alternative world threatened by the arrival of Typhon. The poem is entirely silent about the battle of Zeus and Typhon. It only mentions Apollo's slaying of the dragon on the future site of the temple, the point of departure, and conclusion of the poem's long ring composition on the birth of the great adversary of divine order. Just as Heracles, that other son of Zeus, will be famous for exterminating the offspring of Typhon at the four corners of the world, Apollo slays the creature that reared the monster at the very center of the universe. This highly selective reference to one of the determinant events of archaic Greek cosmogony allows the poem to activate a relevant background of meaning against which to highlight the specificities of its own themes. The slaying of the dragon confirms the final triumph of the young god over the enmity of Herol. The dragon is an intermediary that allows for the avoidance of a direct confrontation between the gods of the Olympian pantheon. By killing the beast and laying down the foundations of his temple, Apollo vanquishes once and for all the forces that have opposed him since his birth. His victory confirms the cosmic power of Zeus. Just as the birth of Apollo happens despite the attempts of Hera to limit the reproductive powers of her husband, the death of the dragon consecrates the failure of her own reproductive power and her challenge to his rule. With the killing of the serpent, Apollo becomes an integral part of his father's final and complete dominion over the universe. Male rule is definitively imposed over female opposition. The powers of earlier generations, GE and Uranos, as well as the Titans, are defeated once and for all. The foundation of Delphi on this site seals the constitution of Olympian order. Literally built over the corpse of the creature that reared the last challenge to it, it consecrates the alliance of later generations against the older forces of primordial times. Just as it is literally at the center of space, Delphi is thus also figuratively at the center of time. It is certainly not a coincidence that this is the place that will become the seat of the oracular voice that knows what has been, what is, and what shall be, a channel for the knowledge of Zeus himself. Reducing the internal logic of a poem to a combination of discrepancies imperfectly brought together by chance hardly does justice to the intricate parallels that make the different parts of the text echo each other and that were experienced as a whole by the audiences of the text that we actually have. The combination of the Delian and Delphic halves of the Homeric hymn to Apollo is more than an assemblage of disparate elements, but a carefully crafted tableau built on parallels and responsions. Grounded in these two complementary poles, the presence of the god is projected over the entire Greek domain, and inscribed in the fabric of time that made the universe what it is. The aim is to encompass the full range of the god's presence. The song makes a claim over all other songs of Apollo, elevating the hymn over any one event, any one place, or any one performance. Designed for perennity throughout the cities of Greece, the poem gives an authoritative shape to the power of the god. Its own recurrent performance over the centuries is a powerful answer to the repeated question of lines 19 and 207. The hymn conjures an image of the god that claims the authority of tradition as a whole. The rhetoric of panhellenism it deploys from beginning to end projects an all-encompassing vision that surpasses the perspective of any one place of cult or any one song, and ties them all together in one general picture of common significance. The discourse of authority displayed by the hymn could nominally sustain itself in any performance or occasion. But at no time was there any outside force to defend it efficiently, no priesthood or recognized arbiters of orthodoxy to remind the audience of its truth and tell them what it meant, Parker 2011, 40-63. That is a predicament it shares with most other poetic texts. What is the meaning of Zeus Egiochos? Is it Zeus the Aegis bearer, or Goat Rider Zeus, see West 1978, 366-8? What is the meaning of Hermes Ereunios? Is it Benefactor? or Fast Runner, see Lumen 1950, 123. Is Hermes Diactoros the dispenser or the guide? Is there one correct answer to such questions? 
The old formulaic epithets, obscured and misunderstood with the passage of time, became invitations for reinterpretation and exegesis, with little stability in place. The endeavours of rhapsodes to explain the real sense, the hypernoia, of the poems they performed were regularly derided, for instance, see Richardson 2006. The interpretive cultures of the symposium were notoriously variegated, see EGPL PRT 347E. An attempts, like that of the Dervini commentator's exegesis of an Orphic hymn, to impose meaning on a text and, in this case, propose a reading of broad ritual and theological significance, had marginal impact at best. The authority of the poem could be denied as easily as what we find in Herodotos, for instance, or dismissed entirely, as the works of so many presocratics attest. It could be transformed by allegorical exegesis, something that already appears in our sources in the 6th century BCE, and that is well attested in the classical period, struck 2004. It was, in any case, always mediated by the individual agency of every member of the audience, who undoubtedly understood it in different terms from most of their peers, with no recognised voices able to steer a clear and common direction. Sophocles could not direct the interpretation of every member of his audience, as he did that poor grammarian in the symposium described by Ion of Chios. When the muses tell Hesiod that we know how to say many false things similar to genuine ones, but we know, when we wish, how to proclaim true things, Thieg. 27-8, one implication is that the two opposites are almost undistinguishable to the human audience, and each one can lead to the other. In other words, the interpretation of the song is as important as the song itself in uncovering the truth it holds, a teaching repeated in countless verse traditions of later periods, from the riddles of the symposium and popular oracular poetry to the most refined melic poems of Pindar, who spoke for those who can hear, see e.g. all. 2.85, nowhere was this truer than in the massive spectacles of shattered knowledge and fragmented perspectives offered by tragedy to Athenian audiences throughout the classical period, with their discordant voices, powerless choral songs, and open-ended irony. These plays recurrently staged the main figures of the heroic past faced with a world coming apart at the seams, the mutability of human fortune and the enigma of divine inscrutability, powerful foci of reflection on the fundamental religious issues of the polis. As play after play explored and reconfigured the delicate edifices of tradition on divine justice and ritual action, on the cultic landscapes of the past and their many ramifications in the present, each spectator was confronted with choices of interpretation and involvement that were entirely personal, see Budelman 2000 for the plays of Sophocles. The religious role of tragedy is a vexed question of scholarship that cannot be properly addressed here, see Callum, chapter 13 in this volume. Most scholars, at this point, would agree that drama should not simply be equated with ritual. Dionysos, at any rate, certainly does not hide behind every mask, and it would be absurd to reduce tragedy to the religious dimensions of the plays, as some have done at times. These religious dimensions, for many members of the audience, had very little significance indeed. But they clearly did matter to most, and the constant questioning of the foundations of religious knowledge by tragedy was hardly just an aesthetic concern. Tragedy's discourse of religious exploration, to cite Christian Savinu inward, opened a space that invited a real and constantly renewed engagement from every single viewer with the meaning of piety and cosmic order, ritual practice, and religious belief. Savinu Inwood 2003. The protagonists of the plays were, in the great majority of cases, the central figures in the religious universe of the audience, and many tragedies ended with the foundation of a cult, the creation of a direct link between the dramatic mythos that had just unfolded and the ritual life of the present. Considering that most of these etiological stories were set outside of Attica, Tragedy actually provided its Athenian audiences with a detailed map of cult in the wider Greek world, and even beyond reinvented for the occasion, of course. The rituals that were described and performed in every play, in any case, from sacrifice to supplication, from hymnic singing to libation and choreographed schemata, were in direct dialogue with the everyday religious experiences of the audience. In some cases, it can be demonstrated that tragedy did not only reflect cultic practice and imagination, but profoundly modified it, see e.g. Henrik's 1978. 
The fact that this discourse, and indeed performance, of religious exploration can be read as a fundamental element of stability and order, a powerful reaffirmation of the religious system of the polis, or as a transgressive questioning of religious norms designed to leave the spectators with more queries than answers, is a testament to the inexhaustible richness of these texts, and the intractable hermeneutic challenges they have and will always continue to pose. The great popular events of the dramatic festival were, by all accounts, the most spectacular types of poetic performance of their day, but they should not be allowed to overshadow the many other types of poetry that existed at the same time and we should always remember that nowhere did they play a comparable role to the one they had in Athens at a specific time. Pindar, for instance, presents a whole different world of negotiations with many of the same theological traditions engaged by Aeschylus. The poetic literacy and religious competence needed to navigate the many voices of truth offered by authoritative song in the archaic and classical period varied a great deal from person to person, let alone group to group, city to city, region to region. Yes, Greek religion had no church and no scripture, as we are often reminded. But we should cease to present the flexibility of its system of authority, based on competition and rivalry, as an absence. The many unmediated choices of the individual before the grandiose claims of poetry to reveal images of divine truth created a mosaic of possibilities of immense cultural potency. This cut and thrust of immediate reception and culture in movement has left little trace and it cannot be measured or quantified, like foundation deposits, the size of altars, or the prices of sacrificial animals on inscriptions, any more than it can be modelled, like social interactions. But it is no less important than sanctuaries or sacrifice or festivals to make sense of Greek religion. The many discrepancies of poetry, just as the even greater divergences and disagreements of its ancient, and modern, understandings, are not indications that these texts mattered little for the religious life of their audiences, but a fundamental characteristic of that lively and constantly shifting religious system, and the choices confronted by each individual. Greek religion cannot be limited to cult, whatever we mean by cult. Without the vast web of poetic worlds painted in our texts, and the challenges to scholarly interpretation they entail, our knowledge of the possibilities of Greek religious experience would be thoroughly diminished, and much staler. The platitudes of positivistic certainty dismiss literature from the study of archaic and classical religion at our loss. The many poetic texts that have come down to us contain a rich but circumscribed pool of meaning, which must be analysed for itself, not merely used to find reflections of something else if we want to make any sense of the Greek religious imagination. The hermeneutic analysis of poetry is an essential part of any real understanding of early Greek religion. Suggested reading Callum 2009b, 2006, is a particularly important methodological overview of recent scholarship on poetry and religion, while Callum 2009a, 2000, offers a current introduction to the poetics of myth, with good bibliography. The synthesis of Parker 2011, 20-31 and Versnell 2011, 151-237 offers stimulating general discussions of poetry and early Greek religion, with a full set of references. Much of the scholarship of the last decades on the question has been shaped by the very different approaches of Vernant, see Vernant and Vidal Nakwit 1988 and Vernant 1990, and Burkett, see 2001 and 2007. For the Homeric Hymn to Apollo, see Callum 2013, with extensive bibliography. For Religion and Tragedy, see Fid 1994, Henrik's 1994-1995, and Parker 2009 offer interesting paths through the scholarship. Chapter 8 Epigraphic Evidence Claire Taylor Introduction The epigraphic evidence for Greek religion is vast and inscriptions have made an enormous contribution to how historians have understood many aspects of cult activity in the Greek world. Produced for a multitude of purposes, these texts were recorded on a variety of durable as well as non-durable materials, stone, lead, gold, pottery, wax, talc, bones, and found in a range of contexts, sanctuaries and other public spaces, cemeteries, private houses. 
because there was no separation between sacred and secular in the ancient Greek world in the post-Enlightenment sense, and because religious activity was embedded into all aspects of Greek life, almost all forms of epigraphic evidence tell us something, direct or indirect, about Greek religion. It is a diverse body of material that provides a wealth of information about numerous different parts of religious life and experience, and there is subsequently a multitude of ways in which to interpret this form of evidence. This chapter offers some reflections on how past approaches and recent trends in epigraphic studies can contribute to current debates about various aspects of Greek religion. As with all epigraphic evidence, inscriptions concerning Greek religion raise questions not just about the textual content, but also about what was considered important to record in specific contexts. But inscriptions do not simply provide a body of knowledge about what happened in a particular cult. They are fundamental to understanding a host of other issues too, from audience and performance culture to commemoration and display from the interplay between writing and oral tradition to the construction of cultural memory, from the symbolic statement of power and authority to the materiality of text, and so on. Inscriptions reveal not only how cults were organized, but also how the written word was used to interact with the gods and express religious devotion, to demarcate space, and to negotiate social relationships within religious contexts. As should be clear from this overview, inscriptions are incredibly varied. Some are monumental, very large objects, set up in central, public places by religious or political authorities, and were no doubt costly, whereas others are small, not meant to be viewed by large numbers of people, or people at all, and intensely personal. In addition, there is regional diversity and change over time. Approaches and questions Given the immense volume of material, epigraphers have tended to concentrate on specific types of inscription that illuminate particular aspects of Greek cult, regulations, dedications, sacrifice, oracles, etc., or have focused on material from specific sites or sanctuaries, e.g. Delos, Delphi, Olympia. The study of inscriptions relating to Greek religion has both shaped and mirrored historiographical trends in the practice of ancient history as a whole, but, in doing so, it also reveals the assumptions and preoccupations of historians and epigraphers, from magisterial collections of all material from particular regions or sites, i.g., to studies of legal aspects of Greek cult, Sokolowski 1969, to examinations of women's role in ritual, Osborne 2000, or the religious experience of worshippers. Parker 2011. These different approaches are all illuminating in their own right and show the wide range of ways this material can be used. Since 1991, the Belgian journal Kernos has published annually an epigraphic bulletin for Greek religion that collects information on recent epigraphic discoveries and publications that enrich our knowledge of religion and cults in ancient Greece, Chaniotis 1991, 287. With its indices and cross-referencing to other epigraphic collections, notably SEG, this aims to provide a useful, and highly usable, tool for scholars and students wishing to be kept up to date with recent finds and new interpretations, a glance at these indices demonstrates the wide range of topics to which epigraphic evidence contributes. One way in which epigraphic material is useful is that it provides a different emphasis from literary or archaeological sources on certain aspects of religious life. The description of sacrifice, for example, as one of two broad types, Olympian or Thonian, is more prevalent in literary texts than in epigraphic ones, Scully in 1994, 2005, Eckrath 2007. Literary texts that describe sacrificial cakes appear to emphasize the spectacular and exceptional, whereas, when cakes are mentioned in epigraphic material, it seems as if they have a role in defining some functional aspect of the deity's cult because the material often goes into great detail about the precise kind of cake necessary for a particular ritual. Kearns 1994, 70. Sacrificial rituals leave different traces in different types of source material, so it is necessary to be aware of the processes behind, and reasons for, their appearance in the historical record. As Ulfarth rightly points out when discussing the epigraphic depiction of sacrifice, we, today, see many local differences and nothing else. For the Greeks it is otherwise, they see the normal ritual. But, there is no inscription about normality, 
Orfath 2005, 21, also 14 to 16, my italics. When using epigraphic evidence we must, therefore, be sensitive to the different processes that encouraged the recording of information about religious phenomena on inscriptions of different kinds compared with those which prompted their appearance in poetry, or, indeed, those which led to their appearance in the archaeological evidence. These are unlikely to be the same. Many surveys of Greek epigraphy mention different types of inscription that are associated with religious activity, for example, religious regulations, dedications, oracles, records of sanctuary administration, and so on, see Garducci 1987, 244-325, Maclean 2002, 189-95. Indeed, one of the most frequently studied forms of epigraphic evidence associated with Greek religion during the 20th century was sacred law, Sokolowski 1969. But sacred law as a category is unsatisfactory, and has been the subject of criticism since the 1970s, Lapu 2005, 3-9, see further Parker 2004. According to Lapu, 2005, 4, the term sacred law covers material as diverse as laws, decrees, statutes, regulations, edicts, treaties, contracts, leases, testaments, foundation documents, and oracles issued by federations, states, civic subdivisions and magistrates, royalty, sanctuaries, religious organizations, or private individuals. This is hardly a narrowly defined group. In essence, sacred law as a category reflects the interests of scholars in the political and legal history of the polis as the central feature of Greek life, but this is not the only form of political organization in, nor indeed the only lens through which to view, the Greek world, Morgan 2003, Glossopolis 2007, Ismar 2010. Furthermore, rulemaking in the ancient Greek world usually involved some form of religious ritual, in Athens the assembly, as primary legislative body, performed sacrifices before each meeting, discussed religious matters, and recorded its decisions on inscriptions that called directly on the gods. Therefore, Categorizing sacred law as something separate and distinct from non-sacred law runs the risk of misinterpreting Greek culture considerably. The interest in sacred law also shows how scholars have traditionally emphasized the text as the preeminent topic of investigation. In a sense, this is understandable given that these are some of the most discursive of inscriptions and they give a wealth of information, selective though this is, about what happened within specific cults. However, few discussions of this material assess the inscriptions as objects in their own right, taking into account their physicality outside of the standard epigraphic publication information. Nor do they assess their materiality, how they interact with the space in which they are set up and the people who move, d, within it, or how this might change over time, c, for example, Pretree 2011, Scott 2011. There are, of course, new approaches that move away from polycentered treatments and focus on topics such as gendered ritual, Osborne 2000, behavioral norms, Stavrinopoulou 2009, or the relationship between written texts and oral utterances, Hitch 2008, but even taking into account the wide range of evidence covered by the term sacred law, these inscriptions are considerably outnumbered by the more formulaic, and therefore less textually interesting, dedicatory inscriptions. Dedications themselves, on the other hand, do provide excellent evidence for thinking about inscriptions as objects as well as texts, and constitute a considerable body of evidence. Examination of the variations in language provides information about the ritual presentation of dedicatory activity and therefore people's relationships with the gods, Lazzarini 1976, but although vast numbers of votives were inscribed, most, such as, for example, fibulae, coins, or jewellery, were not, so we only know through examining their context why they were dedicated and by whom. See Philip 1981, Van Straten 1992, Comella 2002. Although there are, no doubt, exceptions, viewing inscribed dedications as a distinct group from uninscribed dedications is problematic in terms of understanding the practice itself rather than an aspect of that practice as represented by a particular type of object at a specific site for this, the epigraphical material must be seen alongside archaeological finds and iconographical interpretation. 
It should also be noted that much dedicatory activity, perhaps most, was of items not made of durable materials such as food, Kearns 1994, drink, Joanna 1992, or clothing, Cleland 2005, that is, things that do not readily survive. Epigraphic evidence, helpful though it is, can therefore only provide the most fleeting glimpse into this commonplace part of Greek religious life. One way in which questions about epigraphic evidence might be further developed is in exploring how the materiality of inscriptions shaped the ways in which people interacted with the text, that is, how the object itself provided contours for the ritual experience, Tilly 2007, 19. Dedications provide an obvious starting point because many of these include texts, but they are also objects with a physicality and presence within a sanctuary, and, as such, they embodied the rituals of their dedicators, or visitors to the sanctuary, or its priests. In some cases, writing itself was the dedication, for example the ABC Daria at the 7th century BCE Sanctuary of Zeus on Mount Hymettos in Attica, Langdon 1976. Raising questions about the materiality of inscriptions is important because it locates such epigraphic evidence within a variety of social and temporal networks, rather than viewing them as things divorced from their contexts, regarded simply as texts that deliver a message for historians to read. Foucault 2002, 1972, 118. Considering texts as objects alerts us to the ways in which the rituals they allude to were embodied and given meaning and how these meanings might change over time, Herkham 2007. What is not recorded by the epigraphic evidence, or what is lost, is arguably as important as what survives. Inscriptions can allude to aspects of cult practice that would otherwise remain unknown. But this is not the same as having evidence for that practice itself. The clothing catalogues of the sanctuary of Artemis Boronia in the east of Attica are a good example of this. These 4th century BCE inscriptions are immensely valuable for documenting women's dedications of clothing to the goddess, IG 2-1514-30. They demonstrate the range of clothes dedicated, specify their colours and patterns, and show, in some cases, that these are high-status items, Linda's 1972, Cleland 2005. As such, they give an insight into aspects of the cult otherwise unknown and allow archaeologists to repopulate the buildings of the sanctuary with people and their activities. However, the published inscriptions were not set up in the sanctuary at Boron itself, but on the Athenian Acropolis, where another sanctuary of Artemis was located, Linda's 1972, Rhodes and Dobbins 1979. Similar inventories, reportedly copies, have been found at Boron in the excavations of the 1950s, but they remain unpublished, SEG 37.30. Insofar as details of these have emerged, it seems that there are some differences between the two groups of inscriptions which might not be fully explained by patterns of survival. The Broran examples record dedications of utensils and furniture, SEG 37.34, whereas there is no surviving fragment from the Acropolis which records this type of material. The Broran inventories are supposed to date from 4165. The Archonship of Arimnestos, whereas the Acropolis inventories record dedications in the 340s, Linda's 1972, Pepas Delmusu 1988. Whilst it is possible to suggest reasons for these differences, and to use these to investigate the relationship between the two sanctuaries, Linda's 1972, the texts of the inventories themselves provide little information about the mechanics of dedication in contrast to the fact of those dedications, and the clothes, of course, do not survive. Because of the fragmentary nature of the lists it is difficult to tell how they were coordinated, whether they are comprehensive or recorded a fraction of the dedications, the best. Those from a certain group of women? Those located in a specific part of the sanctuary? Those moved elsewhere? We do not know how, or whether, the clothes themselves were displayed or whether they were buried in the sanctuary and therefore invisible to the visitor, recent archaeological discoveries, including wooden shoes found in 2011, suggest the latter as a possibility. We do not know whether these lists were supposed to be read, nor indeed who would be interested in reading them. 
We can only speculate about the reasons for the documentation of these items rather than other dedications that were numerous, terracotta statues, Mitsopolis Leon 2009, votive reliefs, Steinhauer 2001. Considering the context of display, and asking why and for whom inscriptions were set up, is crucial for understanding epigraphic evidence, and crucial for interpreting aspects of Greek religion. Thinking about epigraphic evidence, therefore, not just as texts on stones but as historical documents produced for specific, and sometimes opaque, reasons, as well as objects within a landscape, human, physical, or ritual, is essential for understanding inscriptions in general, and no less true for assessing religious practice or experience within the Greek world. It is also necessary to consider how inscriptions shape, and are shaped by, historiographical trends, and how they can be variously contextualized, by site, genre, time, size, reuse, etc. Following the organization of this handbook, the remainder of this chapter examines aspects of epigraphic evidence for Greek religion by asking three questions. What does the epigraphic material reveal about how Greeks negotiated religious power and authority? How was religious devotion expressed, or how was cult activity experienced? How did religious practice structure communities? These are necessarily selective topics, but they are chosen because they draw on three key themes of epigraphic interpretation, monumentality, commemoration, and connectivity across time and or space. These are not mutually exclusive categories but intricately intertwined, as will become clear below. Monumentality and authority As is evident from other chapters, religious authority in the ancient Greek world was not laid down by means of sacred texts, dogma, or priests, but was configured in a number of different ways, see, example, in this volume, Flower, Chapter 20. One of these was through the monumentalizing of decisions, processes, and religious practice through epigraphic display. Power and authority are negotiated in a variety of ways in inscriptions. They might demonstrate the power of the gods, the power of political authorities, the economic power of the sanctuaries themselves, or the social hierarchies of the people who used them. Evaluating the mechanisms by which inscriptions dealing with religious matters contribute to the negotiation of power structures in the ancient world is one clear way to approach them as evidence, but these mechanisms are, of course, varied and the reasons behind the setting up of these texts are also diverse. Without epigraphic evidence, the importance of regulating behaviour at festivals, maintaining the sacredness of sanctuary space, or detailing the sacrificial requirements for specific occasions would be much less clear to us. It is the monumentalization of regulations, rather than the fact that regulations existed, which allows us to know that, for example, women were required to wear modestly decorated, non-transparent clothes in the procession of the great gods at Andania during the 1st century BCE, IGV, 1390, Obden 2002, that it was not permitted to bring flowers or gold objects not intended for dedication into the sanctuary of Despoina at Lycosura in Arcadia, IGV, 2514, Lucas and Lucas 1994, 248-50. Or that the demi of Thoricos in Attica required the sacrifice of a tawny or black goat, lacking its age marking teeth to Dionysos in the month of Anthesterion, SEG 33.1 for 7, L.33 4, Lapu 2005, 139 to 41. But inscriptions allow us to do more than just fill in the gaps. They raise questions about the processes behind monumentalization, the choices made about what to include and what to exclude and the different ways in which power was negotiated and authority constructed within epigraphic texts. Monumentalization may suggest that many inscriptions that deal with matters of cult practice are concerned with power or authority in one form or another, but this is a generalization and the most important conclusions lie in the nuance. Religious authority was not only configured by regulation, it was configured by practice too, Kearns 1995, Hellstrom and Alroth 1996. Inscriptions may have played a role in shaping these practices, they may indeed have been a part of those practices, but they are not uncomplicated fossilizations of those practices. The regulations at Andania, for example, certainly give historians a sense of what was important for the cult to promote, but we cannot tell from the stone whether their interest in, 
For example, women's dress reflected a status quo of austerity that required legitimization or one of excessive consumption that needed curtailing, or whether there were different concerns at different times. The setting up of inscriptions may demonstrate the concerns of the religious authorities in Andania to ensure the mysteries were correctly performed, but we do not know the context of those concerns and, consequently, can interpret the responses in different ways. Cult regulations, therefore, show the contours of religious authority and how these might be expressed. However the issuing body, the fact of recording, the setting of a decision in stone, implies that the control of ritual practice was a motivating factor behind cult regulation. But there is not always a direct relationship between the publication of cult regulations and a desire to control cult practice, an examination of the relationship between orality and writing suggests a more complex connection between monumentalization and religious authority than first appears to be the case. On the surface, it seems that the monumentalization of decisions or regulations might be important so worshippers know the rules for a particular ritual, procession, or sacrifice. Monumental texts are often set up in prominent places, sometimes, though not always, within sanctuaries, allowing ready access to those who wish to consult them. But who, in a society in which religious knowledge was deeply embedded within everyday life, would have checked these texts to find information without knowing the answer in advance? As historians, we tend to use inscriptions as mines of information about what happened within a particular cult. But we are outsiders, we have limited prior cultural knowledge, apart from what we can piece together from other surviving pieces of evidence. This simply would not have been the case in the ancient world where this type of information was passed down orally, reinforced through practice, normalized and embedded into the framework of everyday life, Orfath 2005, Chaniotis 2009, 2010. We should not assume that writing was the primary form of exerting religious authority or that these texts do so in uncomplicated ways. Indeed, sometimes inscriptions may have been produced to give only very specific information, like costs and expenditure of sacrifice, to obscure knowledge by controlling access to it, or as a means of social control, Thomas 1989, Linda's 1992, Versnell 2002. They may be more concerned with, say, the demonstration of accountability, than with the dissemination of knowledge. The prosecution of Nicomachos, an Athenian charged with codifying and inscribing the laws at the end of the 5th century, which included a large number of cult regulations, demonstrates the sensitivity of writing down religious material, Lysias 30, Thomas 1996, Todd 1996, and it has been suggested that, during this period, writing was used more often in religious contexts by marginal groups, such as those following Orphic practices, Henrik's 2003. This might be correct as far as some texts go, although it rests, of course, on the centrality of polis religion as the definitional paradigm through which marginality is created, a position which this handbook challenges. But the regular recording of names on dedications and grave epigrams, or the use of inscribed inventories within a range of sanctuaries, demonstrates that writing was not considered problematic in every context. Associating oneself personally with a written text through naming was not marginal at all but incredibly frequent, and practiced, as far as we can tell, by a very wide cross-section of ancient society. Marginality, it seems, is in the eye of the beholder. Writing appears to have an important place within certain types of ritual behavior, but examination of cursing, for example, demonstrates that the exertion of authority though writing in religious contexts need not take a monumental form. Placing a curse on someone aimed to affect a change in a person's behavior, it was therefore conceived of as a repositioning of the networks of power of daily life. As far as we can tell, cursing was most likely a secretive, or rather, semi-secretive practice. It was not the reading of the tablet itself which exerted control over the targets of the curse, but instead the knowledge of it disseminated through rumor, gossip, or threats which held power for the writer, Idenau 2007. The objects on which the texts are recorded, those which survive are found mostly on lead tablets although other materials were used are a key part of the ritual behavior, their materiality sometimes, though not always, mirrors the evocation of the curse, 
their deposition highlights the phonic nature of the deities called upon, Idinau and Taylor 2010. The practice of writing is clearly part of this ritual, but reading the tablet after deposition is not central to its effect. The division between writers and readers is a useful distinction that can be applied to monumental texts too. Who the audience, or the audiences, for such inscriptions was primarily intended to be or whether they were important at all for the writers of the texts is very much open for debate. But it makes a difference to our view of ritual behaviour and experience whether the people taking part in the rituals were supposed to read those inscriptions and act accordingly as opposed to others located in a different time or space, the monument as display, or even the gods themselves, the monument as symbol. That is, it makes a difference whether authority was configured through the practice of writing itself, rather than the practice of reading the texts, performing the rituals, or interacting with the inscriptions in other ways. We return again to questions about the materiality of inscriptions, the sensory perception of these objects, in addition, or as opposed, to the text, might be a key part of the religious experience, a powerful reminder of the authority of the gods, a physical symbol of a visit to the sanctuary or participation in a festival. Monumentality, therefore, intersects with questions of authority on multiple different levels. It is sensitivity to the epigraphic habit, the location of writing and reading within a culture that prized orality, and the physical, material, and spatial contexts of inscriptions that allows these questions to be explored. Commemoration and Devotion Religious devotion was articulated in a number of ways from dedication to sacrifice, prayer, music, and dance. It is in this sphere, however, where the gap between recorded practice and actual practice is probably the greatest. Performance of rites and their commemoration are not the same thing. Inscriptions are not merely snapshots of sacrifices, dedications, or prayers, but a commemoration of specific and selective aspects of these practices. This is clearest, and most frequently discussed, with regard to funerary rituals. Inscribed grave stelae do not simply indicate who was deceased, but present them in ways that more often than not highlight and very often seek to enhance their social status. Maya 1993, Sigali's 2008. These are not clear-cut reproductions of the deceased's place within the world, they are representations of it, with all the selectivity that this implies. In sum, our knowledge of large parts of Greek religion is mediated through commemorative practice, see further, in this volume, Edmonds, chapter 37, and Vutira's, chapter 27. It is, of course, not only funerary rituals where this is the case. Other forms of religious devotion also show the gap between performance of rituals and their commemoration. Inscribed prayers, for example, do not record the actual speaking of a request, but commemorate a particular moment within the communication between human and divine, of which the surviving text is just one part. Prayer is a way of requesting action, part of a process, of which the epigraphic recording of words is just one aspect and which is completed with the dedication of a votive offering, Depew 1997. The writing down of a prayer is not, however, necessary for its effectiveness, it is a part of the interaction chosen for commemoration, an alternative or an addition to the thank offering. Likewise, inscribed hymns record selective aspects of religious song, they record the words rather than its music, the movement it inspires, or the oral impact on the audience for whom it is performed. They are inscribed to commemorate the performance of the song at a particular event and provide a focal point for future generations to remember past rituals, Alonge 2008. They are not inscribed as an aid memoir for future performance and should not be treated by historians as such. Selectivity is, therefore, a key part of commemoration. But so is temporality. Commemoration lengthens the temporal impact of a selected aspect of a ritual from a single moment in time and makes it visible across time and space. Viewing inscriptions as commemorative objects therefore raises questions about their potential as sites of cultural memory, and emphasizes that they were often points of interaction between people, objects, and texts, rather than just stones which passively recorded rituals. Conaton 1989. This shifts the focus from the writing of a text to its reception that is, the inscription's impact, not only within the immediate context of its ritual production, 
but also how it shaped responses to ritual practice and experience. Here, we see ways in which highly personal forms of religious devotion are cross-cut by, and indeed in themselves shape, structures of authority. Examination of the personal experience of religious practice is a key development in recent scholarship, Purvis 2003, in Stone 2009, Kint 2012. Epigraphically, this can be investigated in many ways, for example, by examining mark-making in the form of name inscriptions and drawn images. This is an important and ubiquitous form of religious expression, seen most clearly, for example, in the inscribing of Jewish or Christian symbols, Chaniotis 2002. Footprint drawings might be seen in a similar light, and show, incidentally, that epigraphic communication is not always bound up in the text. Although there are a variety of explanations for the appearance of inscribed footprints, it is likely that, in some contexts, they commemorated epiphanies, Cotting 1983, Dunbabin 1990. Direct interaction with the divine through epiphany is an intense and personal experience worthy of recording, but commemoration of it does not always require expression in a literate or textual form, MacDonald 2005, Webster 2008, in general, Harris 1995. It has the potential, however, of having a significant impact on an individual and the community, see, for example, SIG 3398, which describes the intervention of Apollo in Kos. Inscriptions appear not infrequently on cult buildings, although often in very specific places, taking the form of prayers, invocations, or names. A number of examples come from Egypt, where Greeks inscribed their names and prayers on religious shrines as a means of demonstrating their presence and piety through pilgrimage, Nactigel 1999. Rutherford 2003, Mayors 2011, but this is a phenomenon which is visible across the Greek world from Athens to Thasos to Asia Minor. Examples are known from Aphrodisias, Lagina, and Sagalassos. In some of these cases, Thasos, Athens, Lagina, the inscriptions form clusters of numerous names, in others only single names are found, Sagalassos. These demonstrate the importance of commemorating presence within a cultic environment, they are a personal manifestation of piety much like the Mnest formula prayers, which request remembrance of, usually, a named individual to a god, on not reading such texts as vandalism, see Baird and Taylor 2011. These occur commonly in the Greek East, appearing not only in sanctuaries, but also in private homes as well as in public spaces, Rem 1940, Baird 2011. The expression of religious devotion through writing and mark-making may take different forms in different places at different times, but it clearly permeated a wide variety of Greek societies and was an important, if overlooked, aspect of religious expression. Considering aspects of commemorative practice is important if we wish to understand the relationship between the production, maintenance, or reuse of inscriptions, or even their destruction, and their role in, and contribution to our knowledge of, Greek religious practice. The texts recorded by inscriptions are not isolated from the practices, beliefs, or cultural impulses of people in the Greek world and should not be seen as such. It is commemoration, rather than the transmission of knowledge, which underlines the choices made when recording a text on a stone or another object. Inscriptions rarely record why a sigentlic usonist. Connectivity, religion, people, and place. In recent years, historians have stressed the ways in which inscriptions connect people and places together. This is not simply in terms of what the texts say and the mental maps created through the genres they construct, but in terms of where they are set up, their symbolic value, through the process of writing, and the politics of display. Scott 2011, Shear 2011, Taylor 2011, see also, in this volume, Constantakopoulou, Chapter 19. Epigraphic religious practice created and maintained social ties, actively sought to link with the past and mediate the future, and positioned groups, religious and secular, with regard to others. Large numbers of inscriptions take the form of lists, which demonstrate some of these themes. Lists record financial contributions of worshippers at sanctuaries, Midget 1992, Temple Accounts and Inventories, Davies 2001, Names of Priests, Fraser 1953, or membership of religious communities, 
on Otaglu 2003. As such, they detail the diversity of personnel involved in Greek cults as participants, contributors, and officials. In some cases, these involve financial transactions between, or donations from, members of the local community to a cult. At the sanctuary of Athana Lindia in Lindos, an inscription recording those who contributed to the restoration of cultic objects, decoration for the cult statue, receptacles used in ritual, was erected in the last quarter of the 4th century BCE, IG 12, 1764 equals Lindos 251, Midget 1992, number 39. This is a long document, displayed on both sides of a large stele are the names of over 250, perhaps as many as 300, donors, arranged according to locality, that is, by demi, including some women and children. No financial information about the donation is given here, but lists such as these frequently reveal this information and so indicate the mechanisms behind the economics of cult, often they detail how much each person has donated to the upkeep of the sanctuary or festival, see, for example, IG 12, 91189, in which contributions range from 10 to 700 drachmas for the restoration of the sanctuary of Artemis Procioa in Histiaea at the end of the 2nd century BCE, Midget 1992, 191-4. The fact that specific financial information is not recorded here might indicate that equal contributions were made by all the participants, or perhaps that donations took the form of objects, vases and decorations, rather than money. However, the fact that these details are not specified also serves to divert attention from the transactions themselves and focuses it instead on those who made the contributions. In this way it foreshadows the Lindian Chronicle, an inscription set up in the same sanctuary 200 years later, written as an historical inventory of dedications, Higby 2003. As Scott has pointed out, the dedications recorded here no longer existed by the time the inscription was made. The inscription constructs a version of the Lindian past in which dedication to the sanctuary located Lindos within historical networks of power and in which the people are more important than the things. Scott 2011, 246. In a similar way, our list, Lindos 251, emphasizes the people contributing to the sanctuary and their relationships to one another rather than the financial value of their contributions. The large number of families recorded here, fathers and sons, brothers, wives, children, roots participation in cult within membership of the community and stresses the importance of family ties within this context, sometimes brothers even contribute together. The inscription therefore not only honours the contributors for their donations, providing encouragement for the future, but, at the same time, embeds, at least this, cult activity within the family and the demi. Visitors to the sanctuary would have clearly seen a family's piety through this inscription. It is families and local communities that provide the structure for participation in religious activity here. Lists like these, therefore, raise questions about display and where to locate that display in various networks, temporal, historical, communal, etc. They also highlight the community relationships that lay behind, indeed shaped, religious experience. As objects they form visual connections with other inscriptions at the sanctuary, commemorating the contributions made to the cult and providing an honorific environment for those to be remembered. Not only do lists like these preserve information for the future, but they also present a version of past Lindian society to which local families can easily link themselves by recognizing their ancestors' contributions. Inclusion on such lists is also a way to demonstrate belonging, to highlight social bonds within a community, or perhaps exclude groups from it. Lindos 251 does not include foreigners amongst the donors, and there is a high correlation between the demis of these contributors and those within roads which were politically powerful. Bresson 1988. As such, epigraphic evidence like this shows how religious practice both created and defined communities, reinforced local hierarchies, and provided a forum for negotiating social networks and social status. Conclusion Albert Henriks describes the bulk of religious inscriptions as centrifugal in that they reach beyond the ritual realm into adjacent areas of polis life or because they deal with aspects of Greek religion which are peripheral, marginal or highly personal, 
Henrik's 2003, 44. Whilst there are certainly inscriptions that fit this description, perhaps it is necessary to redefine what is considered central about Greek religion according to the epigraphic evidence tout court rather than according to the disembodied texts they convey. Our knowledge of the epigraphic habit, and the questions this raises about monumentality, commemoration, and display, as well as temporal, spatial, and social connectivity, allows us to investigate this diverse material from a variety of angles. The diversity of epigraphic evidence mirrors the diversity of practice of religion in the Greek world, but it also reflects the diversity of personnel involved. It is no surprise, then, that there are many different ways to analyze this material, but, at the very minimum, it is necessary to interrogate epigraphic evidence both as historical writing in its own right and as objects that have material properties. Inscriptions do not uncomplicatedly record what happened in Greek cults, but they certainly provide a wealth of information about the variety of aspects of Greek religion if we ask the right questions of them. Suggested reading The annual publication of the Epigraphic Bulletin for Greek Religion, EBGR, in the journal Kernos is indispensable, as is the Supplementum Epigraphicum Greekum, SEG, now available online. Epigraphic handbooks, such as John Boddell's Epigraphic Evidence, Ancient History from Inscriptions or A. G. Woodhead's The Study of Greek Inscriptions, give general advice on how to access, use, and interpret inscriptions. B. H. McLean's An Introduction to Greek Epigraphy of the Hellenistic and Roman Periods contains useful discussions of religious inscriptions with many examples, as does M. Garducci's El Epigraphia Greca dol Origini Altardo Impero, in Italian, and archaeological site reports often include a volume, or volumes, on inscriptions, for example, the inscriptions de Delos. Collections of texts, such as Sokolowski's Lois Sacris des Sites Grec and Lois Sacris de L.A.C. Mineur are so frequently referred to that they have their own abbreviations, LSCG, LSAM, expanded and updated by Lapu, Greek Sacred Law, abbreviated as NGSL2. There are numerous inscriptions concerned with religious matters to be found in volumes such as Meigs and Lewis, ML, or Rhodes and Osborne, R.O. Chapter 9 Material Evidence Caitlin E. Barrett Introduction A rich material record and fine-grained chronology make the ancient Mediterranean a particularly productive setting for the archaeology of religion. Although synthetic studies of Greek religion have historically been largely text-based, newer studies increasingly embrace a more integrated approach, engaging material evidence seriously, compared to Kint 2011-2012. The study of material evidence for Greek religion appears to presuppose some consensus on the understanding of at least three terms, Greek, religion, and material evidence. However, as this chapter and this volume, chapters 1 to 4, demonstrate, all of those terms become increasingly slippery on closer investigation. The archaeology of Greek religion is so wide-ranging that it is difficult to isolate one set of dominant trends and any two scholars might make different selections, compared to the areas of current debate in Kint 2011, 701-5. The following discussion emphasizes contemporary developments in the archaeology of Greek religion that echo certain themes in the present volume. 1. Reassessing received definitions of Greek religion. 2. Adopting a broader chronological perspective, including the Hellenistic period. And, 3. Re-evaluating the polis religion model as formulated by Savinian Wood 2000A, 2000B. The identification of material culture as religious and, if religious, as evidence for specifically Greek religion is often contentious. Much recent literature addresses the archaeological identification of religious sites and ritual activity, while also reconsidering the complicated relationship of ritual to religion, see the section The Archaeology of Religion, History and Theory for References. Additionally, another area of burgeoning research, the study of continuity and transformation in Hellenistic religion illustrates the complexity inherent in describing religious practices as Greek. Throughout the eastern Mediterranean and beyond, Greco-Macedonian dynasties came to rule foreign populations, reshaping not only the borders of the Greek world but also the nature of Greek religion. As far afield as Sudan and Afghanistan, 
Greeks and others employed Hellenizing religious artifacts and architecture. Burstein 1993, Mayers 2007, forthcoming, Torok 2011, and people who considered themselves Hellenes engaged with a diverse array of foreign religious traditions, from Egyptian and Near Eastern cults to Buddhism, e.g. Scott 1985, Barrett 2011, Kloppenborg and Askoff 2011, 26 to 33, 211 to 17. Such developments problematize the concept of Greek religion, requiring critical analysis of the phenomenon of syncretism, Shaw and Stewart 1994, Clack 2011, and the relationship of religion to cultural and ethnic identities. Additionally, archaeological interrogations of the nature and boundaries of ancient Greek religion complement recent reassessments of the polis model of cult, on which, see Kint 2009, Rives 2010, 268 to 76, Idenau 2011, Kint 2012. Material evidence for household and/or personal rituals, such as domestic cult or magical rites, demonstrates the complexity of cultic relationships between individual, household, and polis and the Hellenistic period saw civic cult adapt to new socio-political contexts, as many polis surrendered their autonomy to kings. Beyond these developments, others might be noted. Numerous studies integrate material and textual data to reconsider specific aspects of Greek religion. For example, divine images' nature and functions continue to undergo much scrutiny, e.g. Platt 2011, Gaithman 2012, as does the interrelationship of magic and religion, a topic whose full bibliography is too extensive to cite here, but note the appearance of four major new books within the past decade, Idenau 2007, Collins 2008, Kint 2012, 90-122, Wilburn 2012. Similarly, broadening traditional images of Greek religion is a growing focus on sacred space beyond the sanctuary, from household cult to sacral landscapes, See contextualizing sacred space, mapping, remote sensing, and landscape-based approaches. Material culture provides rich evidence on these and many other topics in Greek religion, but to make sense of that evidence, interpretation remains necessary at every stage of the archaeological process. Accordingly, this chapter not only surveys developments in the field, but also examines some methodological and theoretical challenges in interpreting material culture. Illustrating some of these challenges are two case studies focusing on the contextual analysis of terracotta figurines, one from a sanctuary on Hellenistic Delos, and one from a refuse deposit in classical Athens. These case studies also illustrate some benefits that arise from reconsidering the category of Greek religion, especially through more thorough incorporation of Hellenistic data, re-evaluation of the polis model, and contextualization of ritual actions within specific religious settings. Materials and data. In addition to rich textual data, this volume, chapters 6 to 8, Ancient Greek Religion boasts a material record incorporating, inter alia, religious sites, artifacts, iconography, regional survey data, and ancient botanical, faunal, and human remains. However, the relationship of this data to ancient religious practices and beliefs is frequently less than straightforward. Religious sites range from the relatively obvious, e.g. sanctuaries with monumental temples, see, in this volume, Scott, chapter 16, to the archaeologically near-invisible, e.g. sacred groves with few or no built structures, Bridge 1982, 1992, 85-99, Conan 2007. While regional surveys help counteract scholarly biases towards large, visible temple sites, See contextualizing sacred space, mapping, remote sensing, and landscape-based approaches, some types of ancient sacred space remain archaeologically undetectable. For example, many household rituals probably occurred in multifunctional settings where they would leave few archaeological traces, compared to Jameson 1990A, 104-6, 1990B, 192-5. The supposed centre of domestic ritual, the hearth, is often difficult to locate archaeologically, and may frequently have consisted of little more than a portable brazier, Jameson 1990A, 105-6, 1990B, 193, Sarkergis 2007, 230. 
The use of artifacts or ecofacts as evidence for ancient religion requires similar unpacking. Objects that functioned primarily as religious implements, say, the sistra, sacred rattling instruments, used in Hellenistic Roman adaptations of the Isis cult, may be readily identifiable. However, many objects could function in both religious and practical contexts, for example, a craftsman might dedicate his tools at a temple, transforming them into votives, Van Straten 1981, 92-6. In such situations, archaeological context is essential to interpretation. Accordingly, the material evidence for ancient Greek religion is rich, but not transparent. Interpretation is necessary at every stage of the archaeological process, requiring careful grounding in archaeological theory and methodology. The Archaeology of Religion, History and Theory Awareness of archaeological theory can help scholars become conscious of their own interpretive biases, an important consideration when studying religious practices in cultures distant from one's own. This section, therefore, surveys several major theoretical developments in the 20th century and 21st century archaeology of religion, with special attention to their applications in classical archaeology. At its origins, classical archaeology focused less on theory and methodology than on acquiring beautiful objects. Elite Renaissance collectors adorned their homes with ancient artworks, and, by the 18th century, interest in ancient art inspired excavation at sites like Pompeii and Herculaneum. The 19th-early 20th centuries saw the development of modern archaeological field techniques, including the stratigraphic method of excavation, some of whose pioneers in classical archaeology included Giuseppe Fiorelli at Pompeii and Heinrich Schliemann at Troy. In the 1960 divided by 1970s, many scholars advocated for a so-called new archaeology. This processualist movement positioned archaeology as an anthropological science, testing hypotheses through deductive reasoning to discover laws of human behavior, Binford 1962, 1972, 84, 89 to 100, Watson, LeBlanc, and Redmond 1971, Watson 1976. This movement encouraged certain methodological advances but fostered relatively little research on ancient religion. Many processualists focused on culture's ecologically adaptive aspects, downplaying religion's active ability to shape society. See Critique in Insul 2004 A, 46 to 51. In the 1980 divided by 1990s, a generation of post-processual archaeologists critiqued the processualist project. Many post-processualists viewed archaeology as a social science or art, dark 1995, 19-24, conceptualizing material culture as a text to interpret, Hodder 1992, Hodder and Hudson 2003. This humanistic orientation facilitated more work on ancient symbolism, ideology, and religion, Prusel and Hodder 1996, 299-412. However, some post-processualists' skepticism of the possibility of obtaining objective truth about the past made it harder to formulate rigorous methodologies for empirical study, see critiques in Cole 1993, 16, ran from 1994b, 3-5. The processualist movement and post-processualist critique originated largely in New World and prehistoric archaeology, but many classical archaeologists came to engage with research questions and methodologies associated with these movements. See recent overviews in Whitley 2001, 12 to 16, 42 to 59, Kint 2011, 699 to 700. One of the most important recent movements in the archaeology of ritual and religion developed partly from an Eugenist's response to the processualist post processualist debate. Colin Renfrew's excavations at a Bronze Age Cycladic shrine inspired his influential attempt to systematize the archaeological identification of ritual sites, 1985, 1994 a, 2007, Renfrew and Barn 1991, 408 9. Contributing to the development of the cognitive archaeology or cognitive processual movement, Renfrew 1985, 1994 A, Renfrew and Zubro 1994, Flannery and Marcus 1996. Seeking to articulate methodologically rigorous ways to study their ancient mind, cognitive archaeology addresses topics often absent from processual archaeology, 
but maintains a realist philosophical stance, ran for 1994b. 4. 10. The past two decades have witnessed a great proliferation of scholarship on the archaeology of ritual both within and beyond the Mediterranean, much of it engaging directly or indirectly with Renfrew's work, see Insul 2011, with extensive bibliography, and now Wessler 2012. The checklist format of Renfrew's method for identifying religious sites has attracted some critique, Insul 2004a, 96-7, Kint 2011, 699. Additionally, as Renfrew himself notes, 1985, 22, his guidelines are better suited to sanctuary than domestic cult, they emphasize sites and rituals clearly separated from everyday routine, as critiqued in Insul 2004a, 97, Fogel in 2007, 59-61. In contrast, Insul, 2004a, 2004b, argues for the embeddedness of religion within daily life a perspective we might consider particularly appropriate with regard to the Greek experience, given the absence of any ancient Greek term corresponding in all particulars to religion. Much recent research also builds on Renfrew's work by further exploring the complex relationships between ritual and religion. As many scholars note, not all rituals need be religious, e.g. Kyriakides 2007. Verhoeven 2011, Elsner 2012, and rituals should be understood in the context of a broader spectrum of ritualizations, Bell 1992, 1997. The material record of Greek religion provides a rich data set for testing different theoretical perspectives, compared to Renfrew 1980, 296 to 7, Snodgrass 1987, 3, and developing new approaches. Classical archaeologists thus have much to offer, not only to the study of Greek religion, but to archaeology as a discipline. Methodologies Just as the theoretical frameworks we bring to the data will shape our interpretations of ancient Greek religion, so will our choice of methodological tools influence the types of data available to us. The past few decades have seen significant expansion and refinement of methodologies for survey, remote sensing, excavation, an object analysis. Within the vast topic of archaeological methodologies for the study of Greek religion, the following discussion will concentrate on three themes. 1. Mapping and landscape-based approaches to sacred space. 2. Object-based approaches to ancient ritual actions. And 3. The importance of archaeological context. At any religious site, archaeologists' methodological choices will profoundly shape the amount, nature, and quality of the resulting data, with important implications for those data's use as evidence for ancient cult. Contextualizing sacred space, mapping, remote sensing, and landscape-based approaches. Popular perceptions of archaeology often emphasize excavation, but archaeologists also examine the ancient landscape through less invasive means. Landscape-based and mapping-based approaches generate data on patterns of spatial use both at the level of the individual religious site and the broader level of the sacral landscape. A range of tools provide data on the organization of sacred space, within the sanctuary and beyond, and help situate individual religious sites within broader spatial and temporal frameworks. Remote sensing can detect buried features without excavation, providing a broad picture of sites layout and history. Such techniques have been productive at numerous ancient Mediterranean religious sites. Magnetometry, for example, can reveal plans of sanctuaries and burial complexes, e.g. Aspinall, Gaffney, and Schmidt 2008, 162-5, Herbert 2009. Other useful remote sensing methods include resistivity survey, ground-penetrating radar, Gaffney and Gator 2003, aerial photography, and satellite data, Parkak 2009. The broad geographical scope of another technique, surface survey, helps contextualize individual sanctuaries within larger landscapes. For ancient Greek religion, surface survey has revealed regional and chronological changes in patterns of sanctuary use, Alcock 1994, Kint 2011, 698, and uncovered small rural sanctuaries, traditionally underrepresented in scholarly literature, Catling 1990, Alcock 1994. 254. Geological surveys provide another type of data on ancient religious landscapes, 
helping situate sanctuaries within their physical environment. For example, at Delphi, geological evidence has fueled debates on the existence of psychoactive subterranean gases, a controversy with implications for the functioning of the Delphic Oracle, Lahu 2007, Picardi, Monti, Vaselli, Tassi, Garkipapanastasha, and Papanastasha 2008. Finally, a valuable opportunity for relating sacred sites to broader sacral landscapes comes from software for integrating, visualizing, and analyzing data from survey, remote sensing, and excavation. Geographic Information Systems, GAS, provides a powerful tool for spatial analysis, enabling archaeologists not only to map sites, but to generate and test hypotheses about the ancient landscape, e.g. Wheatley and Gillings 2002, Connolly and Lake 2006. Another potentially helpful tool is 3D modeling, recently employed for the Sanctuary of the Great Gods at Samothrace to investigate the effects of architecture and topography on initiates' experiences, Westcote, Thayer, and Harrington forthcoming. From objects to rituals. Another type of data, suited to a different range of research questions, comes from studying individual objects. While the artifacts that best captured early researchers' attention were often beautiful or monumental, Modern archaeology places equal weight on unimposing objects like pottery sherds or animal bones. The resulting broader range of available data helps provide a more comprehensive picture of Greek ritual behaviours. A variety of evidence may help us associate individual artefacts or ecofacts with ancient religious practices. An object's archaeological context may suggest religious functions, for example, Botanical remains from the Sami and Hiraean were probably floral offerings, Kukun 2000, 105. Textual or iconographic evidence may indicate certain objects used during religious rituals, as with artistic depictions of figures pouring libations from Fialai. Alternatively, the iconography on an object itself may portray ritual activities, as with terracotta figurines depicting festival processions, for which, see Ballet 2000, 99 to 100. Archaeometry and archaeological science can also help connect artifacts and ecofacts to ancient rituals. For example, faunal analysis of sacrificial and feasting remains may inform about the origins and practice of Greek animal sacrifice, Hamalakis and Consolaki 2004, Naden 2012, 57 to 63, compared to Insul 2004 A, 71 to 6, see also, in this volume, Naden, Chapter 31. Archaeobotany can reveal plant offerings at religious sites, tipping 1994, Kukun 2000, 105, or investigate the origins of unprovenanced objects of cult, Chester 2009. Residue analysis of ritual vessels may expose substances used in divine offerings, consumed in feasts, or deposited as grave goods, Hodos 2006, 117. Osborne 2007, 88, Sadakis, Mart Liu, and Jones 2008. Archaeometric approaches like archaeometallurgy and ceramic petrography, among others, provide further data on ritual objects production, distribution, and consumption, helping situate rites within broader economic and social frameworks. Archaeological context Finally, an understanding of archaeological context is essential to connecting physical remains to religious activities. Archaeological context has three major components, matrix, the sediment around an object, provenience, the object's location in three-dimensional space, and association, the object's spatial relationship to other artifacts, features, and ecofacts. Archaeologists must further determine whether artifacts come from primary or secondary contexts, and what natural and cultural formation processes shaped those deposits, Schiffer 1987. In situ deposits, or de facto assemblages, were left behind when people abandoned an activity area, Schiffer 1987, 89-97, Alt and Nevet 1999. More common are refuse deposits, which Schiffer, 1972, 161, 1987, 58, divides into primary refuse, deposited at the location of use, and secondary refuse, deposited elsewhere. Stripped of archaeological context, ritual objects may retain their aesthetic qualities, 
but we cannot know how people actually use them. Looting and undocumented digging irretrievably deprive artifacts of their human connection, that is, the contextual data associating objects with people. Case Studies in Contextual Interpretation As case studies in contextual analysis, let us examine two terracotta figurines from very different contexts, one from a discard context in the classical Athenian Agora, and one from the Samothrakian on Hellenistic Delos. The following discussion uses these figurines to illustrate several themes emphasized earlier. 1. The reassessment of received definitions of religion in general, and Greek religion in particular. 2. The value of a broader chronological perspective on Greek religion, including the Hellenistic period. And 3. The ongoing reassessment of the polis model of Greek religion. The examination of these figurines also illustrates several theoretical and methodological points including the importance of contextual analysis, the informational value of seemingly minor small finds, and the necessity of situating individual religious locations within broader landscapes. Description of the objects The first figurine to be examined, figure 9.1, comes from a 5th-4th century BCE discard context in the Athenian Agora, Inventory NR Agora T4128 previously published in Nichols 1995, number 51, PL 106. Agora T4128 preserves the upper portion of a hollow, double-molded terracotta figurine, height, 64.0 mm. The fragment shows the head and chest of a round-faced, seemingly nude, female with large, exaggerated facial features, wearing a floral wreath. Her pose is that of a reclining banqueter, the angles of head, neck, and shoulder suggest a reclining posture, and a slight protrusion below the breasts may represent an object, cup, in the left hand. Her hair's shortness suggests slavery. Knife scraped vertical striations on her neck evoke age. The fabric is fine and brown, with occasional sand inclusions. The top of a rectangular vent appears on the roughly modelled backside, which preserves a speck of pink paint. Traces of white undercoating survive on front and back. Image Figure 9.1 Fragment of a terracotta figurine of a reclining female, from a well in the Athenian Agora, 5th-4th cent BCE, Athenian Agora T4128. Photograph, C. E. Barrett. Nichols, 1995, 439-41, identifies this figurine as an aged Hetaira courtesan, possibly a character from theatrical performances. Vases depict Hitairi reclining at banquets, Kirky 1997, 135-7, and some classical and Hellenistic terracottas portray Hitairi, masks of Hitairi, or actors dressed as Hitairi, e.g. Hart 2010, number 62, 66, 89, 90, G. Met 2010, number 119. The second figurine, Figure 9.2, comes from the 2nd 1st century BCE Samothrakian on Delos. This object, Delos Museum Inventory No. A 1758, represents the head of a hollow, double-molded male figurine, published most recently in Barrett 2011, 279-84, 385-91, 471. The head, height, 46.6 mm, is round and bald with creased, furrowed brow, large mouth, and flat, broad nose. Atop his head are two lotus buds, common on Egyptian figurines of child gods such as Harpocrates. The mouth is partially open, and a preserved neck fragment suggests a tilted head, parallels suggest the figure may be dancing or singing, Barrett 2011, 247, 260 to 1. The semifine coarse brown fabric is consistent with an Egyptian Nile silt, possibly limestone tempered, Barrett 2011, 83 to 7. Traces of white coating are visible. This terracotta also has close iconographic parallels in Greco Roman Egypt, where such figurines appear to represent indigenous deities and or priests. The bald head and furrowed brow evoke the features of the so called Patikos, a dwarf form of the Memphite creator god Partar and the lotus buds suggest Partar, Patiko's occasional syncretism with Harpocrates. 
Similar facial features and lotus buds also characterize Egyptian figurines of cult officiants dancing or carrying divine statues. Barrett 2011. 260. 270 to 84. Image. Figure 9.2 head of a terracotta figurine of a bald male crowned with two lotus buds, from the Samothrakian on Delos, 2nd 1st cent BCE, Delos Museum A 1758. Photograph C. E. Barrett. Copyright Hellenic Republic, Ministry of Culture and Sports, General Directorate of Antiquities and Culture Heritage 21st Ephorate of Prehistoric and Classical Antiquities. For permission to examine the two figurines discussed in this article, I thank John Camp, Athenian Agora, Panayotis Hatsidakis, Delos Museum, and Dominique Mulliers, a Col Francaise d'Athens. I also thank Veronique Chankowski and Catherine Pottet de Bell for access to the IFA archives. Context Linking artifacts to religious practice. Both figurines can serve as test cases for the archaeological identification of evidence for Greek religion. How do we identify an artifact as religious? Are either or both of these figurines religious objects? If so, how and why, and to what degree is that religion Greek? Archaeological context provides a necessary link between artifact and practice, enabling us to link one figurine to religious practices while suggesting that the second may never actually have seen ritual use. Yet, even for the figurine demonstrably used in a religious context, questions remain, in what ways is that religion Greek, and what are the cultural boundaries of Greek religion? Although scholars often associate terracotta figurines with popular cult, iconography alone provides little solid evidence connecting either figurine to Greek religious practice. The Athenian figurine's sympotic and possible theatrical associations could be taken to evoke a Dionysiac sphere, while the Delian figurine's imagery recalls Egyptian deities and priests. However, consumers might have valued such objects for many possible reasons. To investigate their uses, including any role in actual religious practice, we need to move from iconography to archaeological context. In only one case, the Delian figurine, does archaeological context suggest actual cultic use? Despite its Egyptian manufacture, this object derives from the Samothrakian on Hellenistic Delos. Site reports and field notes suggest the figurine was in situ, Shapathir 1935, 87, Barrett 2011, 386-7, and probably served as a votive offering, compared to, on votive figurines, Alroth 1988. The Athenian figurine, in contrast, comes from a disposal context, a well in the Agora, Sheer 1975, 359, Nichols 1995. The well's upper fill contained a large deposit of choroplastic material, at least 21 figurines, one archetype, and at least 40 terracotta molds, Nichols 1995, 405, all displaying a wide range of iconographic types, Nichols 1995, 413, 476 to 84. The presence of production materials, molds, archetype, and discards, unfinished, damaged pieces, suggests workshop debris, and many molds share distinctive technical features indicative of a single workshop. Nichols 1995, 409, 412, 482. Accordingly, this deposit probably contains a choroplastic workshop's debris. The analysis of such debris provides much evidence on figurine production, but less on consumption or use. The figurines in this deposit never reached consumers, they were discarded after production, perhaps because of manufacturing flaws, or a lack of buyers or the workshop going out of business. Had it found a consumer, this figurine might well have wound up in a range of possible religious contexts. Figurines with similar iconography appear at sanctuary sites, e.g. Eleusis, Nichols 1995, 439 N, 162, or in Graves, Hart 2010, number 62. However, other functions are also possible, and different potential buyers might have made different choices for the object's use. In contrast, the Delian figurine clearly derives from a religious use context, but here we encounter complications concerning that context's supposed Greekness. The figurine comes from a sanctuary in the heart of the Cyclades, on an island sacred to Apollo, 
but, by Hellenistic times, that island also had a large foreign population and an extremely cosmopolitan, international cultural milieu. The sanctuary in question served deities long worshipped by Greeks, but possibly of non-Greek origins. Worshippers at the Delian Samothrakian seemingly identified the Samothracian Megalotheo with the Kabiroi, an identification attested to elsewhere in antiquity, Bruno 1970, 379 to 90, 395, Cole 1984, 78 to 9, Barrett 2011, N 1583. But the origins of both Samothracian gods and Kabiroi remain disputed, with non-Greek origins sometimes suggested for both. HDT 2.51 diode. Sick 5.47.23 Cole 1984 10 Barrett 2011 N 1601. Complicating matters further, the figurine itself appears thoroughly Egyptian in iconography and manufacture. In what respects, then? Does this artifact attest to a specifically Greek religion? Other artifacts associated with A1758 similarly problematize the borders of Greek religion. Another terracotta figurine from the Samothrakian also draws on Egyptian religious iconography, representing the Egyptian dwarf god Bees, Barrett 2011, 275-8. Two additional figurines are hunchbacked, possibly dwarfish figure and a dog wearing a bulla may also evoke parallels from Greco-Roman Egypt, Barrett 2011, 384-6, where their imagery could suggest a range of possible associations, from religious ritual to daily life, see, e.g. Bhutan in 2014, 217-35 on the multivalent iconography of dog figurines. Unlike the imported A1758, however, all three of these figurines have local clay fabrics, Barrett 2011, 81, suggesting they were produced on Delos itself. Furthermore, they share the sanctuary with a range of figurines whose iconography is much more traditionally Greek, including images of Aphrodite, Hermes, a lion, horses, and various human figures without divine attributes, Shapathir 1935, 87, Lormania 1956, 15. Indeed, a 1758's dedication at a Delian sanctuary of the Megalotheoi Kabiroi may suggest conscious negotiation between originally distinct religious traditions. Much remains unknown about the mystery cults of the Samothracian gods and Kabiroi, but the Kabiroi appear sometimes to be portrayed as dwarfs or pygmies, Burke at 1985, 1977, 282, Dormers 1998, Schachter 2003. 130 to 1, Bowden 2010, 59 to 61. At least two dedications at the Samothrakian A 1758 and the Biz figurine represent Egyptian dwarfs or dwarf gods. Although Hellenistic audiences valued images of dwarfs for various reasons, the sanctuary context here suggests more specific readings. In dedicating such images at this sanctuary, worshippers may, like Herodotos, 3.37, have constructed parallels between Egyptian dwarf deities and the Kabiroi, Barrett 2011, 388-91. The sanctuary's Delian location enhances the likelihood that the dedicator recognized the figurine's Egyptian resonances, a major trading hub, Hellenistic Delos hosted some expatriate Egyptians and flourishing cults of Isis and Serapis, Barrett 2011, 119-20. Many questions remain. Did a single worshipper dedicate multiple figurines with Egyptian associations, or do they represent multiple dedications? Also unknown is the donor's cultural affiliation. Was a 1758's dedicator an Egyptian expatriate, or a member of some other segment of Delos' diverse population? Greeks, Italians, Phoenicians, Syrians, Egyptians, and Arabs were all present on the island, Bruno 1972. 115 to 16, Basler's 1977, Barrett 2011, 119, and adherents of Egyptian cults on Delos had similar far flung origins, Roussel 1916, 266 to 7, 280 to 4, Basler's 1977, 35 to 65, Barrett 2011, 321 to 420. The port's international, 
multi-ethnic setting may have provided particular motivation for residents to explore the compatibility of originally disparate religious practices. Ultimately, the Samothrakian figurine raises as many questions as it answers about the boundaries of Greek religion. In place of neatly delineated categories for Greek and other religious traditions, this artifact points to an ongoing process of negotiation, in which ritual activity in sacred space enabled individuals to create, break down, and reshape cultural and religious identities. Tradition and Transformation in Greek Religion a comparison of the 5th-4th century BCE Athenian and 2nd-1st century BCE Delian figurines also illustrates certain continuities and discontinuities between classical and Hellenistic religious practices. Certainly, the Delian figurine testifies to the altered socio-political context of the Hellenistic world, with its increased international connectivity and religious cosmopolitanism. Additionally, the Samothrakian find spot recalls the Hellenistic expansion of mystery cults like that of the Megalotheoi, Rule 2003, Barrett 2011, N. 1582, Westcote 2012. However, other aspects of these artifacts evoke continuity from classical to Hellenistic times. The use of mold-made terracotta figurines, in a variety of contexts, characterizes both classical and Hellenistic sites. Despite the Delian figurine's foreign fabric and iconography, its producers employed manufacturing techniques that originated in Greece, Eulenbrock 1990, 16-17, Miller 1996, 28-47, and were, in large part, already familiar to the producers of the earlier Athenian figurine. Furthermore, figurines similar to the Athenian T4128 survived into the Hellenistic period, when terracottas of reclining female banqueters appear as far afield as Seleucid Babylon, Langenhopa 2007, 152-3. Even in changing cultural settings, the continuing ubiquity of mass-produced figurines suggests some perceived continuity in popular needs. Re-evaluating the polis model Finally, these figurines also illustrate some issues with the polis model of Greek religion. The Samothrakian figurines' international associations emphasize identities larger in scope than polis citizenship. Rather than reaffirming a specific polis institutions or prestige, this object's donor signaled membership in broader religious and cultural networks a potentially useful choice for someone at an international trading port. In contrast, the classical figurine's iconography shows little foreign influence, and it comes from a polis Athens that, even in Hellenistic times, remained religiously traditional in many ways, Michelson 1998, Hellenistic figurines from Athens, e.g. Thompson and Thompson 1987, display significantly less foreign iconographic influence than their Delian counterparts. Yet, even in classical Athens, the popularity of mass-produced terracottas, designed for individual consumption and use, may speak to practices not fully encompassed within the polis model. Certainly, structural parallels existed between civic cult and some aspects of household cult, Brute Seidman and Schmidt Pantel 1992, 80-91, Bedeker 2008, Farhan 2008, and similar terracotta types might appear in both households and sanctuaries, compared to Barrett 2011. However, terracotta's broad accessibility, inexpensive materials, and wide array of iconographic types enabled much individual choice in their purchasing and use. Such circumstances problematize assumptions that the polis necessarily acted as primary mediator of citizens' religious experience. Conclusion The figurines in our case studies thus illustrate several themes central to this volume's re-examination of ancient Greek religion. For one thing, they demonstrate the challenges of defining borders for Greek religion. Additionally, a comparison of these figurines illustrates both continuity and transformation between classical and Hellenistic times, as Hellenistic Greeks perpetuated many classical practices, including the use of mass-produced figurines, while adapting those traditions to the changing religious needs of a socially and politically shifting world. Finally, these popularly accessible objects contribute to a reassessment of the polis model of Greek religion, testifying to the interactions of civic cults with other forms of religious practice.
These artifacts examination also illustrates several theoretical and methodological points, particularly the indispensability of contextual analysis. Both objects come from known contexts, but a figurine in situ in a sanctuary can provide very different information about religious practices than a figurine from a disposal context. Furthermore, these artifacts also illustrate the informational value of seemingly humble small finds. The terracotta's inexpensiveness and accessibility make them particularly useful as evidence of popular practices, as such objects were available to many social strata. Finally, these artifacts illustrate the importance of situating individual religious sites within broader landscapes. Simply associating an artifact with a particular sanctuary may not always be sufficient, we also need to understand that sanctuaries' role within a larger network of religious sites, local, regional, and international. So, to understand why someone might dedicate an Egyptian figurine at the Delian Samothrakian, we need to examine not only the Samothrakian but also the broader religious and social landscapes of Hellenistic Delos, just as the island provided a commercial meeting point for much of the eastern Mediterranean, so too could worshippers enact a similar cosmopolitanism in Delian sanctuaries. As the study of Greek religion moves on to new questions and new approaches, the rich material record will remain central to such investigations. Classical archaeologists are increasingly engaging with theories and methods from other disciplines, including anthropology, art history, religious studies, philosophy, archaeonometry, and the study of cultures adjacent to the classical world, Egyptology, Assyriology, Indology, Meroitic studies, and more. The 21st century archaeology of Greek religion is thus a truly multidisciplinary field, contributing to wide-ranging academic discourses while continuing to uncover new material evidence for ancient Greek religion. Suggested reading Within the vast literature on the archaeology of religion and ritual, two helpful starting points for further reading include the Oxford Handbook of the Archaeology of Ritual and Religion, in Seoul 2011, and the Essays in Kyriakides, 2007, recent edited volume, which offers a multidisciplinary perspective and an overview of current debates. Renfrews, Renfrew 1985, Renfrew and Zubro 1994, work on ritual sites and cognitive archaeology remains essential reading, and Bells, 1992, 1997, studies of ritual and ritualizations have influenced many archaeologists. A useful introductory text on contemporary archaeological theory is Hodder and Hudson 2003. Trigger 2007 is the standard history of archaeology as a discipline. On the history of Greek archaeology in particular, see Morris 1994, Whitley 2001, Dyson 2006, and Osborne and Alcock 2012. Chapter 10. Paparology. David Martinez. The central concern of Greek papyrology is editing, interpreting, and publishing papyrus texts, some literary, but others of a documentary nature, which concern the public institutions and private affairs of Greco-Roman society as it developed in Egypt from 332 BCE, Alexander's taking control of Egypt, to CE 6 for 1, Arab conquest. A third category, subliterary, falls between those two broad types, comprising materials such as popular songs and hymns, school exercises, and magical texts. The following chapter explores some contributions of papyri to the study of Greek religion under three headings, documentary texts, Orphic materials, and, more extensively, the Greek magical papyri. Introduction When Greek colonists streamed into Egypt in the wake of Alexander's conquest, the gods, religious traditions, and beliefs that they brought with them made little initial impact on the native population, the weight of influence rather moved in the other direction, Utai 1955, 361 is equal to 1973, 1.5 for 9. The numerous local Egyptian deities and their cults, grounded in the vivid and potent institutions of the temples throughout the country, held considerable allure for the new settlers. In fact, long before the Hellenistic period Greeks esteemed the antiquity and authority of Egypt in things religious, Henrik's 2003, 224-7, Herodotus' contention that the Egyptians invented the gods' names, 2.50, is well known. 
just as striking is one of the earliest Greek papyri, the Curse of Artemisia, 4th cent. BCE, probably originating in the ancient Greek community of the Hellenomemphites, Thompson 2012, 89-90, which invokes the Egyptian god Osirapis and was deposited in his temple in Memphis, Bell 1953, 3-4. That same deity, merged with Zeus and Pluto, later becomes enshrined in the Ptolemaic Serapis cult. See also, in this volume, Klybal, Chapter 41. This forceful appeal was buttressed by a religious and a social tendency, synthesis or syncretism of divinities and their worship, an impulse well attested in Papyri, Bell 1953, 15-16, and intermarriage, Utai 1955, 361 is equal to 1973, 1.5 for 9, Lewis 1983, 32 to 3, 1986, 27 to 9, Clarice and Thompson 2006, 2.297, 327 to 8, Winky Face. Documentary Papyri The first papyrus we will consider falls under the rubric documentary, or non literary. These texts relate to government, business, legal matters, and everyday life. Documents such as leases, loans, receipts, petitions to officials, private letters, and so on. Palm 2009. Although religious perspectives gleaned from them are frequently anecdotal and incidental to their main purpose, they afford invaluable insights into cultic ideas and practice. We will begin with a petition called an intuxis, addressed to the reigning monarch but usually handled by local officials, which illustrates the two tendencies mentioned in the previous paragraph. Asia to King Ptolemaios, greetings. I am wronged by Puris the householder. For my husband Makatas was billeted in the village pollution and he divided, the property, with Puris and constructed in his space a shrine to the Syrian goddess and Aphrodite Berenike. There was also a half-finished wall between the space of Puris and that of my husband, and now that I wish to finish the wall to prevent trespass into our parts, Puris has forbidden me to build it, although the wall does not belong to him, but he is contemptuous of the fact that my husband is dead. So I ask of you, King, if it is clear that the wall is ours, to order Diophanes the governor to write Menandros the overseer not to permit Puris to forbid us from building it, in order that, having had recourse to you, King, I may obtain justice. P. Ung To. 13, 222 BCE, Magdola, TM 3290. The actors and circumstances of this text reflect the cultural amalgam prevalent in the papyri, Henstel 1978. 374 to 5. Asia's deceased husband Makatas, a good Greek Macedonian name, served in the army of Ptolemy III, Uajit's I, and was stationed in the Fayumic village Pollution. The woman, whose own name, Asia, indicates she is Syrian, files this petition against Puris, upon whose household Makatas was billeted, a hard fact of life for many native Egyptians, Lewis 1986, 21 to 4. The billeting arrangement was long-term or possibly permanent, since Makatas divided the property with Puris, built on his side a domestic shrine, Otto 1905, 169-70, P. Onto. PP 15-16, and was in the process of constructing a privacy wall. He probably built for his wife the shrine dedicated to the DEA Syria, that is Atagatis, the northern Syrian name and manifestation of the goddess Astarte whose worship among the Greeks and identification with Aphrodite were long established, Bell 1953, 14-16. Aphrodite, in turn, provided a convenient link with the reigning Queen Berenike II, since Ptolemaic queens were typically identified with that goddess, Rolandson 1998, 28-9. The synthesis of the DEA Syria, Aphrodite, and Ptolemaic ruler cults afforded the couple a comfortable compromise and provides us with an excellent example from the early Ptolemaic period of how intermarriage disseminated cults. As a result, the familial loyalty to the Syrian goddess ran deep, based on an inscription, Ife. 3150, we know that, 26 years later, two of Mashata's sons were serving as priests in her cult, Rub Sam 1974, 136-8. Roland Sun 1998, 28-9. Orphica. 
By far the most significant text for the documentation and understanding of Orphic ideas is the Dervini Papyrus. Discovered at the pass of that name near Thessaloniki in 1962, the partially preserved roll was part of the charred remains connected with a funeral pyre. It preserves a curious mixture of prose and poetry, a substantial part of it being a commentary on verses attributed to Orpheus. The roll itself dates to the mid to late 4th century BCE, its text, however, especially the poetry, is likely earlier, Burnaby 2007, 99. A vast literature on the papyrus has accumulated and thorough editions, introductions, and studies abound, e.g. Lax and most 1997, Bati 2004, Kuraminos, Parasaglu, and Sansanaglu 2006, more briefly, West 1983. 75 to 101, Burnaby 2007. The Egyptian papyri also offer valuable perspectives on Orphica, a striking example being an edict from the reign of Ptolemy Philopater, 222 to 205 BCE. By the king's decree, let those throughout the land who perform initiations into the mysteries of Dionysus sail down to Alexandria, those as far as Norcratis within ten days from the day that the decree is posted, those further inland than Norcratis within twenty days, and let them register themselves with Aristobulus at the record office, within three days from the day they arrive, and declare at once from whom they have received the rites as far back as three generations, and submit their sacred text, Hieros logos, sealed, having inscribed each his own name. BGU 61211, 215-205 BCE, TM 4527. Those who perform initiations into the mysteries of Dionysos translates choose Talantas Toy Dionysoi, LSJ SV Telio 3, Wanders 1983, 228-9. Plato, Resp. 364 B.E., famously describes itinerate, literally, begging, agertai, priests and prophets who frequent the doors of the rich and try to persuade individuals, and even cities, of the power of rituals contained in a jumble of books by Orpheus and Musaios to expiate sins in this life and provide freedom from terrors in the next. This, in turn, corresponds closely to Theophrasto's account of the Orpheotelestai, those who perform the rites of the Orphic mysteries, whom the superstitious man with his family visits monthly to participate in said rites, Char 16.12. Diggle 2004, 369-70. What purpose did the mandates laid on these individuals serve? Perhaps Philopater wished to exercise a certain quality control over those throughout Egypt who were dispensing initiatory and cleansing rituals in Dionysos' name, not only to have a record of the practitioners through registration, but also to evaluate the depth of their practice by identifying possible quacks and upstarts, and somehow to scrutinize the most important tools of their trade, their holy writings or handbooks, Henrik's 2003, and, with regard to this decree, 224-31. As an ardent devotee of Dionysiac worship, Burke at 1993, 263, Philopater had an important stake in this oversight of popular preachers who advocated an Orphic expression of it, of which he may have held suspicions, for various interpretations, Henrik's 2003, 224-31, Herrero 2010, 53. Some scholars have, in fact, suggested that the very fragmentary P. Gurub 1, TM 65667, dated to about the same period, could represent just such a high arrows logos that Philopater decreed be submitted to him, Burke at 1987, 70-1, Herrero 2010, 54. Whether or not that is the case, it certainly conveys a notion of what such a text might have looked like. Structurally, it consists of prose instructions for performing rituals and for speaking inside a formulae, tokens, passwords, interlaced with sections of poetry, probably hexameters, which appear to be prayers. M. West's translation conveys an idea of its fragmentary nature and the restorations that he accepts or proposes in the square brackets, West 1983, 170-1, with slight adaptations. The metrical prayers are indented and in quotes. Having what he finds. Let him, collect the raw pieces, on account of the sacrament. Accept, T. My offering, as the payment, for my lawless, 
Faf, as. Save me, gr, eat, brimo. And Demeter, and. Rear. And the armed Karites, let us. That we may make a fine sacrifice. A ram and a he goat. Boundless gifts. And pasture by the river. Tar, king of the goat. Let him eat the rest of the meat. Let X not watch, consecrating it upon the burnt up. Prayer of the. Let us invoke Anubulius. And let us call upon the queen of the broad earth. And the dear S thou, having withered the. Grant the blessings of Demeter and Pallas unto us. O Yubu, Luz, Erechipios. Save me, Herla of Light, Ning. There is one Dionysos tokens. God through bosom. I have drunk. Donkey. Oxherd, password, up and down to the, and what has been given to you, consume it, put into the basket. C, 1, Bull Roarer, Knuckle Bones. Mirror. The papyrus, although fragmentary, reveals core Orphic notions and mythic strains, syncretistically blended with ideas from other traditions. West 1983, 171, Horden 2000, 132, on Orphism, see also, in this volume, Edmonds, chapter 37. Apparently at the heart of the two metrical prayers are the invocation of prominent deities and an appeal for salvation, soizen me, save me. The first prayer addresses the figure Brimo, along with Demeter, Rear, or perhaps Demeter Rear, and the armed Karites. Brimo, Hesychios equals Oscura, Mighty, is associated with phonic goddesses of the Artemis Hecate, Demeter, and Persephone Circle, Kern in RE31853-4, Burnaby and Jimenez 2008, 155-6. The first line of the second metrical prayer preserves further invocations, let, us, invoke, and Eubulius and let, us, call upon, the queen, of the broad, earth, and then, Eubu, lose Erechipios save me, two well-established names of Dionysos, Burnaby and Jimenez 2008, 102-3, 154. The ritual of this text also involves passwords, one Dionysos, God through bosom, up down, and redemption, accept, t my, offering, as the payment, pointers, for my lawless, fath, heirs, dot. The payment or penalties are associated with fathers, and, as West has restored, lawless fathers, comparing an important Orphic testimony cited from Olympiodoros, OFK 232, in which Dionyso seems to be receiving a prophecy or oracle regarding his future function as a god, men will send hecatoms always in annual season and perform the rites, seeking release from their forefathers' unrighteousness, and you in power over them will free those you wish from toils and endless frenzy. Trans. West 1983. 99, compared to also one of the Bacchic gold tablets, Burnaby and Jimenez 2008, 266, trans. 151, L13, Graf and Johnston 2013, 38, 27 Fury 1. Pollution due to hereditary sin is a well-established motif in the religious sensibilities of the Greeks, Parker 1983, Chapter 6, especially 203-6, and of other civilizations. Given the context of Orphic myth, where human beings rise from the soot of the Titans after Zeus vaporized them for dismembering and partially consuming Dionysos, West 1983, 164-6, some scholars have interpreted this ancestral crime to be that of the Titans, Burnaby and Jimenez 2008, 156-8. This trope indeed emerges at the end of the papyrus in the third prose section, which speaks of the toys, a cone, or top, bull roarer, knuckle bones and mirror, used by the titans to lure the divine child away from his protectors, the armed Karites, who appear in the first prayer, and who also guarded the infant Zeus, West 1983, 154-9, Guthrie 1993, 120-6, compared to also PSI 7850, Herrero 2010, 55-6. The papyrus' first two passwords, 
which precede the description of the toys, may also figure into this context of ritual connected with the infancy narrative of Dionysos. In his famous study of the One God Formula, Peterson, 1926, 139 to 40, suggests that the acclamation One Dionysos reflects a divine epiphany. Indeed, immediately following is a description of the Sabazian ritual act accompanied by the mystic formula Theos Dia Corpu, God through the bosom or lap, in which a golden snake is inserted through the initiate's clothing on the bare skin, then withdrawn, a kind of allegory of Zeus' union with his daughter Persephone, resulting in Dionysos' birth, Clement Protrep. 2.15, West 1983, 97, Horden 2000, 134. I conclude this section with part of the Plato passage, Rasp, 2.364 B.C., referenced earlier. But beggar priests and prophets go to the doors of the rich and try to convince them that they have at their disposal divine power, procured by sacrifices and spells, to rectify with pleasurable festivals any crime he or his ancestors have committed against another, or likewise for a small price to harm whatever enemy he has designs on by supposedly persuading the gods with certain charms and binding spells to be at their service. Plato apparently conflates the popular Orphic Dionysiac begging priests who administer rites of purification and salvation, and popular Magoi, who service their clients with spells that bind both gods and men. If so, this should not surprise us. Both possessed, in their religious and ritual arsenal, words of power that had miraculous effect. The Greek Magical Papyri. In Pagans and Christians, Robin Lane Fox, 1986, characterizes ancient magic as follows. The art of magic was varied, but it divided, broadly, into two. Most of its spells can be defined as a type of sorcery which was used for competitive ends. They enlisted a personal spirit and deployed the power of words and symbols in order to advance a suit in love or in the law courts to win at the games, to prosper in business or to silence envious rivals. In the imperial period Greek magical texts also catered for clients who had more spiritual aspirations. They served their wish to win immortality for their soul, to escape the confines of fate and necessity, and to confront a supreme god alone, in a personal introduction. In this section we explore aspects of the significant contributions made to the study of religion by the Greek magical papyri in the Greco-Egyptian society which produced them. We will consider two texts from that corpus, an oracular spell entitled, An Invocation to Apollo, PGMI 263-347, and a marvellous binding love spell, PGM 4296-433 both from 4th century CE magical handbooks, the working copies of Professional Magoy, Brishy 1995, 3412-20, Martinez 1995, 6-8. With regard to Lane Fox's analysis, the love spell belongs squarely in the realm of practical, competitive, or agonistic magic, also sometimes called aggressive magic, it seeks to constrain persons or force a certain kind of behavior against their will. It does, however, especially toward its conclusion, incorporate elements of the more spiritual type. The oracular spell straddles the boundary between the two forms. Whoever asks an oracle from a god in ancient Greece, even from the very earliest times, is often seeking advice on practical issues of life, love, money, and competition in the human arena. Proc 1967, 263-73. SB 121227 equals Hengstel 1978, 164, number 66. Conversely, receiving a direct word from a god involves some sort of divine encounter. See also, in this volume, Johnston, chapter 32 and Platt, chapter 33. The Multicultural Phonic Solar Pantheon. Both texts well illustrate the two tiered structure of many spells in the PGM, logos, the incantation directed to various divine beings and spiritual powers, urging them to perform the wishes of the spell operator, and praxis, the act or ritual accompanying the logos, Martinez 1991, 8. The praxis of the oracular spell, PGMI 263-96, prescribes a sacrificial ritual, while utilizing a phylactery made from a seven-leaved spray of laurel, Apollo Alios plant, 
Hopfner 1974, 294-8, Section 516, a lamp not painted red, the color associated with Apollo Horus enemy Seth, Betz 1985, 336, and the head of a wolf. Then one recites the logos, 296-327, followed by a shorter praxis and logos, 327-47. The main logos presents a number of difficulties, Smith 1984 to 1985, Hopfner 1990, 364 to 5 section 218. The dominant structure is that of two hexametric hymns, in which the meter breaks down at several points PGM I 296 to 314, PGM hymn 23, volume 2, 262, and PGM I 315 to 27. PGM Hymn 4.7 FF, Volume 2, 239 to 40. The first of these falls into two distinctive sections, since some hexameters are problematic, I present the text as prose. 296 to 304, Lord Apollo, come with Pion, answer me concerning what I ask with an oracle, Lord. Master, leave Mount Parnassus and Delphic Pytho. While our consecrated mouths speak things not to be uttered, first angel of God, great Zeus Iao, and you the heavenly keeper of the cosmos, Michael, and you, Gabriel Archangel, I invoke. Come from Olympos, Abrasax, who rejoices in the east, may you come mercifully, who watches over the west from the east, Adonai, all nature trembles before you, father of the cosmos, Parkabeth. The identification of Apollo with his Egyptian counterpart, the sun god Horus, appears as early as Herodotos, 2.144.2 with Lloyd 1975-3.111, more generally Foth 1995, 41-56. In the first lines of our logos, however, the most Greek of all gods, Otto 1954, 78, appears in his full Hellenic garb, his name immediately linked with his Epiclesis and Hympian represented in our text as a separate deity or at least an alter ego, Graph 2012. Our spell summons him from his prophetic shrine of Delphi and the closely adjoining Mount Parnassos, sacred to Apollo as the home of the muses, who form his choir and share with him oversight of artistic and literary inspiration. Although the epithet Angelos, messenger, more frequently characterizes Hermes, the filler title here given Apollo, first angel of Zeus, makes good sense from a Greek point of view, in that Apollo declares the purpose of his oracle to prophecy for men the unerring will of Zeus, Hon. H.Y.M. Apollo 132, Zeus's mouthpiece, Fontenrose 1959, 252. That ascription, however, provides a kind of fulcrum point on which the invocation tilts in a different direction. Zeus is identified with Iao, also PGM V 471-2, compare to 427-73, Cook 1914, 232-5, Ganskiniets 1914, 714-15, the standard Greek version of the Hebrew name for God, the Tetragrammaton, YHWH, Yahweh, Ganskiniets 1914, Oni 1995, accompanied by his supreme Angeloi, Michael and Gabriel. The Yahweh theme continues, first with Abrasax, a celebrated magical appellation of obscure etymology, with the numerological value 365, but which occurs most frequently with Iao and other Yahweh names, referring to the same great demiurge, Brashi 1995, 3577. Our spell summons him, come from Olympos, which backtracks to the identification of this Yahweh cluster with Zeus. Next comes Adonai, Lord, a common Yahweh designation and in Jewish tradition the cure, what was read in the synagogue, for YHWH, Winegreen 1959, 23. Then follows the Sethian Parkabeth, for its ironic identification with Apollo Horus as well as Yahweh, C. Smith 1984-1985, 210, Martinez 1991, 33, 80, Oni 1995. 7-8, Foth 1995, 61. In the second part of the oracular spell's first hymn, this idea of the one great solar divinity under a multitude of names and symbols takes fascinating form, 305-14. I adjure God's head, which is Olympos, 
I adjure God's seal, which is his vision. I adjure your right hand, which you held over the cosmos. I adjure God's crater which possesses riches. I adjure the eternal God and aeon of all. I adjure self-existing nature, mightiest Adonaios. I adjure Eloaios, setting and rising. I adjure these holy and divine names, that they send me the divine spirit and that he accomplish what I have in my heart and mind. The hymn spell shifts rhetorically from invocation to adjuration, with the word Horkizo, I adjure, repeated seven times with seven aspects and names of the deity designated in the previous section as the father of the cosmos. In the first four of these, various body parts, properties, and equipment of the great demiurge incorporate the cosmos itself, with his head as Olympos, most likely with its equivalency to heaven, Schmidt 1939, 277-9. 291 to 2. The hymnist then adjures his seal, that is, his vision, Horus, suggesting a stoic sense to the word, vision being an actual emanation from the eye. Lindbergh 1976, 8 to 11. Here the sun god's beams or radiance, with which he looks upon the earth. Hon. Od. 11.16, and that also being his outward physical manifestation, stamp, or seal, sphragis by which he is known. The notion approximates a hypostasis, similar in the New Testament to Hebrews 1. 3. Describing Jesus as the stamp or seal, character, of God's essence, hypostasis, and the radiance or effulgence, apogasma, of his glory. The right hand of the demiurge that he held over the cosmos probably does not describe protection or nurturing, for which holds over would be more appropriate, but the initial creation of it, Compare to Isaiah 48.13, for Ezra 3.6. Creation motifs possibly continue in the next adjuration of the God's mixing bowl, crater, which has Orphic overtones, West 1983, 11, 262 and 3, Hopfner 1990, 365 section 218, Copenhagen 1992, 131, as a creation trope, PLT. 34b, 5, 41d. Our spell's obscure reference to this crater motif portrays it in cornucopic fashion, that which holds abundance. This adjuration section summarizes these first four Greek Orphic based designations in the Cosmocrator title Aeon, Endless Time, in PGM a common equivalent of Alios, Drivers, Aeon, DDD 22, Bets 1985, 331 2 and then reverts to Yahweh names, Adonaios, here in its declinable form, and Eloaios, Bets 1985, 334. Philosophic ideas again emerge with Adonaios by name, self-existing nature, reflecting Hellenistic Jewish and Middle Platonic notions of God as true and absolute existence, LXXX 3.14 Ego I Me Ho On, I Am The One Who Is, Philo, Op 172, Ab, 121, Merkel Bark and Totti 1991, 163, Dylan 1996, 136, 155. The fact that both Jewish names are to be identified as the sun god is shown by the epithet setting and rising. The divine spirit, which the demiurge is called upon to send, is the spirit of the dead, about whom more will be said, see the funerary context, below. Before considering the second hymn of the oracular spell, we will introduce and begin a detailed discussion of the second of our two texts, the Filtra Catadesmos Thomastos, Marvelous Binding Love Spell, PGM 4296-406, which offers us both similar and varied perspectives on the multicultural pantheon and theology of the magical papyri. In addition to our handbook text, versions of this spell occur in five depictions, Lead tablets, a fact which evinces its considerable fame and prestige, on the tablets, Daniel and Maltamini 1990, 174 to 213, Numbers 46 to 51, Martinez 1991, Passim, especially 6 to 8, 131 to 2. The Praxis section, 296 to 335, prescribes making a male and female effigy, writing magical formulae on the female piercing different parts of her body with 13 needles, binding them to the tablet on which the logos is written, and depositing the ensemble on a grave, a similar female figure was actually excavated with one of the tablets mentioned above, Cambitsis 1976, 
Plate 31, Ferran 2002, 319 to 23, Wilburn 2012, 28 to 31. The long, involved logos, 335 to 406, I translate selectively as follows. I deposit with you this binding spell, gods of the underworld, Yesema Garden and Koe Persephone Ereskigal and Adonis who is Barbaretha, and, Hermes Thoth of the underworld Fokentazepsu Ech Thatha Misonktake Albanachamba and mighty Anubis Sirinth, who holds the keys to the gates of Hades, and, with you, phonic spirits, gods and goddesses who suffered untimely death, lads and maidens. I adjure all spirits who are in this place to help this spirit. And rouse yourself for me, whoever you are, whether male or female, and go into every place and bring NN, whom NN bore. Because I adjure you by the fearful and dreadful name of him, at the hearing of whose name the earth will open, at the hearing of whose name the demons will greatly fear, at the hearing of whose name the rivers and the rocks are cleft. I adjure you, Nicodemon. By the name Barbaritha Chenbra Barushambra, and by the name Abrata Brasak Sezeng and Barfarangers, and by the glorious Aoia Marie, and by the name Marmariath Marmaroth Marmaroth Marekthana Amaza, Maribiath. Do this, bind her. For I am Barbadani, who conceals the stars, the bright ruler of heaven, the lord of the cosmos Atherin Iatherin etc. At first blush the invocations of the first hymn of the oracular spell and those in this prosaic love spell and the deities invoked seem quite different. The love spell employs a more self-conscious syncretism, with Persephone united with her Babylonian counterpart Erskigal and Hermes with the Egyptian Thoth. In addition, the deities in the love spell bear the description thonic, katakthonioi. A measure of scrutiny, however, reveals those differences to be not as significant as they first seem. Indeed, the gods at the outset of the love spell are the traditionally thonic Persephone, Hermes Thoth, and Adonis, whereas the oracular spell first invokes the supremely Olympian Apollo, with Pian and, by implication, the Muses, and Zeus. Those latter gods, however, merge quickly with the Hebraic Ioadonai, a brass axe, cluster, corresponding to the even larger framework of the solar demiurge, who rejoices in the east but who inspects, watches over, the west from the east. That last ascription has a significance that extends beyond the directional journey of the sun or its gaze. The west in Egyptian theology commonly designates the underworld, cf. The epithet of the god of the dead, Osiris, first of the westerners, Frankfurt 1948, 197-8 and the sun god's concern with it characterizes him as a phonic as well as heavenly deity, more on this below, see the funerary context. A more significant difference, one that stems, at least in part, from the oracular spell's hexametric structure, is the love spell's considerably stronger emphasis on the power of names. It is at this point that influence from Hebraic and Egyptian religious perspectives emerges most prominently in Greek magical texts. We may take as an example a famous passage from the Book of the Dead. As the deceased stands before the entrance of the blessed realm, the parts of the gate speak to him. I shall not let you enter through me, says the beam of this gate, unless you tell me my name. Plummet of the place of truth is your name. I shall not let you pass over me, says the threshold of this gate, unless you tell my name. Ox of Jeb is your name. I shall not open for you, says the bolt clasp of this gate, unless you tell my name. I of Sok Lord of Baku is your name. You know us, pass over us. Lick time 1976, 2.130. So vital was knowledge of the true and secret name, that in Egyptian conception it becomes a means of salvation. We remember from the previous section on Orphica the redemptive power of passwords. In our love spell, the operator displays his prowess in name power by his prolific use of voices magici, magical words, or, more appropriately, nomina barbara, foreign names, after the traditional Greek or Egyptian ones, expressed in italics in the translation given in this chapter. Some have been successfully deciphered on the basis of Hebrew, Egyptian, and other languages. Passages from the PGM help us understand the ethos behind them, come Lord Hermes, obey me. I know your foreign names, Farnathar Barakalix Thea, 
8 15 to 21, Greatest Typhon, hear me, for I speak your true names Iobeth Iopakabeth, for 277 to 8, Arctus. I entreat you that you do such and such because I invoke you by your holy names, which you cannot resist, Brimo Rexachin etc., 7 686 to 92. Practitioners of magic considered these names more ancient and authentic, and thus, as in the Book of the Dead, effective for inducing divine action. Indeed, those who have accurate knowledge of them have power over the divine and demonic beings they invoke. The oracular spell certainly does not neglect them, with its use of the name Parkabeth. See the multicultural phonic solar pantheon, above, and a string of nomina Barbara at the end of its second hymn. See the next section. The Funerary Context Returning now to the oracular spell, the second hymn of the Logos, 315-27, is actually an excerpt from an independent hymn to the Sun God, which occurs in various versions in three other passages in PGM, for 436-61, 1957-89, A composite edition of it, based on all of the versions, appears as PGM hymn 4. Volume 2, 239 to 40 equals Heich 1963, LIX 4. Its presence in four forms among the magical papyri attests to a similar level of prestige as our Filtro Catadesmos Thormastos. I translate it as it stands in our oracular spell in PGMI, but in the interpretation that follows, I incorporate elements of the other versions and the composite edition. Here, blessed one, I summon you, governor of heaven and earth of chaos and hades, where dwell, send this daimon, by night forcibly driven by my incantations, by your commands, from whose corpse this is, and let him declare to me all that I desire in my thoughts, speaking truthfully, send him, in gentleness, mildness, and not being of hostile mind toward me. And do not you be wrathful at my sacred incantations, but keep my whole body intact to come to the light, for it is you who prescribe the learning of these things among men. I invoke your name, equal in numerical value to the fates themselves, a chifo though though, etc. The poem invokes the sun god as governor of heaven and earth, of chaos and hades, where dwell, here our text omits some material. Other versions of the hymn supply what is missing, where dwell men's spirits who previously looked upon the light. And so now I pray, blessed, immortal, master of the world, if you traverse the hollow of the earth in the place of the dead, Send me this daimon in the middle hours of night, PGM hymn 4.8-13. Whereas Odyssey Book 11 describes the realm of the dead as a place where the bright sun never looks down with its rays, 15-16, here we see the Egyptian notion of the underworld frequented daily by Alios. The phonic Olympian gap, so characteristic of the Homeric religious worldview, Burke at 1985, 199-203, 205-205 does not apply in the Egyptian perspective, as Jan Asman observes, 2005, 392 Egypt differed radically from religions that made a strict distinction between deities of the sky and of the netherworld. In Egypt, the sun god embraced both realms. As supreme phonic deity, the solar demiurge has the authority to mobilize the lesser denizens of that realm, including the spirits of the dead. The singer of Ahim calls upon him to do so. He has a particular ghost in mind, send this spirit from whose corpse this is. It is likely that our spell operator performs the hymn at a cemetery, where he has identified a particular tombstone that designates the corpse as an ahoros, that is, one who died a premature death, before their fated time, or one whom he knows to be a biothanatos, one who died a violent death. The latter class may include one who fell in battle or someone murdered or executed, Washington 1952. Johnston 1999, 148-53, for the complexity of this category. The former group particularly comprised those who died young, especially girls unmarried and or without children, as the love spell, lads and maidens, and gravestone epitaphs of the period make clear, weep for my young age, one dead before her time and unmarried, SB 3 6706.16, Martinez 1991, 48 in General Johnston 1999, Chapter 5, especially 175-6. Such spirits form a special phonic cohort, who, 
like the dismal ghosts conjured by Odysseus, O.D. 11.38-41, have not been fully integrated into the phonic community, because their death occurred before the proper time, and, in the case of the Aharoi, before they fulfilled their humanity. Magical spells in the papyri and cursed tablets press these spirits, along with the Atafoi, unburied, into their service because of their availability and anger with regard to their untimely deaths, deprived honours, and limbo state, DT 23.19-20, 3rd cent CE, compared to 22.30-1, to 25.4-5 at all. The marvellous binding love spell instructs one to write the logos on a lead tablet, to which are attached male and female figurines, and then place it at sunset by the grave of one who died a premature or violent death, PGM 4333-4. Later, the inhabitant of this grave is called the Nekidaemon, spirit of the dead, who is conjured on the authority of the phonic deities and of the all-powerful name of the supreme sun god and sent to infect the beloved victim with hopeless erotic desire for the spell operator. He does so with the help of other ghosts who roam about the same cemetery where the operator performs the magic. We have seen that these notions of the untimely, violently dead, occupying a liminal region between the depths of the underworld and the normal human realm, play a vital role in Greek literature from Homer onward, see, in this volume, Rutiras, chapter 27. They undergo, however, considerable development in the late antique magical papyri and other types of magical documents. In the love spell the Nekidaemon has eros-inducing powers. In Homer, whereas only the soul of Teresias has oracular powers, in our hexametric spell the Ahoros conjured at the grave is to declare to me all that I desire in my thoughts, speaking truthfully. The manipulated spirits, however, gain these powers by virtue of their relationship to the upper echelons of the phonic hierarchy. A prominent deity or group of deities must send the daimon, and in the oracular text it does not participate willingly, forcibly, hyp ananki, driven by my incantations, by your, the sun gods, commands, pgmi 318. The love spell expresses this ananki, necessity, apropos to its greater emphasis on names of power, I adjure you Nekidaemon by the fearful and dreadful name of him, at the hearing of whose name the earth will open, at whose name the spirits will greatly fear. Do not disobey, Nekidaemon, the commands and names, and so on, PGM 4 356-68. The Oracular Procedure Having surveyed the divine personnel and the funerary mechanics of both texts, we may now explore the hexametric spell's oracular setting and procedure. As we have seen, the sun god sends the spirit of the dead to pronounce the oracle. Other versions of the second hymn fix the time frame of this event more precisely than that of PGMI, send me this daimon in the middle hours of the night, PGM hymn 4.12. This temporal framework elucidates the oracular procedure as a dream visitation, and, by extension, possibly incubation, that is, an inquirer spending the night in a temple and experiencing a visitation from a divine being who most often provides healing or a prescription for such, see, in this volume, Graph, Chapter 34. Our hymn may have originally served some cultic function in this context, such as a hymn sung before the inquirer laid down to sleep, Merkel Bark and Totti 1990, 11, Section 20. One of its other versions, PGM 874-81, occurs in a spell which bears the title request for a dream oracle of Bis, 64. For one who had any knowledge of oracular sites in Egypt, that phrase would point to the the Bay town of Abydos, the location of the Memnonian of set Hosei, an ancient cult centre of Osiris established in the 19th dynasty, which supported a famous incubation dream oracle of Osiris Serapis during the Hellenistic period, Frankfurter 2005, 238. The oracular character of the temple continued into the Roman era, but with the dwarf-like, apotropaic deity Biz assuming the main prophetic role, Ammianus Marcellinus 19.12.36, Frankfurter 1998, 169-74. This Biz oracle rose to international fame, and in addition to traditional incubation apparently employed a ticket schema of consultation in which the inquirer presented the god, i.e. his priest, with two papyrus chits stating opposite scenarios, shall I keep my job? Shall I lose my job? 
The God was to bring out the correct answer. Ammianus Marcellinus 19.12.36, SB 1211227 equals Hengstel 1978, 164-5, Clarice 2009, 571, 579. It would not be surprising to find a hymn to the sun god associated with Bis' famous oracle, since Bis himself, and other Bis-like divinities, evinced strong solar affiliations and had links to other solar deities. A popular art form known as the Horus Sippy, which flourished in the Greco-Roman period, closely associates Bees with Horus Harpocrates, the son of Osiris and the youthful solar deity, the Egyptian equivalent of Apollo, with whom the oracular spell began. Representative of this form, of which there are hundreds, is the Metanich Stele, 360-343 BCE, which portrays the face or mask of Biz above Horus, who displays his cosmic solar prowess and mastery of chaos, holding snakes and scorpions and other animals in his hands and treading on crocodiles. Frankfurter 1998, 47-8, Clarice 2009, 583 and compare to figure 24.11. If this hymn to the sun god, from which the second part of our spell is accepted, had its origin in the Abydos Bases oracle, Merkel Bark and Totti 1990, 10-16, or some other well-known incubation shrine, this could help explain its fame and wide dissemination. Whatever its initial sits in Leban, it has been lifted from that context and employed in various settings in the PGM, allowing individuals to access the sun god's power to mobilize the spirits of the dead for oracular communication through dreams in private contexts, in this case, a kind of merger between dream incubation and a ghost conjuring ritual performed at a cemetery. Conclusion Although the magical technology of our two spells involves both writing and speaking, the former emerges more prominently in the love spell, which has a decidedly documentary focus. Its praxis says to inscribe the logos on a lead tablet, bind the male and female effigies to it, and then place it by a grave of one who suffered a premature or violent death. The inscribed lead tablet is not only a vital part of the Materia Magica, but also figures in the opening words of the logos itself, I deposit with you, gods of the underworld, this binding spell. This fulfills the prescription of the praxis, place it beside, paratethon, but also goes beyond it, by use of parakatatithomai, I deposit. In other words, the act of laying the written text at the grave makes the underworld deities and daemons the guarantors of the spell and responsible for its execution. This idea of the written text as a deposition occurs fairly often in curse tablets, Martinez 1991, 36-7. Our oracular spell, with its hymnic style and hexametric structure, emphasizes oral performance more strongly. But both orality and writing are important for both and we should not assume, based on presuppositions about written and oral stages of epic poetry, that the greater emphasis on the written text suggests a later stage of development and perspective. The 4th century BCE Curse of Artemisia, PGM XL, has a similar documentary focus. In it, a woman curses her, apparently, estranged husband for depriving her deceased daughter of her funerary gifts, Artemisia has set down this appeal beseeching Osirapis and the god seated with Osirapis to render judgment, and while this appeal lies here, by no means may the father of the little girl find the gods merciful. Vital to the spell's success is the fact that the operator has set it down in the temple of the great god Osirapis in Memphis, and its continued effectiveness depends on its staying there, on deposit as it were. The written text itself secures the vital link between the operator and the phonic powers. But the fundamental technology that the love spell employs is names of power, and this it does by stylistic crescendo. It begins with the depositing of the spell with the great underworld gods, followed by their magical, or true, names. The operator extends the deposition to the daemons or ghosts who occupy the cemetery, adjuring them to assist the Nicodemon. He, however, takes the name magic to a heightened level, when he threatens to utter the supreme and secret name of the great god who is Iaodonia Brassax, as in the oracular spell. But unlike the oracular spell, those names are engulfed by numerous nomina barbara, which, with those three great names, seem almost cover names for the greatest, unutterable name, which will cause cosmic ruin if actually pronounced. 
But if that were not daunting enough, the spell's threatening crescendo reaches a henotheistic apex, when the operator demands the daemon's obedience, claiming to become the great demiurge himself. I am Barbadani, who conceals the stars, the bright ruler of heaven, the lord of the cosmos, PGM 4 385-6. Although though I am revelatory formula has currency in all three of the major religious traditions which stream into the PGM, Egyptian, Jewish, and Greek, Martinez 1991, 92-4, the entire structure of the love spell seems to take its cue from Egyptian funerary and soteriological ideas. As we saw in the Book of the Dead passage cited, see the multicultural phonic solar pantheon, above, the deceased gains access to the divine realm through knowledge of names of power, but in Egyptian religion, ultimate salvation occurs only when the dead himself becomes Osiris, Morens 1975. 197 to 8, 206 to 7. But what is disconcerting to modern sensibilities is the fact that this cosmic drama of ascent and assimilation through the power of names, culminating in merger with the supreme divine personality itself, unfolds for the purpose of manipulating lower spiritual powers for the crass goal of forcing a girl to submit to the operator's desires. The contrast with which we began this section between competitive practical and revelatory magic has helped students of this fascinating phenomenon understand its varied textures and functions. But for many of its practitioners, perhaps that distinction did not mean that much. Suggested reading For papyri and papyrology in general, see Turner 1980, OHP, and papyri.info. A fine, although somewhat dated, Lexicon of Religion in the Papyri is Ronkai 1974-1977. Two helpful monographs on the subject are Bell 1953 and Robson 1974. For the Magical Papyri the standard edition of texts is PGM with the English translation of Betts 1985. Several texts published after PGM are collected in Daniel and Maltamini 1990-1991. Introductions to the Magical Papyri, Betts 1985, Brashi 1995 with an exhaustive annotated bibliography. For an excellent collection of essays, see Farhan and Obink 1991. Translations are my own unless otherwise noted. I thank Chris Farhan for reading the section on magic and making many helpful suggestions and Brian Kramer for advice on a number of points. Part 3. Myths. Contexts and Representations Chapter 11 Epic Richard P. Martin Introduction Until the mid-20th century, the poetry attributed to Homer, Hesiod, and the authors of the epic cycle provided the earliest written evidence for Greek religious practices of sacrifice, dedication, prayer, cult song, and funeral ritual. In addition, such poetry, especially the Iliad and Odyssey, created an indelible impression about how Greeks imagined the gods, their familial relations, desires, and interaction, for better or worse, with mortals. While forced by lack of other data to use hexameter poems as testimony for practices and beliefs, modern scholars were less comfortable adopting the judgment of Herodotus, who credited Homer and Hesiod, above all, with actually forming the Greek religious imagination. HDT 2.53. In his excursus on Egypt, the 5th century historian writes, Where each of the gods arose from, or whether all had always existed, and what they were like in form, they, the Greeks, did not know until yesterday or the day before, one might say. For I reckon that Hesiod and Homer existed not more than 400 years before me, and it is they who taught the Greeks the origin of the gods, Theogony, gave the gods their titles, eponymiae, distinguished the honours due them, timai, and their skills, technai, and indicated their forms. In effect, Herodotus transfers to the poets what he should, in the Theogony, 73, credited to Zeus, who, after the victory over his father Cronos, assigned honours, timai, to each of the immortals. Because Herodotus also makes implausible or demonstrably wrong assertions that the Greek religion largely came from Egypt, and that certain named individuals were solely responsible for introducing such institutions as the cult of Dionysos, his observations about the broad influence of poetry on religion have met with some skepticism. Ashery, Lloyd and Courtella 2007, 
34 to 6, 274 to 5. See also, in this volume, Kleibel, Chapter 41. The decipherment of Linear B in 1952, combined with increasingly sophisticated studies of polytheistic religions, made the fictional images of Epic look more idiosyncratic than had been suspected previously. Gradually, these images have come to seem less representative of the complex picture reconstructed from archaeological, linguistic, and epigraphic evidence. Epic leaves much unmentioned that must have been important on the ground, or stylizes it beyond easy recognition. Consequently, the bold statement of Herodotus about the role of poetry now seems less extreme a position. It is not impossible that fiction played the role Herodotus accords it. In approaching religion in Greek epic, we need to keep in mind that diverse traditions, a range of narrative options, and the changing rhetoric needed to satisfy various audiences prevent the easy reading of epic as embodying long-held Greek views. The depictions in epic must be interpreted, first of all, as part of a self-contained poetic imaginary, and only later as a source to be aligned with other religious discourses in Greek life of the 8th through 6th centuries BCE. Furthermore, the world of the two poets named by Herodotus existed alongside religious representations from now lost epics, especially the series of cyclic poems on the Trojan War and poems about traditions from Thebes or Corinth. In the pitiful fragments remaining, West 2003, we find such disparate depictions as Poseidon coupling with the fury, Erinus, in the form of a horse, the Bayed FR11, Zeus in pursuit of Nemesis, who takes the form of a fish, and ultimately bears Helen, Cypria FR. 10, and Zeus dancing, Titanomachy FR8. The lost epics also contained details at odds with what became mainstream traditions, that the gods were originally worshipped in the form of pillars, Veronis FR4, and Eumelus FR28, that the world emerged from the upper air, Ata, that Zeus was born in Lydia, and that Chai and the centaur first taught humans oaths, sacrifices, and the patterns of Olympos, Titanomachy FRR. 1, 2, and 13 respectively. The superiority of the Iliad and Odyssey over these other epics was recognized by Aristotle, poet. 1459-37, and it is largely due to such aesthetic judgments that we owe the poem's survival. If, however, we possessed only the cycle and other non-Homeric works, religious elements would appear more bizarre, arbitrary, and primitive than in the view given by the relatively more rational Homer and Hesiod. This chapter will focus on three types of Homeric episodes that bear a religious meaning, while distinguishing, as far as possible, literary intention from the representation of actual ritual. As we shall see, however, to avoid false dichotomies one must articulate the modes in which stylized acts and conventions, verbal and gestural, form a bond between the fictional and the real. Heroes in their cups. Like Herodotus, the poet of the Iliad takes an historical perspective. The warriors at Troy are sundered from the ordinary world of the present-day audience. Apart from the individual heroic deeds that can, in these latter days, only be accomplished by two men, such as Hector lifting a huge rock, Illinois. 12.447-9, the most conspicuous sign of the chronological chasm imagined by Homeric poetry occurs in the story of the wall hastily constructed by the Achaeans atop the bodies of their war dead. To Poseidon's objection that the new construction, made without a sacrifice to the gods, will obscure the fame of the city wall built earlier by him and Apollo, Zeus promises that the two gods will eventually overturn the threat, Illinois. 7.442-63. In a flash forward, Illinois. 12.5 to 35, Poseidon and Apollo are described flooding the plain, after the Trojan War, erasing all traces of the Achaean monument. Thus, the Iliad reimagines heroic ritual actions, but, at the same time, distances itself from a period when gods and heroes were in contact on the battlefield. In this regard, it resembles the poetry of Hesiod in which the age of heroes is sandwiched between the ages of bronze and iron, thus clearly marked off from the era of the narrating poet, Op 156-73. Unlike the Hesiodic vision, however, the Iliad deletes links to a possible hero cult, at least in the case of rituals surrounding the bones of individual warriors at Troy. 
For, as the poem implies, the absence of the wall means that the bodies it covered were also swept away. By contrast, Hesiod's mention of the godlike beings from the gold and silver ages dwelling on the earth, epicthonioi, or beneath the earth, eupokthonioi, op 123, 141, who are honoured after death appears to be a conscious allusion to a hero cult, Nagi 1999, 151-4. Generational difference may be a factor in depictions. Nestor, whose life spans three generations, has special status and vigour, frame 2009. Even among younger heroes, only Nestor easily lifts the ornate drinking vessel that he brought to the war, Illinois. 11.636-7. At a crucial point in the battle, Nestor escorts the wounded Gila Machaon off the field to his own hut. There his maid and war prize, with the significant name Hecamede, working with special skill from afar, provides a drink, Kaikian 624, of wine, cheese, and barley groats. The poem does not specify that Nestor now performs a ritual. Only the descriptions of Hecamede as like a goddess, 638, and the barley as sacred, Hiron, 631, hint at religious associations. Yet within archaic hexameter poetry, the Kaikian is clearly homologous to ritual by being a dietary symbol for suspended worlds, Kits 2001, 311. Furthermore, the archaic hymn to Demeter designates as Kaikian the mixed beverage, minus the cheese, that the goddess herself drinks while disguised at Eleusis. The hymnic reference clearly alludes to drinking Kaikian, thus named, as central to the Eleusinian ritual complex. Finally, the specific contexts, composition, and diction used to describe the Greek Kaikian support an ancient Indo-European heritage akin to Vedic Soma rituals, Watkins 1978. In sum, the Iliad's depiction of an apparently casual drink has definite ritual resonances, though within the poem it is simply heroic protocol. By tying the Kaikian ritual to the oldest warrior, Nestor, the poem may hint at its antiquity, although only comparative study reveals broader meanings. This strategy of secularization often marks Homeric poetics. In the Iliad, it extends even to the depiction of battle itself, since this can be viewed as an overarching ritual dedicated to the gods, Martin 1983 compared to Hiltabatel 1990. Larger questions of the audience's awareness of such deep connections, and of possible ritual origins of epic, deserve consideration. Another well-wrought vessel brought from home, Depus at Illinois. 16.225, same word for Nestor's at Illinois. 11.632, is significant in terms of special connections with the hero who uses it. Just as only Nestor could hoist his cup, so only Achilles drinks from this one, and the libations he pours from it are exclusively to Zeus, in his role as patron of Dodona, Illinois. 16.225-7 To mark the importance of the scene, the poet describes Achilles taking the cup from a chest packed by his mother that is, purifying it with sulphur, washing his hands, and carefully taking a position in the centre of his forecourt. Unlike Nestor's provision of the restorative Kaikian, Achilles pouring from the cup is a recognized ritual act, accompanied by a prayer to Zeus as Lord of Dodona, Pelasgian 1, Illinois. 16.233, unparalleled within Epic. In his recital of the past favor that Zeus granted in honoring him, Achilles expatiates about the distant cult site in the northern Greek territory of Pyros, mentioning its bad weather and its oracle interpreter priests the Seloi who sleep on the ground with unwashed feet. After the ethnographic details, he begs Zeus to grant his retainer, Patroclos, glory-bringing power, kudos, a spectacle that will, in turn, reflect well on himself. His final wish, for Patroclos to return unharmed after repelling the Trojans, is only half fulfilled by Zeus, Illinois. 16.249-52, a unique outcome for epic prayers. Greek law recorded that Pyrrha and Deucalion, the flood survivors, established the shrine of Zeus at Dodona, that Neoptolemos, son of Achilles, later came to colonize the surrounding area, and that Achilles himself had divine honours there, Plut. Pyrh. 1.1-4. 1 
Odysseus allegedly visited Dodona to obtain instructions from Zeus' oracle giving Oak Tree about managing his homecoming, OD. 14.327-30, 19.296-9. Archaeology has confirmed the importance of this cult site from Mycenaean to Greco-Roman times. Connecting the two central Homeric protagonists, Achilles and Odysseus, with the mythically oldest oracular site, predating Delphi, seems more than accidental. A historicizing drive behind epic here, too, may express the antiquity of tradition, underlining the genre's deep roots. Another way of viewing the connection raises a principle of general importance for epic religion, sometimes details about particular cults or gods may be selected for their thematic resonance within the poetry. The Seloi are doubly marked as having a paradoxical connection with the earth, on the one hand, impure, contrary to usual Greek qualifications, but, on the other, possessing special mantic powers. We are reminded of the prophet Melampus, Blackfoot, Gartsu Tati 1990. These curious details, seemingly inessential to Achilles' prayer, take on new meaning subsequently. Hearing of the death of Patroclos, Achilles himself defiles his head and body with dust and ashes, and sprawls in the dirt, Illinois. 18.23-7. Although stemming from crushing grief, these actions also carry signals of ritual debasement, as if Achilles, like the Seloi, is wholly removed from the world of mortals. The self-abasement of the suppliant Odysseus in the ashes of the Phaeacians' hearth, O.D. 7. 153-4, functions similarly. Both scenes bring together literary suspense establishing a dead point in the plot, with stylized ritual behavior. Another libation by Achilles further underlines his capacious heroic religion. During a magnificent funeral, the pyre of Patroclos will not light, Illinois. 23.192, so Achilles pours libations from a splendid goblet beseeching the winds Boreas and Zephyros. There ensues a carefully narrated type scene of message-bringing and guest reception, as the divine Iris transmits Achilles' request, and the winds rush across the sea to whip the flames, Illinois. 23.200-21. All night long, as the pyre rages, Achilles pours libations on the ground. Worth emphasizing is the narrative elaboration, based on the supremacy of the protagonist and the highly significant point in the plot. The poet creatively builds an initial failure of ritual, the smoldering pyre, into a spectacular display of the power of Achilles' prayer that instantly rouses the cosmos. Finally, Nestor's looming stature as ritual actor is glimpsed again when the poet of the Odyssey uses heroic libations for ironic effect, O.D. 3.40-64. Telemachus and Athena, disguised as mentor, approach the aged Pillion at a bull sacrifice, feeding 4,500 persons, for Poseidon. Nestor's son Pasistratus formally greets the elder of the pair with wine in a golden cup and directs him to pray to Poseidon, after which Telemachus will do the same. The prayer of Athena mentor is for glory for Nestor and his sons, and a grace-filled return, Carissa and for the rest of the Pylians, along with fulfillment of the mission of Telemachus. So she prayed, says the poet, O.D. 3.62, and she herself was bringing all to fulfillment. While an audience is surely amused at the sight of Athena thus getting the best of her traditional rival, and Nestor's familial patron, at the sea god's own feast, we should also note the close resemblance of her prayer to epigraphically attested formulations, e.g. CEG 326, the 7th century BCE Manticlo's dedication, on which see day 2010, 36 to 48. Hers is, in other words, the sort of utterance that could easily have been made in non literary contexts in the archaic period. The relationship to real ritual is further complicated by recent discoveries at Aino Engliano's, site of Apillian ruler's palace, evidencing repeated massive ritual consumption of cattle. The Odyssey's bull feast may echo real rites, Stocker and Davis 2004. In sum, the rituals associated with cups are representative of the tendency to heroize religion, but this is not solely epic exaggeration. In Mycenaean times and earlier, at least some outsized displays and practices already archaic, from Indo-European times, did in fact exist.
calling on the gods. Epic has an inherent aesthetic bias towards the evaluative prizing of well-done actions and performances. Most conspicuously, forceful speaking equates with powerful deeds as paired ideals of heroic behavior, Illinois. 9.443, other deeds such as prayer, vows, sacrifices, and dedications, comprising a tight nexus of religious acts, are thus also given poetic accreditation through Homeric song. Once again, there is the danger of being misled into thinking that any offering might embody an actual rite, rather than a stylized and composite vision within a fiction. Primarily, such rites arise as poetic events, highlighting and motivating narratives. In this brief account, we can focus only on one subcategory, prayer. While offering us a prime example of the connotative use of language, words employed to influence divinities, prayers are also rhetorical performances featuring conventional tropes. The type scene of prayer has been analyzed as having components such as the raising the hands, invocation of a god, recollection of past favors, and requests. Morrison 1991, 146 to 9. Edwards 1992, 315. Yet their typological accounting does not capture the kaleidoscope of styles found in individual prayers, shaped as they are by episodic characterizations. Within epic, prayers occur in virtually every major episode, and cover a broad spectrum. At one end, they are simply courtesy gestures, as when Odysseus in disguise, gladdened at the reception by his swineherd Eumaios, says may Zeus and the other immortals grant you that which you most desire, O.D. 14.53-4. The same hero, in a slightly different formulation, prays to Zeus that Telemachus obtain as much as he desires, O.D. 17.354-5. An audience finds irony in these simple wishes because it knows that both son and swine had themselves desire the triumphant return of the long-absent hero heard praying. In these cases, what might have been taken as a prayer for general, longer-term satisfaction, is shown by the narrative to have a specific, shorter-term result. Other prayers within the Iliad and Odyssey are more readily categorized by their intended time frames. Odysseus, in a footrace during the funeral games for Patroclos, for example, utters a prayer for more speed, which Athena grants at once, Illinois. 23.768-72 Immediate results are also called for by warriors in the heat of battle, as when Menelaus, casting his spear, prays that Zeus let him take vengeance on Paris for abducting Helen. Elevating his individual, short-term prayer to the level of general principle, he requests victory so that even one of the men to come might shudder to wrong a host who provides friendship, Illinois. 3.351-4. The prayer to Apollo by the wounded Glaucos for immediate aid, Illinois. 16.514-26, trans. Ladamore 2011, is a good example of how Epic uses expansion to turn a simple request into a more vivid episode, calling on the god to listen somewhere in the rich Lycian countryside or here in Troy, Glaucos details the crisis, my blood is not able to dry and stop running, my shoulder is aching beneath it, I cannot hold my spear up steady, informs Apollo of Sarpedon's death and requests healing so that he may rouse his Lycian comrades to recover the corpse. Incongruous as such lengthy self-diagnosis might seem from someone in pain on the field, the prayer nevertheless convinces the audience of the seriousness of Glauco's wound, sums up the plot, and foreshadows the next phase of battle, even as it affirms Apollo's constant support for the Trojans. It well illustrates Epic's interweaving of characterization, exposition, and religion, through the device of speech directed to the gods. At times, the request for immediate intervention is accompanied by a vow to repay the god later. Thus, Pandoros, encouraged by the disguised Athena, includes in his prayer to Apollo a promise to sacrifice a hecatom of firstling lambs on his return home to Zalea, Illinois. For point one one nine to 21 At other times, such a vow is accompanied by a material sign of dedication, as a promise of future sacrifice once the outcome is assured. An especially elaborate scene with this structure comes when the priestess Theano leads the women of Troy to the temple of Athena to place a robe, peplos, on the lap of the goddess statue, with a ritual cry, Illinois. 
6.297 to 311. The request that Athena stop the enemy warrior Diams is followed by a promise to dedicate 12 heifers immediately, or to Canaan, Illinois. 6.308, this Athena denies, Illinois. 6.311, though it is unclear whether her statue makes a gesture of the head, or the listening audience, not the Trojan women, simply realizes her refusal. The offering scene has reminded some of a parallel in the Athenian ritual year, the offering of a peplos to the city's patron goddess during the Panathenaea festival. This apparent correspondence, however, rather than being a straightforward injection into epic of one actual event, is better understood as a multilayered evocation of cultural practices involving weaving, women, and celebration, Nagi 2012, 266-72. It is psychologically apt that Homeric prayers occur when mortals need divine help to influence forces beyond their control. The natural bias towards the future, in wishes that point gods towards a certain course of action, is balanced in many prayers by reference to the speaker's ritual piety in the past. Penelope prays to Athena that her son Telemachus safely escape the suitors, while reminding the goddess of her husband's past sacrifices of heifers and sheep, O.D. For point seven six one to six, this reminder, a frequent convention in both literary and non-poetic prayers, takes on new vividness in Penelope's version as she plays on the sound shared by the verb nesai, be mindful. For point seven six five, and the noun nesteras, suitors, in the next line, od. For point seven six six, poetic creativity at the level of character speech not only underlines the essential basis for her request but also affirms her reputation for clever inventiveness. The entire Iliad is put into motion by a similar act of parental prayer, when the priest Chryses seeks the return of his daughter, taken as a prize of war for Agamemnon. Beseeching the commanders, Chryses frames his supplication with a wish that the Olympian gods grant the destruction of Troy and departure of the besiegers, followed by an admonishment to revere the god Apollo, whose scepter, with its ritual fillets, he bears as a sign of office. Roughly dismissed by Agamemnon, the old man calls on his patron god. His invocation, adorned with the god's titles and named sanctuaries, recalls his past worship, the building of a shrine and offerings of bulls and goats, but is focused on the future. Through your arrows, let the Danans pay back my tears, Illinois. 1.35-42 The subsequent plague leads to the quarrel between Agamemnon and Achilles, the latter's withdrawal, the supplication of Zeus by the Tees, Illinois. 1. 502 to 10, the crushing loss of warriors on both sides, and, finally, another old man's supplication for his child's return, Priam for Hector's corpse. In their epic deployment, then, prayers mark moods and predict narrative trajectories. The motif of vengeance fits especially well with prayer, once stated by an aggrieved party and approved by a god, the desired payback becomes a poetic goal, as the audience knows the final outcome, although not the exact method by which it will be achieved. Polyphemus the Cyclops, blinded by Odysseus, prays to his father Poseidon for vengeance, mentioning two narrative options either that his enemy never get home, or that he makes it back to Ithaca late, with no crew, and embroiled in domestic strife, O.D. 9.528-36 the latter happens, as had been predicted by the Ithacan prophet Halitherses, O.D. 2.171-6. Such parallels between prayer and prophecy highlight the close relationship among mortal desires, divine plans, and the abilities of some humans to articulate the future. The vengeance motif gains more persuasive authority each time an audience hears of another application, and thus guides listeners' expectations. The reverse of the interaction between Poseidon and his son Polyphemos is narrated by Phoenix, as part of his appeal to Achilles in the embassy scene, Illinois. 9.447-57 As Phoenix recounts the event that led to his eventual role as Achilles' guardian, we are reminded of the essential similarity between praying and cursing. In Greek, the latter verb is a prefixed form of the former, my curse, pray against versus my pray, See also, in this volume, verse 0, chapter 30. For alienating the affections of his father's concubine, 
Phoenix was condemned by his father's curse, abetted by Zeus and Persephone, to be childless. A similar parental curse featured in the lost epic The Bade, FR2 West. In sum, the representation of Homeric prayers as almost always successfully fulfilled primes the listeners of epic for predictable results. The totality of such recurrent plot events, shown or recollected, narrated by the poet or the characters, crystallizes into a form of belief. Epic thereby regulates the religious imagination. Conditionally cursing oneself is the core action within oath-taking. Two key scenes in the Iliad represent this ceremony in elaborate detail, Kits 2005. Comparisons with ancient Near Eastern sources make it plausible that the epic here captures the features of actually occurring ritual, whether contemporary or historical. In each scene, the accompanying prayer is highly developed. Before the duel of Menelaus and Paris, Agamemnon calls on Zeus ruling from Ida, greatest most glorious, the sun Aelios, rivers, the earth, and, euphemistically, those who take vengeance in the underworld on oathbreakers, before setting out in precise legal detail the binding conditions under which the fight will take place and the consequences for either side, Greeks and Trojans, Illinois. 3.275-300. Anonymous warriors on both sides add a prayer that oathbreakers should be killed, their brains flowing out like the wine poured in libation. When Achilles is ready to return to the war, Agamemnon carries out his second oath ritual, this time invoking the same divinities, and explicitly naming the Furies, to attest to the fact that he did not violate Achilles' war bride Briseis, Illinois. 19.255-65. Unlike the epic appropriation of prayer format elsewhere for exposition and characterization, these two examples offer cases where dictional elaboration, rather than doing aesthetic work, instead provides the specificity that one would require in a performative utterance with social consequences for the real world. Realistic as prayer and related rituals appear to be within early Greek epic, one key factor separates fictional representations from actual experience, the point of view available to an omniscient narrator. Through the technique of juxtaposition, the poet can, without further comment, produce for an audience effects of suspense, characterization, and distancing that are clearly different from what the fictive participants experience within the poem. Early in the Iliad, a clear example arises when an elite group is summoned by Agamemnon to sacrifice to Zeus a five-year-old ox, Illinois. 2.402-18. The commander prays to cast down Priam's palace and slay Hector before the sun sets that day. The narrator's point of view intervenes, however, to present a different perspective, he spoke, but none of this was the son of Kronos yet authorizing, he accepted the holy victims, but was adding to the dire hardship, Illinois. 2.419-20. The narrative tailpiece to the prayer is thus more in tune with the brief but brilliant lines that occur just before Agamemnon initiates his exclusive sacrifice, and that provide yet another angle of vision. Ordinary fighters cook their own dinners among the ships, each man sacrificing to one or another of the eternal gods praying to evade death and the grind of ours, Illinois. 2.400-1. With grim irony, Agamemnon's overconfident prayer for conquest contrasts with the words of anonymous soldiers who wish merely to survive. Perhaps the most intricate of such complex contrastive scenarios is that which pairs prayers by Penelope and Odysseus, after their first meeting in twenty years, O.D. 20.60-90. Unaware, apparently, that she spoke with her husband the previous night, Penelope, in tears, prays to Artemis to be killed instantly or swept off by a blast of wind, as once were the daughters of Pandarius, rather than marry a lesser man. Odysseus, hearing his wife's laments, begs Zeus for a double omen, O.D. 20.98-101, verbal and visual, theme and terrors. Zeus obliges, his flash of lightning prompts a serving woman nearby to pray that the suitors die on this day, O.D. 20.102-21. As in the Iliad scene of multiple prayers, the poet here voices three points of view within a short compass. Once again, there is a subtle balance between right and literary application. On one hand, Odysseus carries out what was most likely a standard divinatory practice, cladonomancy, or praying for omens, 
one possibly having an archaic heritage. The employment of an oxhide recalls the medieval Irish Tarpfeis divination rite, MacKillop 2006, 56 8, used to determine the identity of a new king. On the other, the poet has incorporated his ritual prayer into a larger compositional unit full of poignancy and suspense. Are these patterns purely poetic convention? Since the bulk of our testimony, even from later periods, also comes from poetry, it is difficult to answer. But ancient works that at least purport to record or comment on contemporary events, the plays of Aristophanes, the histories of Herodotus, Thucydides, and Xenophon, Plato's dialogues, and Athenian oratory, confirm that the basic structures of Homeric prayer might still have been heard in real society during the classical period. What the Iliad and Odyssey do describe, which later works largely screen out, are the lineaments of beliefs, the immediacy of divine action, the general efficacy, but also failure, of prayer and sacrifice when gods have other designs, the moments in which prayer is suitable, and the assumption that all people in situations of stress depend on the gods, as the young Pesistratus asserts at O.D. 3.48. The sort of thick description that the ethnographer of religious practices in real situations has to observe or elicit is put on display albeit in stylized poetic form in the social interactions we see through epic. While it remains true that a fictional narrative is driving such theological speculation, it would be hazardous to assume that Greeks of the Archaic period did not invest belief in their poetic traditions, or did not accommodate their daily lives to some approximation of the religious imaginary therein. Gods and Songs When the elderly phoenix wants to persuade Achilles to re-enter the fight before Troy, he employs, among other strategies, an allegory about personified prayers of supplication, the Litai, Illinois. 9.502-14 Describing them as lame and aged daughters of Zeus, who slowly follow in the path of ruin, to heal its victims, the old man observes that the Litai also punish those who refuse them and thus implies Achilles should heed his own supplications. This vignette of a character employing an unabashed religious fiction offers a valuable counterpoint for the rhetoric of the Iliad itself. Unlike Phoenix, the poet does not construct personifications of the divine that then act according to some limited plot line, the purpose of which is to illustrate a moral or ethical truth, how supplication works, for example. In fact, the Iliad commands attention precisely because it is not a didactic epic. The very act of supplication, which runs through it like a spine, is constantly questioned, nuanced, or held in suspense until, ironically, Achilles himself, meeting with the suppliant Priam, tells the old man a didactic story, the tale of Niobe, Illinois. 24.601-20, before returning Hector's corpse. Unlike allegory, Homeric poetry creates three-dimensional, believable figures with individual characteristics, from the quarrelling Zeus and Hera to the errant Aphrodite. Nevertheless, as early as the 6th century BCE, allegorical interpretation was applied to Homeric poetry, as we learn from ancient testimonia about Theogenes of Region, who read the Battle of the Gods episode in the Iliad as a clash among the personified elements of fire, water, and air, for 2003, 68-76. Homer's status as theologian dominated late antique discussions, Lamberton 1989. Without adopting this influential mode, we must still acknowledge that epic, at the macro level, sets itself up as a sort of privileged communication between a poet and the gods, in particular between an inspired singer, Aoidos, and the muses or Apollo. It is thus a religious, and probably ritual, act, both for composers and their audiences. Cult festivals, the most likely setting for Homeric performances, would have reinforced the religious framing, as with Athenian drama, performed in ritual conditions within the precincts of Dionysos. We should take this framing conceit at face value, but also should expand it by examining the variety of divine, mortal communications in the poems, especially those mediated by prophetic figures. In this way, a fuller realization can be achieved concerning the genre's self positioning as narrative sent by gods. Hesiod's Theogony gives the most elaborate depiction of divine sources of poetic information. The muses visit and inspire the bard, and command that he sing of them, their father Zeus, and all the immortals, 
just as the Muses themselves eternally commemorate their divine relations, Thieg. 1-34. His role therefore borders on that of the seer, both as one who has seen goddesses in person, and one who knows all that will be and that was, Thieg. 32. The proems of the Iliad and Odyssey represent a poet-divinity transaction in shorter form. The narrator calls on an unnamed goddess in the first line of the Iliad to sing the wrath of Achilles son of Peleus, asking specifically which of the gods joined the hero in strife with Agamemnon, and then immediately providing, or ventriloquizing, the answer, Apollo. The opening thus makes a request to one god for information about another, and the narration unwinds from this naming of divine origin. The Odyssey poet, by contrast, names the goddess from whom he seeks information, Musa, O.D. 1.1, asks to be told in detail, in Eep, rather than for a song, but keeps his protagonist hero unnamed for another twenty lines. Unlike the Iliad proem, a god's action is mentioned in the Odysseys, Aelios annihilated the crew members who devoured his cattle, and the introductory segment closes with more detail about the transaction in progress. The muse is additionally invoked as goddess, daughter of Zeus and asked to tell the tale from whichever point she chooses. As in the Iliad, here too the storyline is immediately tied directly to divinities, Athena, who approaches Zeus on behalf of her favourite, Odysseus, now that Poseidon has left for a feast among the Ethiopians. Both the Iliad and Odyssey provide more details about the divine role in epic composition. When the Iliad poet begins the extensive catalogue of ships, he calls on the Olympian muses to bring to mind, Mnesiath, Illinois. 2.492, the names and numbers that, left to his own devices and physical capacity, he could neither recall nor narrate. It is their immortal existence, as opposed to distant, mortal ephemerality, that forces the poet to call on their collective memory, for you are goddesses and you are present and know all, while we hear only the fame, Cleos, and know not a thing, Illinois. 2.4856. This concise summary of epic poetics is also a theological statement built upon on the essential and stark contrast running throughout Greek thinking about the relative strength of gods and mortals. The Odyssey's depictions of two bards, Phemios in Ithaca and Demodokos among the Phaeacians, contain several further hints about the key role of divinity. Penelope specifies the local poet's repertoire as comprising works of gods and humans, O.D. 1.338, when she attempts to make Phemios change his tune, while her son's spirited defense of the poet's current rendition, the ill-fated return of the Achaeans from Troy, mentions the gods only as the ultimate cause of the sorrowful events narrated, O.D. 1.346-52. The Blind Demodokos, Beloved of the Muse, O.D. 8.63, is moved by her directly to sing glorious deeds of men, O.D. 8.73, when he tells the less respectable stories of gods, the adultery of Ars and Aphrodite, the bard is conspicuously not said to be guided by the goddess of song, O.D. 8.266, Odysseus, who himself tells stories like a bard, praises the entire race of poets as beloved of the muse, who instructs them in the ways of song, O.D. 8. 480 to 1, slightly later he envisions the possibility that Apollo taught Demodokos, O.D. 8.488, towards the end of the poem, Phemio supplicates the raging Odysseus with a veiled warning that to kill him would bring suffering, because he sings to gods and morals, and, though self-taught, yet draws on the ways of song that a god has planted in my mind, O.D. 22.345 to 8. The intervention of Telemachus to save Phemios prevents us from discovering whether his further argument, that he is fit to sing to Odysseus as to a god, O.D. 22.348-9, had persuasive force. But that the bard could venture it suggests how epic and personal praise poetry for mortals in the form of hymns were closely related performance registers. The notion of divine inspiration extends beyond poets to all who show some special talent, such as Carpenters, Illinois. 5.60-3. Athena, as mentor, generalizes the principle that a divinity provides assistance at need to those who are already in some way promising, O.D. 3.25-8. But, in epic, the other major category of inspired actors is prophets, 
including readers of bird signs and other diviners, like the Seer Cultures, who guided the Greeks to Troy and owed his craft to Apollo, Illinois. 1.72 One of the interesting realistic devices of Homeric poetry is its refusal to impose one prophetic point of view, as we have seen in the case of prayers. The contestation over interpretation of signs often becomes the main point of a scene. For instance, when Telemachus has vowed vengeance against the suitors and Zeus sends as confirmation two fighting eagles, the aged seer Halitharsis warns that Odysseus is on his way home, O.D. 2.157-76 The suitor Euromachos dismisses this on the grounds that not all bird signs are faithful in Asimoi. Like Agamemnon, who similarly scorns a prophet in the beginning of the Iliad, Euromachos eventually meets a bad end, in his case, shot down by Odysseus. An audience is thus forced to withhold judgment about the immediate contest of interpretations until the plot wins up. Such scenes demonstrate that, at least in the Homeric imaginary, one could dispute the workings of the whole semiotic system, or whether the notion of signs, of special bird signs, or the sound of thunder, etc., is even operative. The challenge of Euromachos is not to offer an alternative explanation, but to question the very basis of interpretation. The most famous scenario of contested interpretation occurs at Illinois. 12.195-250 When Hector, leading a charge against the Achaean Wall, sees an eagle drop a snake it has just killed among the troops. His brother, Polydamas the seer, tries to dissuade him from the attack, the Trojans might fail, just as the snake failed to bring home its prey. Hector lashes out, Illinois. 12.233, insisting that Zeus is on their side, and adding the oft-quoted line one bird of omen is best, to defend the fatherland, Illinois. 12.243, ironically, the audience does know that the will of Zeus tilts towards honouring Achilles. The episode therefore presents an arresting characterization of different ways of being, not that of the religious versus the rational man, as has often been propounded, but between men voicing competing brands of theological semiosis. Which signs one relies on are open to dispute, as is the authority by which mortals know the will of Zeus. Paradoxically, the Homeric audience does know the god's will, because it hears the voice of the poet. It is significant that the only means of mantic communication within Homeric epic that is never questioned is that based on direct voices from gods, unmediated by readers of signs that are exposed to interpretive disputation. When Hellenus overhears Apollo and Athena agreeing to encourage a duel, and relays this information to his brother Hector, nobody questions his veracity, Illinois. 77.37-53 the activity of Hellenus is iconic for the activity of the archaic poets, who present us with the dialogues of the gods, as if directly and intimately overheard. Homer and Hesiod frame their poems as representing what they have apprehended from the gods, via the muses. This carries more meaning than a literary conceit. Conclusion Epic balances the heroic size and uniqueness of some rituals, Nestor's and Achilles, with the ordinary circumstances and rhetoric of others, prayers. The occurrence of both types in the poems, the heroic but also the demotic, should not be taken as an awkward compromise. Rather, we might understand this double aspect as metonymic for the complementary blending of elements that occurs naturally in any set of religious practices and beliefs, ancient or modern. Greek epic is neither a transparent window onto archaic beliefs, nor a fascinating, unreal entertainment. Overall, if we follow the definition of the anthropologist Clifford Geertz, epic religion is itself a valid variety of religion, a system of symbols which acts to establish powerful, pervasive, and long-lasting moods and motivations in men by formulating conceptions of a general order of existence and clothing these conceptions with such an aura of factuality that the moods and motivations seem uniquely realistic, Geertz 1966, 4. Suggested reading. On religion in Homer, Burkett 1985, especially 119-89, still provides a good starting point. Kearns 2004 offers an overview of more recent work. Gould 1985 contextualizes poetic depictions within a wider analysis of Greek practices as does Price 1999.
especially 11 to 46. Nagi 1999 is a detailed study of heroes in cult and poetry. Burgess 2001 provides a full analysis of the cyclic epics. Crotty 1994 studies the poetics of supplication ritual in epic. Mjolnir 1976 is an essential semantic analysis of the workings of Homeric prayer. Siegel 1994 discusses bardic inspiration, as does, more broadly, Murray 1996. On Hesiod's religious thought, see Strauss Clay 2003. Chapter 12. Art and Imagery. Tonya S. She asterisk. I N the temple of Athena at Troy stood the image of the goddess. So says Homer's Iliad in an impressive episode, 6.297. This image is visited by the Trojan women, under the leadership of Queen Hecabe and the priestess Theano, and receives a precious gift. They lay a splendid garment on her knees and beg the statue for deliverance from the perils of war, but the goddess nods refusal. The image of Athena at Troy is obviously a statue of anthropomorphic form, although this is not stated. Access to the image, and therefore its visibility, is restricted, the priestess keeps the key to the temple, and controls access. To what extent did the women, and naturally also the men, of classical Athens feel themselves directly addressed when they heard this tale, for instance, on the occasion of the Rhapsodes' performance at the Great Panathenaea, PLI on 530b, compared to Savinuin with 2011, 284-307. Did it seem to them representative of their own experience of the depiction of the divine in the context of private and civic space? To what degree did the scenario correspond to the expectations and ritual customs that accompanied the depiction of the divine in contemporary Athens, cf. Savinuin Wood 2011, 307-11, see also, in this volume, Platt, Chapter 33. Which forms of this visualization were familiar to an Athenian audience from their own environment, Gaithman 2006. Did the Trojan women's dealings with the image of the goddess in the temple strike the Athenians as a useful way of obtaining their request? Was the presence of the divine a prerequisite for the granting of their plea, for the different theories regarding religious perception compared to Ike 2011, 56 92? My remarks will focus on Athens as a particularly important example. The extant sources do not suggest that the citizens of the other Greek polis like Tegea, Corinth, or Syracuse acted differently in dealing with the images of the gods. Divine images in the oikos and in public space. The form of the gods was imparted to the Athenians in word and image from their childhood, even wet nurses, according to Plato in the 4th century BCE, would tell stories and myths to children, laws 887d. With the acquisition of language came the knowledge of traditional tales, whose protagonists were gods and heroes. These tales could also be absorbed visually in many Athenian households. Inside the home, Athenians could have their first encounters with images of the gods. The appearance and deeds of the gods were represented on many thousands of Attic vases, from c.650 BCE in black figure and from 530-25 BCE mostly in red figure. On wine and water vessels, drinking cups, and various containers for household supplies, myths and images of the gods came into the Athenian home. Gaithman 2006, 264 to 6, Platt 2011, 93 to 6. The vase painters confirmed what was made clear in the mythic tales: the gods, in their visible forms, were not restricted to natural human shapes. Hermes, for example, was depicted in vase paintings not only as a handsome young man, as in Homeric epic, but in the shape of a ham a pillar whose only anthropomorphic elements were the head of a bearded man with an archaic hairstyle and a phallus, Seabrook 1990. But the meaning of vase paintings as visualizations of the divine in private space can be reconstructed only with difficulty. The literary sources scarcely mention this sort of painting, so our knowledge of the nature and manner of its reception must rest on conjecture, for the different interpretations compared to Schmidt and Starley 2012. It is hard to say to what extent children came into contact with visual representations of the gods in the context of the domestic family cult. 
The ancestral gods of a family were evidently conceived of as tangible and concrete otherwise it is hard to explain why the Athenian Leocrates, in the 4th century BCE, incurred the reproach of having betrayed his fatherland because he left Athens after the Battle of Chironea and had his household gods sent on to Megara, Lycurg, Leoc. 25, she 2000, 226-7. But the children of the Athenians may certainly have learned from family rituals that pictorial or even anthropomorphic representations of the gods were not absolutely necessary for cultic worship. Hestia, for instance, was worshipped at the hearth without an image, and Zeus Ctesios, who guarded household property, may have been embodied only by a bulbous earthenware vessel, Ath, 11.473b, Parker 2005, 19, Gaithman 2012. 126. The first three-dimensional images of the gods encountered by Athenian citizens in public spaces probably did not represent the goddess Athena. Instead, it was Hermes who stood before the entrances of houses, a plat. 1153, and at street corners, in the partly human representation of the Herm. The Athenians felt the four-sided Hermes pillars to be particularly typical of their city, Thuk. 6.27, Gaithman 2012, 66. The great number of the Hermi, as well as their proximity to houses and the free access to them, may have contributed to their popularity, which is also reflected in their occurrence in vase paintings, see, in this volume, Dylan, chapter 17. Passers-by and people on their way home are shown in confidential talk or physical contact with Hermi, whose age can evidently even be adapted to the people facing them. Anub. 1479 to 81, Zanka 1965, 95, Seabrook 1990, number 105, 141, similarly also Steiner 2001, 134. The Athenians' indignation at the mutilation of the Hermi during the Peloponnesian War, fuck. 6.27, compare to lies. 6.11, Osborne 1985, Parker 1996, 80 to 2, she 2000, 234 to 9, is also attributable to the fairly close connection that every individual had established from childhood with this sort of statue. The prevalence of Hermi was one indication of how strongly the space of the city was marked by depictions of the divine. Anyone going out of his house saw a Herm in front of him and anyone coming overland to Athens was accompanied by Hermes that the tyrant Hipparchos is supposed to have had erected between the Attic Demis and the Agora in the 6th century BCE, P. L. Hipparch. 228c, 229a, Ruckert 1998, 57-8, Crawley Quinn 2007, 93-5. And the Herm was only one of a dense net of images of various gods that covered the city. The Athenians' access to images of Athena, in comparison to the Hermi, was quite restricted, as in Epic Troy, the statues of the city's goddess were to be found especially on the Acropolis and within sanctuaries. But from the 5th century BCE onwards, anyone rounding Cape Saunian in a ship likewise saw the spear point of the monumental bronze statue of Athena on the Acropolis glinting in the sun, Pows. 1.28. 2. A site that must also have attracted the glance of everyone who looked upwards in the city itself, Gil 2001, 270. The designation of this statue as Athena Promachos is first attested much later, in the 4th century CE, Skull. Democrat 22.13. The detail of the shining spear point, however, evoked the statue of Athena as well as associations with the totality of other images of Athena in the city and on the Acropolis, the goddess, visible to all, dominated the city. On the occasion of public festivals, the ubiquity of depictions of the various gods in public spaces was impressed upon all residents of the Athenian polis. In the Panathenaic procession, for example, young girls acting as canephori, basket bearers, and young men of military age on horseback escorted the peplos for Athena, Niels 1996a, 185, Parker 2005, 263-4, Connolly 2007, 33-9. Just as at Troy, the goddess of the city received a garment as a gift.
The Panathenaic Way led the girls and youths past the image of Athena in the temple of Hephaestos, and they encountered both the Hermi and the Agora, Ath, 4.167, Pals. 1.15.1, Ruck at 1998, 74, 88, and the statue of Hermes Propyleos on the ascent of the Acropolis, Pals. 1.22.8, Ruck at 1998, 65. On the Acropolis they were greeted by the colossal, nine-meter-high bronze statue of Athena Promachos, whose spear point they had, until then, perhaps seen only from below. Here, innumerable private and public votive offerings, votive reliefs, statues, statuettes, painted clay tablets, and so on, recalled the form of Athena and other gods, Kiesling 2003, and generally on the meaning of the votive offerings, Kint 2012, 64-7. At the same time, the rear tympanum of the Parthenon was visible, evoking the image of Athena and her deeds for the city. During the festival of the goddess, the doors of the temples stood open and allowed the temple images on the Acropolis to be seen, these two differing greatly from one another in shape, size, material, and age. In contrast to the situation in mythical Troy, there stood on the Athenian Acropolis not one image of the goddess, but many. Concrete contexts of visualization, the Athena Polias, the Pelagian, and the Athena Parthenos. From this multiplicity, two statues of the civic goddess particularly stood out, the so-called Athena Polias and the Athena in the Parthenon. These two famous images make clear the methodological difficulties of reconstructing the contexts, the perception, and finally the religious meaning of divine images in Athens, and indeed in Greek culture as a whole. The statues themselves, and this is true of the overwhelming majority of divine images in Greece, have not survived. The literary references prove to be fragmentary, ambiguous, and chronologically late. Pausanias describes the Athena Polias as the holiest object of the Athenians, Pals. 1.26.6, but every detail of the image's context turns out to be controversial, including its appearance, its origin, and its location on the Acropolis. The statue apparently was made of olive wood, skull. Democrat 22.13. Its size is unclear, for discussion, see Harrington 1955, Romano 1980, 47, Kroll 1982, Mansfield 1985, 135-88. Nor is it even certain if the goddess was depicted sitting or standing. Accordingly, it cannot be determined if other images of Athena on the Acropolis, either seated terracotta statuettes or standing marble statues, may have referenced this image of Athena, compared to Demand 1984, Numbers 15 to 25, Ridgeway 1992, 122. The statue wore clothes and jewelry, Kroll 1982, 68. In the 5th century BCE it seems to have held an owl in one hand and an offering bowl in the other, Ridgeway 1992, 120-1, Lapotan 2001, 78. It is uncertain, however, when these attributes were added. The stories of its origin also indicate that the aesthetic qualities of this image were not very important, it is not attributed to a sculptor. On the contrary, it was the lack of a human creator that emphasized the importance of the statue. But even the ancient sources disagree on its provenance, it is said to have been erected by the Athenian king's Erichthonios, Apollod. Bibble 3.14.6, or Kekrops, Euseb. Praep. Ivan 10 September 1922. Pausanias even reported that the statue had fallen from the sky in ancient times, Paus. 1.26.6, it is probable that, in the 5th-4th century BCE, it was, in fact, already a very old wooden image, which was evacuated to the Athenians' ships during the Persian Wars, she 2000, 215-18. But this is not explicitly stated in the sources. The location of this image cannot be completely reconstructed either. At the end of the 5th century BCE, the statue stood in what is now known as the Erechtheion, which served as successor to the old temple of Athena, that was destroyed or at least severely damaged in the Persian Wars. 
It is not certain where it was stored in the over 50 years between the Persian invasion and the completion of the erect iron in the last quarter of the 5th century BCE, on the topographical uncertainties, see Ridgeway 1992, 124, Harris 1996, 202-4. The religious contextualization of this image is difficult. It certainly seems that this statue was the recipient of the peplos, but the reconstruction of this ritual devotion to the statue raises questions. It is not clear from the sources whether the ceremonial gift of a garment was given only every four years at the Great Panathenea, Parker 2005, 265, or also in the intervening years, on the occasion of the Lesser Panathenea, Savinu Inwood 2011, 267. Indications that the peplos for Athena was presented in the Panathenaic procession as the sail of a ship have reinforced the suspicion that it was too large for the ancient and hence small wooden statue. Therefore, the latter could not have been clothed in the Panathenaic peplos, but would have required another, smaller garment, Mansfield 1985, 43-5, Barber 1992, 113-14. Only this smaller peplos, then, would have been woven by the Athenian women, while paid male artisans must have made the true Panathenaic peplos, Mansfield 1985, 54. But the size of the statue is also unknown, nor is the size of the wheeled ship certain. Therefore, an oversized peplos for the statue of the goddess remains hypothetical, for discussion, see also Reuthner 2006, 322. Finally, it is unclear whether the image of Athena Polias really wore the Panathenaic peplos at all, or whether the garment was, as in the Homeric phrase, merely laid on its knees, Hon. Illinois, 6.273. In any case, a robing of the image did not take place immediately, but is conceivable only within the framework of another festival, the Plinteria, which took place ten months after the Panathenaea, Poc 1977, 38-41. Niels 1996a, 185, cautiously Romano 1980, 51. This second ritual context, in which the old wooden image of Athena on the Acropolis played a role, also gives an example of the difficulties caused by the material. By tradition, women from the family of the Praxiagidae were responsible for carrying out the ritual, IGI 37, Romano 1980, 47 9, Niels 1996a. 185. Once a year the polias was taken from its base, clothed and cleaned. The day of the plinteria was considered a day of bad omen, probably because the image of the goddess was not in its place, Zen. Hell. The 1st of April 2012, Platt. Alk 34.1, she 2000, 59. To the question of whether the goddess wore only a cleaned dress or a new one, the sources give as little answer as to the broader question of whether this garment was the actual Panathenaic peplos, Savinu Inwood 2011, 150 and 51, 158. Philochoros, FGRH 328F 64B from the 3rd century BCE, and inscriptions from the 2nd century BCE, IG 221006.11-12, IG 221008.9-10, IG 2211.10-11, report the procession of an image of Athena to Phaleron on the sea, with the participation of the Ephebes. Whether this information relates to the image of Athena Polias is controversial, the procession is either connected with above-mentioned plinteria for Athena Polias, Savinu Inwood 2011, 159, probably so, according to Parker 2005, 478, while Romano 1980, 49 to 50 is skeptical, or, according to another hypothesis, this ritual was for the Athenian Pelagian, Mansfield 1985, 424 to 33, Robertson 1996 b, 33, 389 to 91. This brings up another image of Athena, whose possession was apparently claimed by the Athenians, Athenian judges met in cases of accidental manslaughter epi Palladio, at the Palladian, Arist. Ath, Paul. 57.3, Powers. 1.28.8, Ail. VH 5.15. Beyond its own venerable and precious images of Athena on the Acropolis, 
the city of Athens wished apparently to possess also, in the Pelagian, the most famous image of Athena in Greek history, Demon 1984, number 67 to 117, Savinuin with 2011, 246 to 62. Such a claim made the connection with Troy direct, the Pelagian, as the epic cycle states, Iliupasis fr1 Allen equals Dionysios Hal, at 1.68, 2-69, Betanetti 2001, 71-3, is said to have been a gift from Zeus to the Trojans, and had guaranteed the safety of Troy for ages. Originally it had fallen from heaven, as the Athena Polias had supposedly fallen to the Athenian Acropolis. Only after Odysseus and Diem stole the Pelagian could Troy be conquered. Attic vase paintings of the 5th century BCE attest to knowledge of the Pelagian myths in classical Athens, Plat 2011, 93 5, Savinian Wood 2011, 241. But making the presence of this divine image believable in Athens, it was also claimed by cities such as Argos, Sparta, and later Rome, Paos. 2.23.5, Ferran 1992, 7, She 2000, 91 required substantial adjustments in the mythological tradition, either the Athenians had received the Pelagian already in Troy, or, on their way home from Troy, Diams and his Argives accidentally landed on the coast of Attica, considered it enemy territory, and attacked it. In defending his country, the Athenian king Damophon forcibly took the Pelagian from the Argives, Skull. Democrat 23.71, Pows. 1.28.9, Betanetti 2001, 74. In any case, this image did not stand on the Acropolis. The location of the Epi Palladio Law Court has yet to be identified, the still uncertainly located temple on the Alyssos, Crum 1993, 213 to 27, Robertson 1996 b, 392 to 408, has been proposed as a possible site for the Palladian. It is unclear whether, when, and how an Athenian Pelagian was made accessible to the citizens, whether it was already an object in that procession of the Ephebes to Phaleran in classical times, and whether it received other cultic honours and was cared for by special cultic personnel, Savinuin with 2011, 246. In this case, late literary sources connect Athens with a foreign divine image with the potential to overshadow the locally most important local depiction of the city goddess, the image of Athena Polias. But this did not happen. It cannot be ruled out that the claim to the Trojan Pelagian was mostly a matter of mythographical construction and was not really reflected in the religious life of classical Athens. In its immediate neighborhood, another divine image competed with the old wooden statue of the Polias, the gold and ivory Athena of Phadias, the most materially precious divine image in Athens and perhaps the most impressive of all representations of Athena. This statue does not survive either, but on the basis of copies and coin images an idea of its appearance can be reconstructed, Demand 1984, Numbers 20-2, Nick 2002, 177-205. The gold and ivory colossus was 12 meters high, Plin. HN 36-18, Powers. 1.24.57, Lapotin 2001, 62-78. At least 40 talents of gold, in the form of removable gold plates, were used for the dress of the goddess, Thuk, 2.13.5, Lapotin 2001, 64, and her flesh consisted of ivory over a wooden core. The goddess was represented standing with her weapons, with a statue of Nike in her hand and a shield set on the ground beside her. The relief on the shield referred once again to Athenian prehistory, showing Theseus, king of Attica, in heroic times, defeating the Amazons who were said to have attached Athens, Lapotin 2001, 66, with references. This monumental image also stood on the Acropolis, in the Parthenon. The base of the statue has survived, and thus its location is known. A pool of water in front of the statue created a constant humidity, Pals. The 5th of November 2010, that helped protect the delicate material and reflected the sheen of the gold, Steiner 2001, 102. The Athena in the Parthenon differed from the old image of the Polias not only in appearance, but also in origin. 
While the provenance of the wooden image is lost in the mists of history, the divine images of the 5th century BCE came into being through the involvement of the citizens. The gold and ivory image in the Parthenon was probably financed by order of the Athenian assembly as a gift of thanks to the goddess for victory in the Persian Wars. Building accounts show expenditures for production of the statue in the years 447 to 438, IGI 3 436 to 51, 453 to 60, Lapotan 2001, 64. This image was conspicuous for its tremendous material value and prompted the suspicion that there had been financial irregularities in its manufacture. Sources suggest that the sculptor Fadias was accused of embezzling ivory during the making of the image. Skull. APAC 605, FGRH 3B, 328 F121, Philochoros, compare to Platt. Per 31.2 to 3, Platt 2011, 108 to 9. Competition among images and hierarchies of meaning. While the Trojan women of the epic mythological tale entered a temple in which there was a single image of Athena, the Athenians of classical times were confronted with a wealth of pictorial representations, including the Athena Nike and the Athena Lemnia, among the other important images of Athena on the Acropolis. Did the Athenians develop criteria for ranking the plethora of representations around them? Are these criteria recognisable in the terminology of the literary sources? How important was the aesthetic success of the image's execution? In short, which image of Athena on the Acropolis was the most important for the women and men of Athens, the Parthenos, glittering with gold, or the wooden statue in the erect iron? There can be no simple answer to this question. Programmatic or even normative statements concerning the history of the imagery, the hierarchy of images, or ideas about the relationship of gods and images are largely absent from the written sources. Perfectly anthropomorphic form was not a decisive criterion for the ranking of a divine image in a hierarchy of images. Only rarely do the ancient sources support the long-held modern theory, Winkleman 1764, 5-6, compared to Gaithman 2012, 18-28, and, in this volume, Gaithman, Chapter 5, that representation of gods in Greece developed linearly from aniconic images of early times to anthropomorphic imagery in the classical and Hellenistic worlds. The kernel of this notion is first found in a passage of Pausanias, 7.22.4 in earlier times, unworked stones were also worshipped as divine statues by all the Greeks. More recent scholarship, Donahue 1987, e.g. 16-17, 186-7, 227 to 9, Gaithman 2012, 10, has emphasized how fully anthropomorphic images, satisfying the highest artistic standards, existed alongside aniconic representations of the divine, in both the classical as well as in the Hellenistic periods. Dissemination of anthropomorphic images of gods brought with it no formal commitment to a fully anthropomorphic form. Hermi I tested as a particularly popular form of imagery in Athens only from the 6th century BCE, not as primitive survivals, but rather as a new form of representation, Steiner 2001, 82. In many cults, direct representation of the divine seems to have been unnecessary to the very end, Gaithman 2012, 32. Instead, the assignment of importance to an image probably depended on perspective, the artistically modest execution of certain representations, and in this regard the Athena Polias as well as the Pelagian is evidence, could be more than offset by the attribution of a miraculous and prestigious past. In the context of the construction of a civic past, the category of age moves to the foreground, compared to also Esh. T114 rat equals Porf. Abstract. 2.18 Particular prestige can be attached to individual visualizations if they have a connection with the mythological narratives of early Greek history, and can serve as visible evidence for the early period of their city and its close connection to the divine, Ike 2011, 340. This does not mean, however, that representations created from precious materials had only a decorative significance. This conclusion has often been drawn by modern scholarship, especially in regard to the gold and ivory image of Athena in the Parthenon, to which there has been a tendency to deny cultic significance, see e.g. Harrington 1955, compared to she 2000, 4-5, 
with references, Lapleton 2001, 78. The source information on this statue actually refers most often to its material, rather than describing cultic rituals, our average 667 to 70, EQ 1169 to 70. But this is not surprising, in view of its unusual size and extravagant materials. Indeed, the scrupulous attitude towards divine images and their role in public exchange among citizens an attitude not primarily conditioned by aesthetic pleasure becomes particularly clear in the case of this statue. Plutarch, per 31.4, tells the anecdote that Phaedias was accused especially because he had secretly depicted himself and Pericles in the Amazon battle reliefs on the shield of the Athena statue. Regardless of this story's historicity, it shows, on the one hand, that important divine images were examined in detail, and, on the other, that civic images of the gods were depictions over whose creation the community wished to exercise control. The statue of Athena in the Parthenon was not to be used as an opportunity for individuals to enroll themselves, literally or figuratively, in the city's history. Ancient sources, such as Pausanias, mostly took for granted the presence of multiple three-dimensional representations of the same deity in a single sanctuary or even in a single temple, e.g. Pows. 2.17.3, she 2000, 132-6. However, this became a problem in modern times, when scholars began to posit a fundamental qualitative difference between cult image and votive offering among divine images, she 2000, 4-5, with references, Milanopolis 2010b, 4-6. In this modern interpretation, the images of Athena on the Acropolis would be divided into cult images on the one hand, that is, images that had their own epithets, stood in a central position in a temple, had their own altar and priest and votive offerings on the other, which were regarded only as works of art. Accordingly, the wooden Athena polias and the image of Athena in the Temple of Nike, for example, functioned as cult images, whereas the monumental bronze statue of the Promachos and the great gold and ivory image in the Parthenon would have belonged to the lesser category. Accordingly, so goes the argument, the statue in the Parthenon would be a votive offering of no real religious significance, a mere work of art, a representation of the city of Athens, a display of power to the allies, even just a repository for gold in the framework of city finances, compared to the late effect of this thesis in DC 2008. 111. The Parthenon itself, by this chain of argument, turns out to be a treasury, to which the function of a temple is denied, compared to e.g. Pricehofen 1984, 15-17. For the modern term cult image, as defined by the criteria listed above, there is no analogous expression in Greek. The ancient terminology in the literary sources for depictions of the divine can vary according to genre and author, she 2000, 33-4. A passage in Thucydides, 2.13.3-4, was obviously a major impetus for the cult image versus votive offering thesis. At the beginning of the Peloponnesian War, Pericles considers the possibility that the gold of the Parthenos could be used for the public good in the most pressing necessity of war, she 2000, 168. At a time of particularly vital need, the polis evidently believed itself authorized to borrow from the property of the gods, she 2000, 164-5. But the temple images of Athena do not seem to have been directly subject to such borrowing. Thus, the Athena Parthenos was not merely a repository of gold that was arbitrarily available to the city. In an emergency the removable ornaments of the old wooden statues could also be subject to loans. On the whole, However, the institutions of the polis and, with them, the totality of the citizens saw the protection of the divine images as an urgent task, the true value of the images lay not in their material but in their religious powers, Gordon 1979, 24. Even the alleged ritual deficits of the Athena Parthenos are a matter of perspective, for technical reasons, certain rituals, such as bathing, clothing, or carrying the statue in a procession, could not be performed on the gold and ivory colossus. In this case, the religious images proved to have complementary functions, Lapotin 2001, 78, without necessarily falling into hierarchies. If the citizens of Athens developed criteria for establishing a hierarchy of existing depictions of the divine within the city, 
these may not have been uniform but dependent on historical period, context, and recipients. A separation into cult images and mere votive offerings was hardly prominent among them. For example, in general, the Athena Parthenos was seen wholly as an object of ritual attention, the inventories of the 4th century BCE attest to a table for offerings, and thus to ritual activity, in the cella, IG 2 2 1421. 112, Harris 1996, 93, She 2000, 139 43, Graf 2001, 230, Platt 2011, 91. However, normally, the temple images were donated as a gift to the deity, they were votive offerings. This connected the Athena Parthenos in the Parthenon with the other images of Athena on the Acropolis. A divine origin mentioned for the Athena Polias by Pausanias was the exception for Greek divine images, Graf 1979, 33-41, she 2000, 83-4. But that an especially sacred, and not merely historic, quality arose from the ascription of such an origin, so Bettinetti 2011, 7-10, and that such an origin was ascribed to the images in classical times, cannot be generalized. Visualization and the presence of the divine. Divine images were placed in sanctuaries as gifts to the deity, and it was believed that the gods took pleasure in them. This was the original meaning of the term agolma, showpiece, that which gives joy, Burkett 1985, 91, she 2000, 33, Kint 2012, 45. If the importance of Greek divine images varies according to context, there is also a notable lack of normative texts on the question of how the Athenians, and all the Greeks, imagined the relation of the gods to their depictions generally. Did they consider the images as mere aids memoirs, as artistically valuable furnishings of the sanctuaries, or as the gods themselves, who were visible, tangible in space, and possibly accessible through them? The surviving statues do not allow direct conclusions about Greek concepts of identity. At least in public contexts, and beyond the act of solemn installation, hydrosis, no use seems to have been made of the possibility of magically animating temple images and thus of artificially establishing an identity for the divinity and image, Hoc 1905, 48, She 2000, 111-15, Steiner 2001, 115 to 18, too optimistically. That statues supposed to have fallen from heaven were thought from the outset to be animated, so Faran 1992, 5, or even, as in the ancient Near East, that magical, religious consecration was a requirement for a cult image is not a legitimate generalization. Since early times, and this is already evident in the epic context, statues could certainly be addressed with the name of the deity represented, Gaithman 2012, 31, or spoken of as the goddess, Romano 1980, 257. Occasionally, there is mention of miracles ascribed to divine images, such as speech, movement, trembling, sweating, and bleeding, HDT, 7.140, Graf 2001, 238, Steiner 2001, 105. After the theft of a temple statue, it was said that the sanctuary in question was abandoned by the goddess, Paus. 9.33.6, some elements of prayer and sacrifice, as described in the literary sources, also suggest that the granting of a prayer was considered particularly likely in the presence of the image, and that people sought closeness to the images through sight or touch, she 2000, 66-77, Steiner 2001, 112-13. But ritual acts such as the washing, clothing, and feeding of certain statues were always ambiguous, she 2000, 54-66, Graf 2001, 230-1 It is not clear from the sources whether Athenian rituals were applied directly to a deity thought identical with the image of the polias or were directed to an invisible goddess behind or beside it, she 2000, 97. People were aware, however, of the image's earthly origin. Apart from the rare cases of images fallen from the sky, the statues were traced back to human commissioners and creators, she 2000, 103-8. If an important image of the god was lost, this was an unfavorable sign, but did not necessarily mean that the god had given up the affected city. In the cult context, 
images of the god were replaceable, she 2010, 235 to 8. They possessed uniqueness only as works of art or as symbols of civic cultural memory, she 2000, 269, Ike 2011, 356 to 7. These ambiguities cannot be placed in any chronologically linear development, in the sense that the Athenians believed in early archaic times that their Athena Polias was the goddess herself, later, at the end of the 5th century BCE, distanced themselves from such representations, and, finally, in the Hellenistic period, classified the city's divine images as mere works of art under the influence of philosophically conditioned enlightenment, compared to the criticism of Graf 2001, 226, see also. Near 2010, 185 to 8. Worship and criticism of the images seem rather to have been parallel phenomena from the beginning. Xenophanes of Carlophon provoked his contemporaries in the 6th century BCE with the statement that if cattle were to create images of gods, they would probably have the shape of cattle, DKB 14, B 15, while Heraclitos of Ephesus compared the prayers of his fellow citizens before divine images to a conversation with empty houses, DKF 5. She 2000, 121, Steiner 2001, 121 to 2. And a class specific analysis of these contradictions, distinguishing between the educated, who would have seen the images only as works of art, and the simple folk, who would have identified them with the deities themselves, cannot be verified from the sources. She 2000, 35 to 43, Graf 2001, 229. A universal idea of a lasting unity between God and image cannot be proved for Greek culture. The mythological tales emphasize the mobility of the gods. These gods were depicted rather as visitors whose advent made the threshold of their sanctuary tremble and whose presence in the sanctuary was not taken for granted, compared to Kaolin. Him 2.1-3, she 2000, 115-18. But, at the same time, they were not entirely absent. In the end, it had to be possible for the devotee to summon the deity successfully in order to obtain a hearing. Divine images were necessary neither for prayers nor for offerings. The lasting proliferation of three-dimensional depictions of the divine in the sanctuaries, however, indicates that the images fostered promising conditions for successful sacrifice and prayer, and were regarded as helpful in creating the necessary divine presence. The term hedos, which could equally have the general meaning of seat and indicate a divine image, is instructive in this regard, she 2000, 120, Graf 2001, 229. The literary sources leave enough room at least for concepts of the temporary presence of the gods in or near their images. Visualizations can be understood as an attempt to bridge the gap towards the realm of the divine, Vernat 1991, 153 as efficient tools for human communication with the divine sphere, Pirendel Forge 2010, 122. Another theory has assumed that divine images had a specific function as vessels, in the images, divinity is present for human nature in an endurable way, Steiner 2001, 87 to 9. However, it cannot be ascertained from the sources that this quality can be ascribed only to old Zoanna, in contrast to artistically elaborated statues that were seen as dead things formed by human labor, Steiner 2001, 104 an idea that, once again, makes the Athena Parthino seem to be of less cultic value than the polias. It was probably left to the individual worshippers to decide, they could understand the image of Athena on the Acropolis as a certain kind of epiphany of the divine, Platt 2011, 122 or believe that the goddess actually lived in her images, Steiner 2001, 88. They could take divine images and sanctuaries as potential seats of the divinity, she 2000, 123-5, or assume that depictions of the gods were markings in the space in which, and near which, one could imagine the gods as temporarily present, Gaithman 2012, 34. In general, the depictions in the sanctuaries were seen as an aid by which one hoped to be able to evoke the godlike presence, which was not taken for granted but was necessary to the success of a request. The radiance of the Parthenos and the simple form of the Athena polias, ennobled by venerable age, worked together towards the Athenians' goal of successfully inviting the invisible goddess Athena to their city's Acropolis.
the difficulties of trying to work out a unified conceptualization of the relationship between gods and their images in Greek culture are probably due to more than the patchiness of the sources. Rather, the inconsistencies and flaws in the sources are signs that there was no definite belief that would have been required of viewers and worshippers in all polis or in every period of Greek history. For the inhabitants of Athens there was, at no time, a personal obligation to worship images as gods. The ambivalence of the ritual opened a certain freedom of thought, naturally not about the existence of the gods per se, but about the relationship between the gods and the images. Some Athenians may have enjoyed the image of Athena in the Parthenon as an outstanding work of art. Some others probably considered the ancient wooden statue of the Polias important merely as an object affirming Athens' ancient traditions. Yet other citizens may have preferred to address their personal requests, prayers, and libations to the Hermi before the doors of their houses, and believed that they were then in the presence of the god. All of them were free to do so. If, however, they actively and with evil intent violated the pictorial property of the gods, for example, by removing votive offerings or mutilating the Hermi, this religious freedom came to an end. Then, at least, it became clear that, for their fellow citizens, these divine images were not just skillfully made aids memoirs or illustrations of mythological tales. No one was required to worship the images, but those who damaged or stole them were punished with death, compared to ale. VH 5.16, SHE 2000, 152-61 On the whole, the Athenians of the classical and of the Hellenistic era believed they were part of a long tradition when they brought the Panathenaic peplos to the image of Athena Polis, in the mythical temple of Troy something similar is said to have happened. That the goddess could still refuse to grant her presence or could not her refusal was another matter. Suggested reading in recent years, several monographs have been devoted to the relation of gods and images in Greek religion, with varying emphases. She 2000 stresses the function of images as a means of bringing about the temporary presence of the divine, Steiner 2001 sees the images primarily as vessels which both hide and make visible the divine within them, and Platt 2011 makes central the epiphany as an opportunity for visualization. Ike 2011, on the other hand, has stressed the historic function of divine images as a storehouse of collective memories. Gaifman 2012 has treated in detail the role of aniconic cult objects in Greece. Chapter 13 Drama Claude Callum Asterisk Introduction The ideas of action and practice are fundamental in the rich Greek lexicon of ritual. The different ways of performing ritual establish the relationship between gods and mortals. Above all, by means of rhythmic and poetic language presented as a musical offering, mortal men and women invoke the collaboration of gods and heroized figures to mitigate the ephemeral nature and the accidents of their existence. Ritualized invocation assumes different forms of sung poetry, the cultic hymn that calls upon the divine presence in order to propose a duty des contract the paean addressed generally to Apollo, with its propitiatory or expiatory force, the dithyram, with its often narrative character, which makes an offering to the deity out of a heroic tale, the prosodian, song of procession, as a processional chant, the homeric hymn with its narrative etiology of a god's function and its use as a rhapsodic recitation at a contest inserted into a great cultural celebration, and further, as we shall see, Comedy and tragedy inserted into a musicos agon, a musical contest generally dedicated to Dionysos. It is no accident that this semantic field of ritual is particularly that of tragedy, ritual in tragedy, by means of the dramatization of myth, and tragedy as ritual dedicated to the divine. There are no myths in classical Greece, but a heroic past of the community designated by Herodotos and Thucydides as Pelia or Archaea, things of old or even Petroia, in reference to the deeds of fathers and ancestors. Tragedy derives from the different forms of song that belong to the great indigenous genre of mellows, lyric song, and that present themselves as acts of speech and, consequently, as acts of song and of cult, as such, tragedy is one of the poetic forms without which the narratives about gods and heroes of Greek mythology would not exist. 
Like other forms of the ritual poetry that is Melos, classical Athenian tragedy transforms the narration and dramatization of a mythical heroic action into a ritual performance intended for the divinity. From Homeric poetry to Attic tragedy, mythos often means not a myth, but a heroic tale presented as a discursive argument. Attic tragedy is significant for Greek polytheistic and civic religion as much in its presentation of the relationships between mortals and gods as by the fact that, as drama, e.g. Oran. 920-3, it constitutes a ritual relation with divinity. Tragedy as drama and as ritual. The Musico's Aegon of Tragic Performances. <laughs> The musical production of the tetralogy is itself in competition with the performance of two other tetralogies in a musical contest, or Musicos Aegon. Generally conceived in choral terms in the classical era, this dramatized performance of the most striking episodes of the great heroic saga is centered on the Trojan War, of which Achilles, Agamemnon, and Helen are the principal protagonists, along with the gods, and the The Band Saga, Oedipus and his descendants along with the Seven Against Thebes. From the standpoint of its temporality, the contest among the three tragic tetralogies took place at Athens during the Great Dionysia. Opened by a prelude in which poets and actors were presented to the public and the program of musical contests was announced, the Musicoyagones began with the contest of dithyrambs, ten choral groups of fifty adult singers, choristers representing each of the ten tribes of democratic Athens, then ten choirs of fifty young men, each choir, like the adult choirs, financed by a single churagos. Next came the competition of the five comedies, each undertaken by a choral group of twenty-four singers, followed by the three days devoted to the three tragic tetralogies, each performed by a chorus of twelve, and later of fifteen, churutai, see especially Demosthenes made. Ten, citing the law of Euagoras that may have dated to the 5th century BCE. Nearly one-fifth of the citizenry of Athens took an active musical part in the celebration of the Great Dionysia, a choral and musical celebration that was ritualized by wearing masks and costumes, and by diction divided between iambic trimeters and sung and danced lyrics that were derived from the great tradition of melic poetry. The city Dionysia represented the most important cultural celebration, along with the civic and religious festival of the Panathenaea in midsummer for the politico-religious inauguration of the new year in Athens. For documents on all ritual aspects of Attic theatre, see Picard Cambridge 1968, and for descriptions of 4th century BCE classical theatre, see Herwitt 1999, 47-58, Savinu Inwood 2003, 160-1. At the turn of the century, with the reforms of Cleisthenes, the musical performance of dithyrambs and tragedies was moved from the choral area at the northeast of the Agora to the south of the Acropolis, in order to be better integrated into the sanctuary of Dionysos at the foot of the hill dominated by Athena and Poseidon, the city's tutelary deities. The insertion of tragic choruses into a sanctuary of Dionysos may then have followed. Occult and Ritual Practices for Dionysos The Musicos Aegon of Dithyrambs, tragedies, and comedies was introduced by a grand procession, corresponding to the cultic procession, pomp. The day before the first musical contest, the statue of the god was taken from the sanctuary of Dionysos Eleutherios at the foot of the Acropolis. The sanctuary included a temple dating from the end of archaic period, with the Zoanon, the old wooden statue, of the god, and a temple of the classical period, decorated with paintings depicting various episodes in the divine biography of Dionysos. This collection of narratives illustrates certain foundation myths of the cult of Dionysos, as well as the god's connection to Athens by means of the founding hero of the democratic city. This iconographical narration thus contributes to the introduction of the god Dionysos from the exterior to the centre of the city. His divine biography lives, henceforth, next to the Acropolis, in the neighbourhood of the sanctuaries consecrated to the city's two tutelary deities. The old statue of the god was then moved to his small temple next to the academy, near the Demi of Colonos. 
Pausanias, 1.19.3, mentions this sanctuary, stating that the statue of Dionysos Eleutherios was brought there each year at a fixed date, probably on the evening of 8 or 9 Elaphabolian, end of March. Late inscriptions from the 2nd century BCE tell us that, after this first transfer and a sacrifice, Dionysos was brought back from a low altar to the theatre by torchlight and was honoured by the sacrifice of a bull. Without doubt, this altar must be identified with the one found at the northwest of the Agora, next to the altar of the Twelve Gods. It is there that not only the sacrifice of a he-goat but especially the Xenismos, the ritual welcome of Dionysos in the form of a Theoxenia, a ritual reception of a god, would have taken place, Savinian Wood 2003, 91-8. Then the pomp described in the law of Euagoras and many epigraphical documents would have brought the statue of Dionysos back to his sanctuary in the theatre, so that the god might be present at the musical performances offered to him. Participants in the procession included metics carrying vessels for the wine and citizens in charge of goatskins, while the wives of the metics carried hydriae, water jugs, as instruments for the proper mixing of the wine. Behind them always came the chulgoi, as mentioned, and canaphoroi, basket bearers. Second in importance after the Panathenaea, the great procession culminated in the sanctuary of Dionysos with a sacrifice that, at one time, must have been conducted by the Ephiboi. The sacrifice took place in the sanctuary, as stated by an inscription, IG 221006. 12, which adds that the victim was a bull worthy of the god, an expression evoking the anonymous little cultic poem that invokes Dionysos as an axitor worthy bull, in inviting him to appear in his temple, calm. Pop FR 871 page, on sacrifice, c, in this volume, Naden, chapter 31. Thus, Attic tragedy partakes of the ritual scenario of every cultic celebration in the Greek cities generally, a procession punctuated by songs, involving the participation, with ritual apparatus, of several subgroups of the community an elaborate sacrifice followed by a ritual meal for male and female representatives of these groups, poetic confrontations, with sung and dance demonstrations addressed as musical offerings to the divinity being celebrated, and athletic contests demonstrating the physical and moral qualities of the aristocratic citizen, see Callum 1992, with bibliography. In the Great Dionysia, this last function seems to have been taken over by a disproportionate development of the Dithyram competition on the one hand, and by the Comet competition on the other. The Dithyram contest, with its organisation according to the ten Cleisthenic tribes, must surely be related to the development of democratic structures and the corresponding growth of corps of citizens and their sons. The contest of comedies is certainly connected with the cult of Dionysos and the critical debate brought on by the contested sharing of political power. The ironic derision of Dionysos himself in a comedy such as the Frogs of Aristophanes would surely have been impossible except as ritualized and expressed in the forms of poetry of reproach and blame, in contrast to tragedy, which aligns with the heroic poetry of praise. In tragedy as much as in comedy, Ritual and individual relations with the gods are brought into question. In regard to tragic performance as drama, let us remember that Aristotle himself compares not only Sophocles but also Aristophanes to Homer, our poet. 1148-24-9, compared to also 1448b32-8 and 1459a18. In his view, the three poets were all mimetai, authors of representations in that they represented characters who acted and did, Pratontes Kaidrontes hence the characterization of tragedy and comedy as dramata, and the need for tragic plots, mathoi, to have a dramatic form. In the Republic, 392c, in regard to this topic of poetry and mimesis, Plato defines two modes of narrative, one in which the narration is undertaken by the poet, the diegetic mode, the other in which it is left to the actions of the protagonists, the dramatic mode. Thus Homeric poetry, with its narrative punctuated by dialogue, is classified as a mixed mode, while tragedy is entirely dramatic. Choral poetry is associated with tragedy as a ritual practice and musical offering dedicated to the god. Xenophon, Hip. 3.2 makes this clear when he writes of processions that must please both the gods and the spectators, it is the same at the Dionysia, where the choruses seek to please the gods, especially the twelve gods. 
From this, we must conclude that the tragic spectacle is to be considered as a cultic act, or at least as a strongly ritualized religious practice. While being specially developed and having contributed to the creation of specific poetic genres, the Musikoya goats that made up the ritual celebration of the great Dionysia in 5th century BCE Athens were nothing more than the counterpart of the musical and or athletic contests that mark a large number of the great Athenian cultic celebrations. Other examples include the above-mentioned Great Panathenaea in honour of Athena Polias, a contest of Homeric Rhapsodies, the Thargelia, a contest of Dithyrambs, for Apollo, the Anthesteria for the Dionysos of Wine, the Eleusinia for Demeter, the the CIA for the founding hero of the city, and so on all festivals that strike us as eminently religious, Osborne 2003 lists the relevant festivals. There is no point in trying to establish a relation between the form or content of each tragedy and the functions and field of activity of Dionysos. The ritual of comedy and of satyr drama, introduced later, is meant to evoke explicitly the cult of Dionysos. Tragedy represents probably a poetic development derived from the narrative and sung form of the rhapsodic nomos, a kind of choral poem practiced especially by the poet Stesichoros, presenting the most dramatic episodes of the heroic saga transmitted by epic poetry. As poetic and musical ritualized performance, Attic tragedy is thus consecrated to the god residing in the frontier outpost that was the community of Eleutheri. Attic tragedy and comedy allowed the dramatization of a poetical and critical reflection on the community's past, on political and religious life, and on the human condition, in interaction with the gods. Verbal rites in tragedy, hymnic forms. Having considered tragedy as ritual devoted to the deity, we turn now to rite and to relations with the gods in tragedy. It is only recently that the vain poetico-philosophical quest for the essence of the tragic has been abandoned. It was understood as being rooted in the action of the tragic hero, often without consideration of great heroines such as Hecabe, Antigone, or Helen, and without considering the ritual dramatization of that tragic action. Moreover, the lack of a definition for a working concept of ritual has allowed a certain vagueness to surround a controversial question. Thus, under the heading Ritual in Tragedy it was possible to cite at random the solemn imprecation of Oedipus against the unknown murderer of Les in the Oedipus Tyrannus of Sophocles, the evocation of the procession and sacrifices of the great Panathenaea at the end of the Eumenides of Aeschylus, the appeal to the epiphany of Darius or the funeral lament that ends the Persians, as well as cruisers taking refuge at the altar of Apollo in the Ion of Euripides, see Easterling 1988, Wiles. 2000, 38 to 45. This is a heterogeneous list of ritual acts, individual and collective, verbal and nonverbal, enacted on stage or merely reported, with or without relevance to the gods. The forms of ritual discourse and the sequences of ritual acts performed on the stage are numerous, and the effects of staged ritual performances on the dramatic action represented in the theatre are also diverse. I would like now to propose two examples of staged ritual practices that, in hymnic form, introduce authority in communication with the gods and invite the divine to intervene in the action. The Pragmatics of a Dramatized Choral Hymn In regard to the hymnic forms inserted into the dramatic action, Euripides' tragedy Ion is particularly significant. Let us remember that Ion is the future founding and eponymous hero of Ionia. In the play, he is in the cultic service of his father Apollo, Cruiser, his mother, is a daughter of Erechtheus, one of the first legendary kings of Athens, and the wife of the Achaean Zuthos. The noble Zuthos indicates that he is crossing the threshold of the sanctuary at Delphi by asserting his wish to consult the oracle of the god about his wife's sterility. The choral ode provoked by his intervention, 417-24, then 452-71 for the beginning of the Stasimon, assumes the form of a cultic hymn, with the expected tripartite structure. With the self-referential and performative, in the linguistic sense of the concept, as speech act, form of the supplication, sehikatuo, the chorus indicates the type of act of utterance with which it invokes Athena, the initial hymnic form of invocatio, invocation, then, in a very brief epic allows, epic praise, of a narrative sort, which recalls the central part of the shortest Homeric hymns. The chorus gives the genealogy of the goddess, who was born from the head of Zeus. 
Finally, Athena Nike is invited to visit Delphi in order to ally herself with Artemis, the daughter of Leto. In regard to the practical relations between mortals and gods, the appeal for the intervention of the goddess is most interesting. It brings together the spatio-temporal framework of the dramatized heroic action with the here and now of the tragic performance. The chorus of heroic times invites both Athena and Artemis to intervene in the dramatic action. Meanwhile, watching the drama, in the cultic service of Dionysos Eleutherios, the spectators are seated on a hillside, on one side of which stands the temple consecrated to Athena Polias, venerated every year in the Panathenaea, and on the other, in the form of a vast portico, rises the now-vanished sanctuary of Artemis Boronia. In the final portion of this choral prayer to the deity, the traditional form of the cultic and cletic hymn is modified, on prayer see also, in this volume, Versnal, Chapter 30. After the appeal for the presence of the deity, the young chorus members delegate their supplication to the two maiden goddesses, Parthenoi, both of them sisters of Apollo by their common father, Zeus. O maidens, Korai, make supplication. That Erechtheus ancient. Race may at long last. By pure prophesies. Obtain a good posterity. 467-71. As Athenian servants of Cruiser, the young women of the chorus seem not only to resemble the two maiden goddesses in performing the ritual of supplication, but also to adopt the point of view of the Athenian spectators in characterizing the family of the founding king Erechtheus as Peleian. This genos belongs to the heroic past of Athens. Unlike the monody sung by Ion at the beginning of the tragedy, the hymnic supplication delegated to the two maiden goddesses will have the full cultic effect wished for by Zuthos. At the end of the drama it is Pallas Athena, the eponymous Athena of Athens, who intervenes as Dea ex machina to resolve the plot, in such a way we attend another coincidence of the time and space of the heroic action with the time and place of the dramatic representation, 1553-605. Not only will Ion rule over Attica before colonizing the Cyclades and Ionia, a prefiguration of the contemporary Athenian Empire, Cruza and Zuthos will have two sons, the future eponymous heroes of the Dorians and of the Achaeans. For the etiological significance of this founding conclusion, see Callum 2007, 279 to 82. Consult also Zeitlin 1996, 285 to 338. Despite the fact that the pragmatic logic is realized at the end of the tragedy, the choral ode begun as a hymn continues, 472 to 509. The following epode consists of an address to the cave of Pan on the flank of the Athenian Acropolis, a pretext for mentioning not only the place where the newborn son of Apollo was exposed, but also the dances of the daughters of Kekops, to whom Athena entrusted the education of the young Erichthonios. By means of the choral projection common in the odes of Attic tragedy, the young women of the chorus project their actual song and dance into the mythical dance of the Cacropodi, they again bring about a coincidence in spatiality and temporality between the dramatic action in which they are involved and their own ritual and choral action, Hicket Nunk. In some sense, the three semantic constituents of any melic poem are found in this female choral ode, the first-person ritual reference to the circumstances of the song, the gnomic commentary that evokes the present situation, and, finally, the reference to the heroic past, to the plot and the paradigmatic protagonists of a myth in relation to the pragmatics of the actions sung in the present. While fulfilling its practical function and effect on the unfolding of the dramatic action, the initial cultic hymn to Athena and Artemis is contained in this elegant melic and choral poem with a ritual efficacy that also includes the spectators in their individual relations with the tutelary goddess of the city, here and now. Prayer and Hymnic Practice The oracular response at the centre of the tragedy devoted to the young Ion proves wholly unfavourable to Cruiser. Not only is she denied any descendants, but Ion, who will be revealed as her son, is attributed to Zuthos. Cruiser's long emotional lament leads first into an address to Apollo himself, a hymnic song critical of the god, and then into a new exchange between the heroine and the old pedagogue who served Erechtheus. This stichomythia elaborates the plan to expunge the affront of Apollo's unjust oracular decision denying a son to Cruiser, Ion will be killed, not by the sword, 
but by the venom of the gorgon serpents. The chorus addresses its ode to the goddess Inodia, who is often identified with Hecate, and is the mistress of potions and of magic formulae, for the identification of Hecate Phosphorose with Inodia, C.E.G. Hell. 569-70, other references in Zeitlin 1996, 310-11. She is not the city divinity dominating political and economic activity, but a divine power attached to the routines of everyday life. This third stasimon begins with a prayer, 1048-60. Sung chorally, the prayer must take the tripartite form of the hymn. Thus, it opens as usual with a brief, direct invocation to Inodia, presented as the daughter of Demeter. By means of a so-called hymnic relative, the descriptive part, epic allows, then depicts the goddess in one of her domains of competence, nocturnal assaults. Inodia, daughter of Demeter, you, who rule over nocturnal attacks, escort in daylight the contents of the deadly vessel against those to whom my mistress sends it from the drippings of the Thonic Gorgon's Cutthroat. 1048-55. Thus, we move quickly to the prayer that enjoins Inodia to escort the cup of wine poisoned with drops of the Gorgon's blood to the palace of Erechtheus' children, in a new journey from Delphi to Athens. The metaphor leads into an imprecation, may a foreigner from a foreign house never reign over the city if he is not a noble descendant of the Erectides. 1058-60, see Callum 2005. 19 to 22 with nth 8, Furlay and Bremer 2000, I, 329 have seen that the imprecation is comparable to a verbal gesture of defixio, in Greek catadesmos. In this way, the brief hymnic prayer ends in the formula of a spell moving from the request to the divinity for direct intervention, to this other form of request for divine power, the ritual word that binds, oath, malediction, magical formula, or simple imprecation. The utterance of ritual efficacy may take an individual or collective form, rendering vain the recent debate between the upholders of the polis religion and those who see individual practices in the ritual of a polytheistic system. In this particular case, we witness a new appropriation of the form of the cultic hymn to the deity, used to insert prayer into the dramatic action, in order to direct the action through the appearance of a superhuman power. We can imagine the same dynamics in the current cultic and ritual practices of the average Athenian, taking part in the different rituals of the great Dionysia or the Panathenaea, he or she will shape his or her own cultic practice according to these ritual forms, privately or at the numerous other public occasions offered by a rich polytheistic, gods and heroes, calendar. Once again the initial hymnic form, with its religious pragmatics, is put at the service of choral song to comment upon and enrich the dramatic action, while, at the same time, seeking, through the formulae of ritual speech, to influence its course. We recognize here the interlacing of the three voices that animate the polyphony of the tragic chorus, performative, hermeneutic, and affective. Whether they are monadic or choral, the melic songs of Euripidean tragedy take up traditional cultic and poetic forms in order to redirect them, both formally and pragmatically towards the heroic action represented in the theatre, and to arouse there the intervention of gods and divine powers. But occasionally these ritual practices are related, if not to the cultic act that constitutes the tragic performance itself, at least to the religious practices of the public participating in the musical contest dedicated to Dionysos, in a face-to-face -face critique that is mediated by the wearing of masks. Thus, we find ourselves brought back from the ritual in tragedy to tragedy as ritual, we examine this next. From myth to ritual, tragic etiologies. It often happens in drama that the deity directly intervenes in the tragic action. Whatever the scenic form of his epiphany, this usually occurs at the end of the tragedy, in order to resolve the plot. This is especially the case in the concluding scenario of Aeschylus Oresteia which will be examined briefly before returning to two further examples from the tragedies of Euripides. A religious and civic conclusion. In the Eumenides, Athena intervenes at first as the principal protagonist of the action, responding to the indirect appeal of the Erinyus in the famous binding hymn, 
306, sung by the goddesses of vengeance at the beginning of the tragedy. In the course of the action, the tutelary goddess Athena establishes the tribunal of the Areopagos, and installs the Eumenides on the Acropolis, in the sanctuary that will become the Erechtheion. The tragedy concludes ritually, with the procession that will take the Eumenides to their new home. The goddess invites the Athenian sons of Kranaus to take their place in the ritual cortege. Thus, the final song of the Exodos is a choral invitation to the goddesses, henceforth propitious and venerable, to come here, Juro, 1041, and to accompany the final procession now, Nun, 1043, 1047. The ritual cry punctuating the song seals the pact between Zeus and fate to the advantage of the inhabitants of Athens. Peace for all time between the immigrants and palace citizens, thus all seeing Zeus and fate go together. Cry out now in response to our song. 1044-7 By these declarative and semantic means, the time and place of the end of the dramatic action are made to coincide with the hicket nunk of the musical performance witnessed by the Athenian spectators. With a reiterated, inclusive second-person plural, they too are called to respect the justice administered by the Areopagos under the aegis of Zeus, and to worship the Eumenides in their new sanctuary. Athena's intervention in her scenic epiphany leads the plot to the institution of a tribunal and of a cult. Thus, in an etiological game common in classical Greece, myth leads to ritual, the past and tragic time of heroes guilty of hubris brings about a present of cultic veneration of the gods and heroes of the city's pantheon, aimed at maintaining civic order. The tragic establishment of rituals, the blood of men, the blood of women. The conclusion of the Iphigenia in Tauris is yet more illustrative in this respect than the Eumenides. In order to escape the Erinias, Orestes follows Apollo's order to go to the northern country of the Tauri to bring back to Athens the statue of Artemis venerated in a sanctuary in that barbarian realm. According to the version in the Cypria, the goddess had installed Iphigenia as her priestess there. Doomed to be offered as a sacrifice to the barbarian goddess, Orestes finally makes himself known to Iphigenia, and the two young Greeks flee to Athens with the statue of the bloodthirsty deity. It is then the function of Pallas Athena to resolve the conflict between brother and sister and between the king of Tauris and Artemis, the despoiled goddess. Intervening as DEA ex machina, Athena begins by revealing to the king of Tauris that Orestes has done no more than follow the oracular command of Apollo. Then she orders Orestes himself to construct a temple intended to welcome to Attica the divine image brought from far-off Tauris in Scythia. In this sanctuary, also situated in a border region, the indigenous statue will receive the honours due to an Artemis called Tauropolis. This epiclesis must hold in the etymological and etiological memory the sufferings endured by the young hero pursued by the Erinius during his wanderings, Peripolon, 1455 to the space consecrated to the Artemis of the wanderings in Tauris and to the hymns that will honour her, the tutelary goddess of Athens adds a bloodthirsty ritual gesture, a gesture of piety, Hosias Hecate, 1461. She invites the young man himself to initiate the ritual of the drops of fresh blood, made to spout from a man's throat as a commemorative gesture. The rite is doubtless intended to recall both Orest's murder of his mother and the risk he has run of a ritual immolation at the hands of his own sister, now the priestess of the greco scythian goddess. Finally, Athena tells Iphigenia that she will be attached to the cult of this same goddess of savage countries in Broran, another sanctuary on the borders of Attica. After her death, the memory of the heroine will be celebrated by offerings of rags left on behalf of women who have died in childbirth. 1462-7. By the mediation of the sacrificed young girl and by death in childbirth, we have the celebration of the protection given by Artemis to pregnant women and to young childbearers at another, especially delicate, moment of passage from the male blood of murder to the female blood of childbirth. Finally, by a route that leads us from the periphery of Attica to the civic and judicial centre of Athens itself, Athena concludes her etiological intervention by mentioning the institution of the democratic vote in the Areopagos on the occasion of Orest's sentencing. Although the honours given to Iphigenia as a heroic attendant of Artemis in her famous cult of Broran seem to have only late attestation, the demi of Halai Arifenides, 
also on the northern borders of Attica, was known since the 4th century BCE for its cult of Artemis Tauropolis, attested by Strabo 9 January 1922, compared to also SEG 34.103, 15. The Areopagos would clearly be present in the minds of all the spectators of a tragedy produced at the end of the 5th century BCE, just as it was for the spectators of Aeschylus Oresteia. For the complex question of Iphigenia's association with Artemis in the cult of Boron, see Juman 1999, 84-8 and 162-79, see also Savinian with 2003, 418-22, despite Dunn 1996, 45-63. Furthermore, in retracing his tragic biography for his recognized sister, Orestes himself does not fail to mention the absolution received with Athena's support on the hill of Ars, as well as the sanctuary, Hiron, 969, where the Erinyes agreed to be honoured, not far from the Areopagos. Once again, by the dramatised intervention of a deity, tragedy in performance establishes a complex etiological relation between the dramatised heroic narrative and the ritual acts that mark the heroization of its principal protagonists. Thanks to the divine manifestation and the word of authority from Athena, the outcome of Iphigenia in Tauris returns us, after all, to the cultic reality and the religious practices known to the spectators venerating Dionysos Eleutherios in his sanctuary theatre. In her final intervention, the tutelary goddess establishes both the rule, Nomos, 1458, of human blood spouting in the sanctuary of Halai and the democratic rule, Nomisma, 1471 on the Areopagos, as well as the sanctuary of the goddess whose attendant Iphigenia becomes at Broran, 1463. The use by Athena of the forms of the close demonstrative hode situates these institutional words between dyxis and phantasma, appeal to the spectator's imagination, and demonstratio ad oculos, demonstrative reference to the here and now. So the fictional relation that the dramatic narrative has constructed between the heroic and tragic action on the one hand, and the right founded and legitimized by the deity on the other, makes reference to real and actual religious and cultic practices in the here and now of the tragic performance. See Savinian with 2003, 31-40 and 301-8. Made up of young Greek servants, the chorus can now conclude the tragedy with these words, sung between a you, plural, that includes the protagonists of the dramatic action, and a we that includes the Athenian spectators. Go, fortunate in the lucky. Rescue of your fate. But O oh, Pallas Athena. Revered of immortals and mortals. We shall do, Drasimon, as you order. 1490-4. The dramatic and ritual establishment of founding myths. Among the extant tragedies of Euripides, the ritual conclusion that Athena gives to the Erechtheus is undoubtedly still more demonstrative for the establishment of cultic practices that acquire a narrative foundational base in the heroic action enacted on stage while referring to the spectator's religious knowledge and ritual praxis. In this political drama, drawn from the founding history of Athens, the game of tragic etiology is again left to Athena intervening as Deax Machina. Eumolpos, son of Poseidon and king of Thrace, tries to take Attica from its ruler Erechtheus, who succeeds in defeating the enemy army. Poseidon avenges the death of his royal son Eumolpos by making Erechtheus vanish. With the intention of pronouncing, Semano, in the manner of the Delphic oracle and in performative mode, Athena again manifests her divinity and orders the cultic future fated for all the protagonists who have died in the unfolding of the tragic plot, FR 370.64-100 Canicht. Transformed into a constellation under the probable name of the Hyades, the daughters of Erechtheus, as Hyakinthides, will enjoy honours both heroic and divine, which the inhabitants of the city will pay them every year in the form of sacrifices of cattle and girls' choral dances. Moreover, Erechtheus' daughters will have the first fruits of the sacrifices made before every battle, with a libation of honey and water. Erechtheus himself will henceforth have a sanctuary at the centre of the city bounded by an enclosure of stone, his memory will be honoured by the sacrifices of citizens under the name of Poseidon himself, whose heroic attendant he thus becomes. As for his wife Praxithea, who was able to repair the very foundations of the city, Athena makes her into her priestess, 
she will be charged with sacrificing the first offerings on the altars of the goddess. To be sure, only three meagre indications allow us to locate the inaccessible precinct that Athena reserves for the higher kinthides in the place called Svendanai, to the west of the city of Athens, Fot. Lexicon, 397, 7, Paulson, in a gloss that refers to the Athos of the historian Phanodemos, FGRH 325F4. But the spectators of the 5th century BCE, like modern readers, had no difficulty in identifying the sanctuary promised by Athena to the king of Athens with the Erechtheion. Historically, the first production of the Erechtheus by Euripides, shortly before the Peace of Nicaeus, coincides with the end of the first phase of the Peloponnesian War. It coincides also with the period of renewed construction of that high birthplace of Athenian autochthony that is the temple with the Caryatid portico, on the Erechtheion and its date, see Howitt, 1999, 200-9. Praxithea takes up the ideology of autochthony in order to proclaim its political dimension on stage. Putting herself in the place of King Erechtheus, as it were, the queen declares and affirms, a better city than this could not be found, its populace has not immigrated here from elsewhere, but we were born of its soil, FR 360.6-8 Canict. Praxithea represents both the female and the male citizens of Athens in a collective we, even before affirming the maternal role proper to her sex, that is, to give birth to children in order to defend the gods' altars and the country. Without a son, and therefore without a soldier to offer up to the glory of death in combat, Praxithea will consent to the political sacrifice of one of her daughters, for the triumph of Athena over Poseidon. She will offer the fruit of her womb to the earth from which the Athenians were born, for the welfare of the city, to save this city, Tende Pollen, 42 and 52, to save the citizens whom, concluding her speech, she addresses directly, O Politai, 50. Spatially and temporally, the heroic action on stage thus comes to coincide with the here and now of the production witnessed by the spectators assembled in the theatre at the height of the Peloponnesian War. This coincidence is furthered by the declarative movement of Praxithea's speech, in her final appeal to the citizens, then to the nation, the queen addresses herself equally to the members of the chorus and to the spectators watching the production in the heart of the sanctuary consecrated to Dionysos Eleutherios. Like Athena's intervention in her final epiphany, the deictic gestures by which the wife of Erechtheus punctuates her discourse to make the polis this city again combine deixism phantasma and demonstratio ad oculos with a double reference. It refers as much to the legendary city threatened by Eumolpos of Thrace in the time of Erechtheus as to the present city weakened by the incursions of the Spartan army and awaiting with equal fervour the intervention of its tutelary deities to save it. In temporal terms, the etiological and ritual ending that Athena gives to the tragic action, with the installation of Praxithea as her chief priestess, leads the spectators from the past foundation of the city to the present and the cult by which they annually worship the tutelary goddess. Spatially, the establishment of the cult of Erechtheus invites them to the Acropolis, to the centre of the city, among the gods and heroes who have created Athens and continue to protect her. Conclusion if it is true that the rituals represented between stage and orchestra actualize the religious relations of the Athenians with their various deities, while bringing them into question, if it true that the etiological endings of many tragedies allow for the deity's epiphany and relate the heroic action to the ritual performance here and now, then Attic tragedy is itself a musical offering to the god of theatre and, indirectly, to the gods that it puts on stage. Tragedy, like comedy, is, par excellence, the religious act of incipient democracy, it represents, under a poetic and musical form, a human and heroic action displayed in its complex relations with the gods and continually brought under discussion by its various protagonists, especially the chorus. Suggested reading For the realia and commentary on the documents concerning the ritual organisation of the tragic and comic contests at Athens, Picard Cambridge 1968 remains the basic manual, not superseded by CSA Poe and Slater 1994. On the connections between tragic performance and the religious and political reality of the Athenian public, see especially Goldhill 1990, 1997, and Osborne 1993 keeping in mind the warning of Vidal Nakwit 2001.
The contributions of Parker 1997 and Savinuinwood 1997 clarify the relations of tragedy with religion, as well as the complexity of the relations of the protagonists of the dramatic action with the gods. Seaford 1994, 235-80, 368-405 points out the cultic relations of Athens with Dionysos and the ambiguities of the rituals represented on the tragic stage. See also Parker 2005, 136-52 on religion in the theatre. For the morphology of Greek cultic celebration, I refer the reader to Callum 1992. The ritualist theories of tragedy developed notably by Gilbert Murray, A.P. Jamie, Harrison, René Girard, and Walter Burkett are examined in Graf 2007. For the poetic, musical, and ritualized forms taken up by tragedy, see the classic work of Harrington 1985. But it is, above all, the work of Savinu Inwood 2003 that addresses most directly, and in detail, the question of tragedy as ritual and of ritual in tragedy. For the problems posed by Attic tragedy in general, the best introduction is D.I. Bernadetto and Meda 2002, 1977. Also useful are the two companions of Easterling 1997 and Gregory 2005. On the Ion of Euripides and its etiological conclusion, consult Callum 2007, 259-85, see also Zeitlin 1996, 285-338. On hymnic forms, see Furley and Bremer 2001, especially Volume 1. For the ritual relations established with the gods in these forms, see Callum 2005, 19 35. For the role of the chorus, see the numerous references in Callum 2013 and 1994 1995 on the three choral voices affective, performative, and hermeneutic. See also the contributions of Gould 1996. Goldhill 1996, and DuPont, 2007. The question of the pragmatics of the Humnos Desmios in the Eumenides of Aeschylus is well treated in Henrik's 1994-1995, which also discusses the performative role of the songs of the tragic chorus. The problem of the cultic reality of the etiological conclusions of Attic tragedies is naturally treated by Savinian Wood 2003, Passim, in contrast with the study of Dunn 1996, which considers the etiologies concluding the tragedies of Europides as fictions. On this question, see also Kolzig 2006. For the etiological conclusion of the Iphigenia in particular see Wolf 1992, with a supplemental treatment of the cults in Juman 1999. For the Erechtheus, see Callum 2011. For the different cases of the figure of intra and extra discursive dyxis in Greek poetry, see the various contributions published in Arethusa 37, 2004, devoted to the poetics of dyxis. Chapter 5